morning. Can you hear me well? I sure can. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Have a great meeting. This is the clerk with a courtesy announcement that the meeting is now live on the internet. Good morning, Peggy. Good morning. Looks like it's working. Loud and clear, thanks. Good morning, Supervisor Helen Berg. Oh, good morning, Rhonda. I saw Peggy's little square on, so I thought she was in charge of us, too. Oh, she is in charge of you as well. All right. Well, nice to hear your voice, too. And good morning, Reverend Mugujima. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much for your kind invitation today. Good. Well, thank you for being here. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Good morning, Dwight. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Good morning, Kelly. Hi, good morning. Good morning, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Rhonda, can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Okay. Good morning, Miguel. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Kelvin. Good morning, Lieutenant Ma. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, how are you? Good, thanks, how are you? Great, great. Have a wonderful meeting. Yes. Good morning, President Wasserman. Good morning, Rhonda. Your clerk today is gonna be the wonderful Miss Peggy Doyle. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. And good morning. Good morning, Peggy. We're still awaiting Supervisor Simeon. 
Gotcha. And is Supervisor Lee here? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Supervisor Lee, you'll be leading the uh, Pledge of Allegiance today. You want to do any voice exercises before to warm up, you know? <laughs> Recording in progress. Come on, Mike, let's, I want to hear you belt into this song. <clears throat> Sound of music. <laughs> Everyone, we're just waiting for Supervisor Simidian to join us. And there's the man. has just joined us. Good enough. Thank you very much. Take care, Rhonda. Peggy, will you please take roll? Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you very much. If all those who can, please stand. We are now going to do item number two, the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Supervisor Lee. I pledge allegiance to the flag United of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, God individual, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you very much, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. We now are going to turn to Supervisor Simidian for our invocation. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. and. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome uh, Reverend Yushi uh, Mukajima this morning from uh, the Mountain View Buddhist Temple. Reverend Mukajima has served as the resident minister of the Mountain View Buddhist Temple since 2013, uh, where he leads the Sunday service as well as uh, funeral and memorial services. Uh, the temple is a space, safe space for all people without discrimination and exception. And the Mountain View Buddhist Temple follows the teachings of uh, Jodo Shinsu, uh, which is a branch of Buddhism that emerged in the 13th century uh, in Japan, promoting gratitude and humility. Uh, it is with uh, those brief words that I welcome uh, the Reverend Yushi uh, Mukajima and express our thanks uh, for participation in today's uh, ceremony. Thank you, Reverend. Thank welcome. You. Yes, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity to provide a Buddhist invocation at this important meeting today. I hope that these thoughts will help this gathering transpire peacefully and successfully. Please join me in silent meditation as I share a teaching given by Prince Shotoku, who is a father of Japanese Buddhism. Let's cease from wrath and refrain from angry looks. Nor let's be resentful when others differ from us. For all men have hearts, and each heart has its own leanings. Their right is our wrong, and our right is their wrong. We are not unquestionably sages nor are they unquestionably fools. Both of us are simply ordinary men. How can anyone lay down a rule by which to distinguish right from wrong? For we are all one with another, wise and foolish, like a ring which has no end. This is one of the teachings of Prince Shotoku, who lived in the sixth century. Although he shared these thoughts about 1400 years ago, it still makes a lot of sense in our society today. In this passage, 
Prince Shotoku reminds us that because we are all ordinary people, it's very important to make good decisions while respecting and accepting one another. Buddhism especially emphasizes the spirit of harmony. And the choir is a good example, which illustrates the spirit of harmony. A choir consists of four vocal types, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. And blend of these distinct voices is beautiful. But if each of these voices is only concerned about what asserts its own part, the beauty of the choir cannot be realized. It is only by harmonizing these distinct voices that the choir can create the beautiful and unique sounds that can deeply move people. Even if each part is beautiful, if sunk without regard to the other parts, a resulting and harmonious sound will not be a result. Rather, what we hear will be dissonant and disagreeable. If we ignore another sense of values or deny their expression, which is different from ours, we are creating this discordant world where only our existence is justified and all others are expendable. This way of thinking can only lead to discrimination. That's why a choir is the perfect example to teach us how important it is to live and act in cooperation with others. By enjoying the beautiful voices lifted in harmony, we can understand that we should be aware of others around us so that we can create a peaceful world with acceptance, respect, and trust. It's important to come to the realization that each precious life can shine brilliantly only by making beautiful harmony together. Imagine if all of humanity were to treat others with respect and loving kindness, just as singers do when they blend their voices together beautifully in a choir. Living in such a way is the only path to creating a world of peace and tranquility. A spirit of harmony is the way to true awakening, which can lead lead us to a spiritually rich world. Now that we've held in the new year, please keep in mind that our society and community should come together like a choir, because it is a wonderful example of how people join their efforts to create something beautiful by working together with acceptance, respect, and trust. Let each of us make 2022 a precious and peaceful year by living and working together in the spirit of a harmony. With a radiant and boundless mind of wisdom and compassion, may the spirit of a harmony bring blessings to this gathering. Reverend, thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Peace be with you. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend. Oh, I apologize for that. Show that. There we go. Thank you. Um, with that, Peggy, I was going to move on to item number four. My notes say we don't have any adjournments in memoriam. Is that correct? It is. Thank you very much. We now move on to five commendations. We have the first one by Vice President Ellenberg, followed by Supervisor Smithian. Vice President. Thank you very much. Uh, President Wasserman, it is my honor today to present a commendation honoring the Health Trust and Bloom Catering for their partnership to bring Asian fusion meals to people in need throughout the pandemic. The Health Trust was created in 1996 with the mission to build health equity in Silicon Valley based on the fundamental belief 
that everyone should have the opportunity to be healthy. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Health Trust dramatically expanded services, including providing critical food supports, serving 57 more meals, 57% more meals, and 44% more older adults than in prior years, delivering 300,000 meals for fiscal year 2022. Amid this influx of clients, there was an increase of about 14% of of Meals on Wheels clients who identified as Asian or Asian American. At the same time, Bloom Catering began to provide meals to frontline responders as a service to the community, and they became connected with the Health Trust. Bloom Catering funds programs such as Aid to Children Without Parents, ACWP, has been working to accomplish their mission of providing hope and opportunity one child at a time since 1988. ACWP was founded in response to the needs of thousands of unaccompanied Vietnamese refugee children who were displaced in the late 1980s. The parallel missions between the Health Trust and Bloom Catering led to the creation of a 15-day Asian fusion menu cycle as an alternative to the traditionally Western menus provided for older adults meal delivery services. Together, the Health Trust and Bloom Catering were able to expand access and provide delicious and nutritious meals that match the food preferences of many clients. Cultural congruence is important in all the work we do, and perhaps nowhere so much as in the food we offer. There's often so much comfort in eating the foods of one's childhood or native country, or that somehow associates the eater with feelings of calmness, familiarity, and safety. With that, it is my great pleasure to welcome and introduce first Kelly Chow from the Health Trust. Kelly, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Kelly Chow, and I am the Senior Vice President of Programs at the Health Trust. And on behalf of the Health Trust, our food and nutrition services staff and our homebound seniors and disabled Mules on Wheels clients, we would like to first thank Supervisor Ellen Berg for the nomination, as well as the Board of Supervisor for this honor and commendation. We are very excited to be able to work hand in hand with our local partners, such as Bloom Catering to develop and provide healthy ethnic diverse meals to the clients that we serve. So thanks once again for this um, great commendation. It is our pleasure, Dr. Chow. I'm glad now to introduce Benjamin Lee from Bloom Catering to say a few words. Benjamin. Is he with us? Oh, one moment. I believe I saw him earlier. Uh, Mr. Lee, please accept the unmute to begin speaking, and I will also transfer you to the panelist list. And Mr. Lee, can you open your mic? Sounds close. I apologize. I've asked him to unmute and, and he has not yet accepted it. He is on the panelist list. Okay. Benjamin, let's give you another second or two, hopefully to find that unmute button. Hopefully your, your Zoom version is, is up to date. Um, Thank you. I'll just make an announcement here in, in, in the interim. Um, after our next commendation, we're going to have public comment, which is the opportunity for anyone to speak about anything not on today's calendar. Anyone wishing to do so, please register electronically at this time. Thank you. Back to you, Vice President. Thanks, President Wasserman. Do we have Benjamin? That's he is he, he is here, but he has not Okay. That opened his microphone and now he is no longer in the room. Okay, I think then we'll, we'll have to move on, but it, it looks like maybe Supervisor Lee has something, some information to add on that topic, but I, I'm, I'll conclude my presentation. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee, did you have a comment before I turn to Supervisor Smidian? 
just very briefly, I just want to say the great work of Health Trust under the uh, the leadership of our great friend Michelle Liu, uh, along with uh, Bloom Catering, is just uh, amazing work. Uh, I have uh, personally witnessed it many times. Uh, actually, uh, attended some of the Bloom Catering food packing uh, volunteer activities, donated to the organization. Uh, Bloom is absolutely amazing, uh, not just for the Asian community food, but you know, the food's really tasty. If you haven't had it, I strongly recommend you try it. So I just want to give a big plug to uh, both uh, Health Trust and the Bloom Catering. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee, and thank you to those people electronically registering for public comments. Supervisor Smitting, I turn to you now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, I wanted to uh, take a moment to uh, say uh, thank you as well as uh, uh, farewell to Mike Shapiro, who has popped up on our screen. Uh, Mike uh, is our chief privacy officer, as I'm sure uh, board members know, but uh, he is um, wrapping up his time with the counties relocating. And uh, before that happened, uh, once and for all, I wanted to take a few minutes at our board meeting to say thank you. Um, I think um, uh, some of you will recall, Mike joined our county back in 2017 as our first chief privacy officer. Uh, to stand up uh, the uh, privacy office. Uh, he remains one of the few county level chief privacy officers in the country. Um, he grew the county privacy office from uh, being sort of a uh, one person shop to uh, five full time professionals now, and we have some more on the way, uh, which pleases me. So thank you for that, uh, Mike. He, uh, he integrated our privacy office into uh, the county's operations, which is really what you look for in an organization and a office like this one, so that the sort of a high level uh, analysis and day to day operational support you're hoping for on complex data privacy issues uh, really is integrated into the operations of the organization. And that is a, uh, a slow but steady effort uh, for which we uh, can thank Mike as well. He really has positioned our county as a national leader in local government privacy efforts, uh, everything from um, the relatively high visibility hosting of an annual data privacy day uh, with expert speakers from uh, around the country uh, to uh, fostering public-private partnerships in uh, an effort to establish our county as a true privacy center of excellence, working with industry, working with the academic community uh, to make sure that our county is uh, aware of and on top of the latest privacy threats and solutions, and that we know what the best practices are and what responsible information sharing does and doesn't look like. So just uh, a word of thanks, as I say, to Mike uh, on uh, his way out the uh, <coughs> door. Uh, he's been a really incredible part of modernizing our approach to information privacy and technology policy over these last few years protecting both our, our employees and uh, residents. And um, I just uh, scribbled out a list here before we began, and I, I just want to note, um, it, it looks like every time we talked privacy, uh, Mike was there to help us with the election security event, guidance on our surveillance ordinance compliance, uh, COVID-19 technological contact tracing event, policy guidance on facial recognition, general technology policy guidance on uh, the realm of uh, privacy and beyond, <laughs> countywide trainings on privacy issues, embedding, as I say, the privacy considerations throughout procurement, as an example, or TSS on our uh, uh, tech side. Uh, he basically created the whole office from scratch and has really represented our county extraordinarily well as a leader in privacy at the local government level. So, Mike, uh, thank you. We wish you well. And uh, I take comfort in knowing you're just an email away. So, Mr. President, thank you for that. And if we could let Mike say a word or two, uh, I know him to be a person of uh, brevity uh, as compared or contrasted with myself. So <laughs> <laughs> let's turn to him and see what he would like to that's, share on his way. Good. All right. Or, well, thank you, Supervisor Submitting. I appreciate uh, you know all your help through the years and, and the whole Board of Supervisors as well and my leadership team. Um, you know, it's been a, a really interesting ride. You know, when I got here, as uh, Supervisor Smitty was saying, uh, almost five years ago, you know, when people would say, well, Mike, how's the privacy office doing? And I'm like, well, I am the privacy office right now. Um, so it's it's really interesting to see a program actually built from the ground up and actually come into fruition to where it's at today. I think it's been really great to sort of see that come along and see the privacy office starting to mature and to know that they're still working ahead. But I think we've laid a really solid foundation 
uh, for, you know, not only for our team, but for the county as well. So much so, you know, there's other jurisdictions, other privacy leaders in the field that have reached out to me and have asked for guidance and advice on, on how to make their program successful. So um, certainly something that Santa Clara County is now known for in a very good way, in a very positive light um, that we're, you know, very much, uh, which is nothing new for Silicon Valley to be on the frontier and the cutting edge. Uh, certainly to have a, a chief privacy officer and a privacy program at the local level is something very new. And I think we set a very good example um, around the United States and elsewhere for how a program can be successful. Um, one of the first things that I did was uh, was tackle uh, the surveillance uh, technology vetting that, that we had to do. And, you know, it was a big task, but it got me acclimated to the county and it got me sort of, um, you know, and gender to the rest of the departments of the county in a very short period of time. And I think from that, we've built a, a privacy office that has that full range of privacy uh, support that you really want to see. So it's been really wonderful to, to see that come about. Um, what I can say to the employees out there that uh, the county, you know, for my part of it, has been a wonderful place to work. Um, so I would encourage you that, uh, you know, I know we went through quite some challenging times through the COVID-19 pandemic and have pretty much come out the other side of it, still working through it. Um, but through all that, you know, I can say that the county has been a wonderful place to work. And I'm saying that with someone who has a lot of work experience. And, you know, I could say that the county has been um, certainly that that shining star of an experience to have in my career. Um, also, to the members of the public out there, what I can say, you know, is that we work day in and day out, whether it's the privacy office or the entire county to try to support everything that you do to have a good quality of life. Um, so from end to end, I can say that the county has been, uh, you know, a pleasure to work with and has certainly been serving its constituents in a very positive way. And I would just like to thank, you know, everyone for such a positive experience during this time. Thank you. Thank you. And Mike, I just want to say, oops, I just want to say the uh, high praise on security from that particular supervisor means a ton. So that's, uh, I agree. it almost counts like six supervisors. <laughs> All right. Thank you very Thank much. You Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, best wishes to you and your family in the future. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our accommodations. We now move on to public comment, the opportunity for anyone to speak about anything not on today's agenda. So just a little heads up to everybody. If you're wanting to speak on 10, 11, and 13, there will be an opportunity uh, later in our agenda to speak on all those items. And when you speak on those items, you'll have an opportunity that one time we're gonna combine 10, 11, and 13 as far as public speaking goes. Um, and you'll have the opportunity to speak on one of those items or two of those items or three of those items. This is not the time to speak on 10, 11, or 13. With that said, Peggy, if you'll please set the timer to one minute and start our um, public speakers regarding item number six. Yes, our first speaker is Deborah St. Julian. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. You will have one minute. Good morning. My name is Deborah St. Julian. I'm a member of Surge's Sacred Heart, and I am, in, I am concerned that for the past three years, Jeff Smith, our county executive, has been acting chief of corrections because that position has been vacant. We asked the board to appoint someone to this position as soon as possible since it affects jail operations and conditions, which we know all, we all know are terrible. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Our next speaker is Linda Edwards. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. And your mic is open. Good morning, everyone. I'm not sure if everyone has had a chance to see the latest data from the CDC showing detailed analysis that natural immunity from being exposed to the COVID-19 virus is just as good as vaccine-induced immunity. Isn't that great news? That means that with high case counts in our county, we'll also have high natural immunity numbers. Is that 50%, 60%, 70% of our county with natural immunity? It would be helpful to have a report back from our public health director about that next meeting. Did you also hear that the WHO has declared boosters for children unnecessary? That's important information for parents that are concerned about the myocarditis rates and other negative side effects of these vaccines for children. And data from Israel shows that a second booster for adults is ineffective. Looking at the data on our county dashboard, it looks like COVID case counts for Omicron went straight up for three weeks, peaked on January 5th, and then has been plummeting straight down. Let's talk about an exit plan. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. 
Uh, good morning, uh, board members. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, last Thursday, last Thursday's meeting where um, where uh, Supervisor Lee and Chavez were in attendance, and I'm not saying this 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 is their doing, but somebody's doing it, and they're doing it to me on the on the county on the city level as well. When you go to the video and you go to one minute or, or one hour of uh, 43 minutes in, and it's a housing issue. I can be seen talking for four seconds. The timer clicks, says two minutes, 159, 158, 157, boom. And it just zips, it, I'm, I'm, I'm being censored. I'm being censored. I'm being, uh, uh, basically I'm being abused at a very high level electronic type of abuse. Democracy is being, being uh, uh, in question here. And basically, it's a totalitarian government that I'm serving. I want to answer. Our next speaker is Leslie Z. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, good morning. This is Leslie Zeiger. I'm a men member of Surge at Sacred Heart. Uh, I am concerned that for the past three years, Jeff Smith, our county executive, has been acting chief of correction because that position has been vacant. We ask that the board appoint someone to this position ASAP since it affects jail operations and conditions, which we all know are terrible. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barry Arada. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, all supervisors. My name is Barry Arada. Um, some of you have heard me in the last couple of weeks speak. I'm a native born and raised in Santa Clara County, specifically West San Jose. Currently live in 95030's district. So uh, Wasserman, Supervisor Wasserman, please listen up. I'm a 15 year veteran of the San Jose Fire Department. Dr. Sarah Cody's public health order to enforce these mandates to be boosted, she allowed for a waiver. Not all entities in this county applied for them. We have a critical staffing crisis in the EMS system in this county, as well as our hospitals. The public is now at jeopardy. We need all supervisors to address this immediately through a motion that you put on the table to call out Dr. Sarah Cody and demand answers on hospital wait times, ambulance wait times, fire department on scene times. Do it immediately or people will die. Our next speaker is Kevin Rapport. Please accept the unmute to begin. I speak to you today as a firefighter for Santa Clara County Fire Department. I have a vested interest in keeping the public of this county safe. 66 firefighters work each day for Santa Clara County Fire Department across 15 stations. We're currently understaffed by 17%. We're missing 34 firefighters, seven captains, and one battalion chief. Just this week alone, another 19% of our firefighters were on workers' comp or some form of sick leave. When added together, we're 36% under, 36 understaffed before the vaccine mandate takes place. This vaccine mandate will ultimately harm the citizens of Santa Clara County due to critical staffing shortages, overworked firefighters, and a reduction in services. Our vaccination status does not affect those we serve. Please allow firefighters and other first responders to continue saving lives and safely serving our communities, regardless of their vaccine status. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rosie Moreno. Please accept the unmute to begin. Uh, can I get two minutes? No, it's one minute each. Okay, fine. You can't say much with one minute. So um, this, my name is Rosalina Moreno. Um, I've spoken with BOS over the vaccine, but this is in regards to behavioral health um, under SUDS over six years. Um, there's short staffing, reorganization issues, um, our QI utilization team was dismantled, no organization or direction. Um, upper management is unable to effectively troubleshoot issues and or assist the providers and community we currently serve. We ask for a complete investigation into the behavioral health department as there's staffing shortages and they continue to hire executive and upper management roles, including a liaison to handle their legal affairs. 
one of the other questions is why was such dismantled when it was state recognized? We don't even have outgoing alerts and communications with the providers we serve anymore. Our providers can attest to the ongoing issues with the poorly planned. Our next speaker is Joe Moses. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Joe Moses. I'm a property owner with my wife in Santa Clara County. I was born and raised here and my parents have been here since 1965. I'm a fire captain with Santa Clara County Fire Department and I have two brothers who work at neighboring fire departments within the county. I tell you all of this as I have a vested interest in the health of our Santa Clara County EMS system. This new health order denies anyone a right to keep their position as a firefighter due to a medical or religious exemption to the vaccine. County Fire has faced a number of vaccine related illnesses and some firefighters cannot take another vaccine without risk of injury or even possibly death. These firefighters will be terminated due to their medical condition. The limited waiver form made available is a step towards reasonable accommodation, but it does not effectively address the unique working conditions that apply to our firefighters, nor does it provide a long term solution. This vaccine mandate will ultimately harm the citizens of Santa Clara County. Please allow firefighters and other first responders to continue saving lives. Our next speaker is Rhoda Fry. Uh, I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, supervisors. Mm -hmm. Lehigh Permanente Quarry has applied for a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Take Permit for endangered red-legged frogs for mining and reclamation activities for the next 20 years. Comments are due this Thursday, January 27. I hope that the county can comment. Lehigh says that reclamation would only take five years. That's what they've been telling the county. They should not be allowed to have a permit to kill frogs for mining for the next 20 years. And I think that this permit could also impact the optics of their upcoming reclamation plan. So I'm urging the county to comment to the US Fish and Wildlife Service by this January 27. Also later on the agenda today is item 14. I see that there have been some late comments um, and entered on the agenda. Please do take the opportunity to read them before you hear that this item. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kamala Kotokula. Please accept the unmute to begin. Uh, good morning, board members. I am Kamala, a, cl a clinician on the mobile crisis response team. Um, I want to bring to the board's attention that our team is currently experiencing issues such as retaining staff due to our upper management's um, mismanagement and particularly from our division director. We have always been understaffed and now we have even lesser staff. Um, upper management is continuously failing to provide us with the necessary support we need to perform our duties. This is further impacting our program's needs and service provided to the community. We face management's internal politics, which is impacting our team's morale and emotions. We are also facing the ambiguity of losing more seasoned staff due to low morale. Primary issues we need to be immediately addressed are building staff morale and upper management, hiring more people, and filling all open codes on the team before they make any further changes to our work situations. Thank you. Our next speaker is Harold Thomas. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, Board of Supervisors, and thank you for your time this morning. I am Harold, a behavioral health clinician who is here supporting and representing DHSD co-chief for SEIU. Today, B, uh, BHSD staff are expressing our concern for the survey in regards to staff's, staff's satisfaction working in the department. Despite our attempts to share this, this information uh, with upper management uh, that will be shared with you all later, uh, the executive team acknowledged and declined a venue to discuss and share with them before bringing the survey to you. This demonstrates executives' lack of interest in their staff's well-being. The executive team had over a month to schedule a meet with us, and they declined to do so. How can SEIU members work with a team of executives that do not reply or engage with us when they do not show regard for their to their and they do not show regard to their staff? How can we effectively communicate to support our members who may be experiencing lack of integrity that the county has for upholding the contract with SEIU? This has gone under, unaddressed for far too long. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Hernandez. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Nancy Hernandez. 
My name is Nancy Hernandez and I'm a pretrial services officer with the Department of Pretrial Services for the County of Santa Clara. I'm here because management along with labor relations stopped negotiating with SEIU 521 to come to an agreement over the pretrial services officer job specs on today's agenda. I want you to know that SB 10 didn't pass and this isn't the reason we need changes in our department. It's true that the job specs needs to be updated, but we haven't finished mutually updating the specs. And there's no reason we can't come to an agreement, except that management doesn't feel like they have to. We need your help. We need enough staff for our department from clerical to officers. We need to stop the high turnover so that talented staff stays. Otherwise, we're simply updating the job specs to give a small amount of workers a whole lot more work. Our clients in the community deserve this and, and we deserve enough staff for them to help them. We are asking the county to listen to its workers so that we can better serve the community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ayohana Tapia. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, my name is Joanna Tapia and I'm a therapist with Santa Clara County. I would like to bring to your attention how Santa Clara County Behavioral Health Management continues to disrespect, abuse, and retaliate against staff. They implement new guidelines without even having previous dialogue with ACLU, not giving the staff the opportunity to express concerns on the impacts to the populations we serve or impacts to the staff. They retaliate against union stewards and any staff who questions, brings up concerns, or is vocal in any way. They have pushed out and even fired staff who has made questions in staff meetings. Management have lied and started disciplinary actions on stewards to force them to quit and are even engaging in behaviors to turn staff against each other, causing an unharmonious work environment. One of the main issues is that management do not all have the profession um, licenses and the programs that they oversee, but the staff they oversee do hold those credentials and therefore are more competent than their own managers. Management continues to overload work on staff saying that this is... Our next speaker is Michael Vergona. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning. Morning. Can you hear, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. My name's my name's Michael Vergona. I'm a firefighter with over 20 years experience. The last 11 I've been serving Santa Clara County Fire, or where I've received the Medal of Honor for my service. Because of this new health order that doesn't allow for my doctor's written medical exemption, I'm going to be pushed pushed out of this profession that I've dedicated my entire life to. Because of how short staffed the fire department already is, I've worked over 70 extra shifts during this pandemic. I'm not alone. Pulling us off the line due to this order will not only put our regular shifts, but all the extra shifts on my brothers and sisters left behind who are already tired and overworked. This will put the community and firefighter safety at great risk. Please reconsider this mandate that is even more strict than the states and allow us to continue to serve the people of this county. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Jill Borders. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, thank you. Um, my big issue is that I am becoming increasingly concerned with the idea that there are homeowners and there are renters and this divide that we continuously talk about. We have those that we often even call them stakeholders and more often they're referring to the person who owns the land rather than the resident in the community. Um, I've been trying to brainstorm ideas that we can push forward to value both homeowners and their perspectives. Um, whether or not they rent out their property um, is of consequence as well and of renters. And my idea is that I'd like to see us um, as a county, we receive in the mail our property tax um, thing. It says, you know, where your taxes go and you get this little thing in the mail. And I think each renter should receive one as well with the um, APN number and the amount of property taxes that their landlord pays so that we could all become educated as to the taxes that we are paying in Santa Clara. Thank you. Next speaker is Randy. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, my name is Randy Sullivan. I'm uh, speaking to you today uh, as a member of the Santa Clara County Fire Department. Um, I have a vested interest in keeping the public of the county safe. And <clears throat> I just wanted to go over um, this mandate uh this you know uh health order that is in place and um how it's going to affect our staffing numbers uh just to give you an idea from december 19th to january 19th there's been 592 positions that went to overtime or mandatory force back that is 28 percent of our daily roster 60 times a fire apparatus has been downstaffed 
to have less firefighters for either part or the entire 24 hour shifts that we work due to the lack of staffing. This is an average of two down staff apparatus every day. If you live in Cupertino, Campbell, Los Gatos, Saratoga, Los Altos, or Los Altos Hills, you are going to be affected. The vaccine mandate is ultimately going to harm the citizens of Santa Clara County. Our next speaker is Brian Collins. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Brian Collins. I'm a 23-year member of the Mountain View Fire Department. Um, I had COVID early 2020. I've been working with COVID um, online for the last two years. Dr. Cody's uh, COVID vax mandate, uh, effective February 1st, is a mandate that has been uh, pretty much declared illegal by SCOTUS and several other states. Dr. Cody is not accepting any religious exemptions, despite our city's acceptance of the religious exemption. Um, the data has been irrefutable and has shown that the Vax and booster does nothing to stop the COVID from spreading. There is zero reason for a mandate um, for fire and EMS. This mandate will reduce overall available responders in Santa Clara County. It'll affect you that live here in Santa Clara County. Everybody here on this meeting needs to call and or email Dr. Cody and tell her to rescind this mandate. Uh, this is uh, it's going to basically lo uh, lower and longer the call responses. Um, so all you supervisors need to band together against Dr. Cody's fax mandate. Allow us to serve as they have been the last two years. Thank you. The next speaker is Paula Maddox. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Paula Maddox. I've been with the county for 21 years. Good morning. Um, I often wonder why are we not following the current CDC data? Why is Sarah Cody still pushing these uh, mandates for vaccines when it needs to be reevaluated and rescinded, as the previous speaker had mentioned. There's lot, been a lot of changes, a lot of court orders coming down the pipeline, and yet Santa Clara County does not budge. It does not make sense. Departments are short staffed, important departments, all departments. And yet we're still pulling employees out to vaccine sites, making departments shorter already. It's, our, it's already a hardship. And yet people are struggling to continue to do the work that they were hired to do. And yet no one seems to be looking at this situation anymore. It's just whatever happens, happens. Our next speaker is telephone ending 034. Please accept the unmute to begin. And telephone ending 034, can you accept the unmute? They are not responding, so I will come back. Um, our next speaker is Alex Bruni. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Alex, can you accept the unmute? Your mic is open. For two years, the frontline workers from nurses and doctors and hospitals to police and fire have operated in this pandemic. For one year, there was no vaccine available, yet we were all responding. Now, two years later, those same people are now deemed high risk. If they were high risk and concerned about spreading the disease to their patients, they would have been removed at the beginning of the pandemic. Instead, measures were put in place to control that, whether it was masks, gloves, and respirators. Now, many of those people have natural immunity from their service in this county. On the news this morning, the anchor stated, Omicron likely confers immunity to Omicron and is backwards compatible to Delta. If this is now common scientific knowledge, there's no need for a vaccination for all campaign. The action that Sarah Cody is taking is out of touch with the present state of the endemic. Our next speaker is Michelle. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Michelle Coleman. I'm with Surge at Sacred Heart. For the past three years, Jeff Smith has been acting chief of corrections since that position has been empty. I urge the board to fill the open chief of corrections position since that vacancy affects the conditions in our jail. One thing we have all been agreeing on for a long time is that the conditions in our jail are terrible. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Kyle. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning. I'm speaking to you as 
this morning as a proud firefighter who has served the residents of this Santa Clara County, both prior to and during the pandemic. This public health order is not good for anyone, as many will lose, uh, we may lose experienced firefighters who are being threatened with termination for not wanting to get vaccinated. The firefighters will be left, will be overworked and overstressed having to pick up extra shifts as we are already experiencing a staffing shortage. This could lead to uh, severely uh, lowering services to the county. The people, uh, the unvaccinated individuals in our department have been tested the first day of every shift while vaccinated individuals have not been. You could argue that we've actually been safer for the community and the personal protective equipment that we wear makes transmission impossible to the community and vice versa. Thank you. Our next speaker is Urvish Kumar Mehta. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you very much uh, uh, to the Board of Supervisors, uh, respective Chair, Vice Chair. I wanted to emphasize on what County of Santa Clara as, as a whole, as a government, could uh, bring as a revolution and reforms to the county. First, to establish a to establish international religious freedom and then identify the organization which is supporting the inter international religious freedom. Secondly, work within coordination with the United States International Trade Commission and establishing the trade uh, relations between sister to sister cities and countries. Third, making sure about that, you know, the county, gover go county governance is also connected with the respective embassy, which are presiding within the county itself for example, the embassy of Mexico, the embassy of uh, India, the embassy of Switzerland, they're all presiding within the uh, within the county of Santa Clara. It is equally important that, you know, what uh, reforms are to be placed and also to enable the governance in a similar mode. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Bob. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, supervisors. I just, I just wanna thank you all, first of all, for what you do. In relation to the recent health mandate for St. Clair County, I'm just curious if you could ask Dr. Cody why she's differing from the Department of Health for the state of California. It's a little concerning and discriminatory in nature that the sheriffs weren't involved in this mandate. It seems a little targeted to uh, the hospitals and the firefighters when most of the departments in the fire service are over 90% vaccinated. So it seems like she's targeting approximately 100 people in the fire service and a little bit more in the hospitals. The sheriffs enter high risk positions um, and scenes every day on their 911 calls, but they weren't included in the mandate. So again, this seems a bit discriminatory if we're looking out for public safety. So there might be a different motive here. So my concern is a, would be a civil suit coming down the pipe or something else towards you and Sarah Cody. So again, if you could address this with Dr. Cody and in the effort to protect all of us and why, again, this was a bit discriminatory. Thank you. The next speaker is Trisha Dokas. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning. I apologize. My name is Robert Dosis. I'm a current uh, firefighter in the county of Santa Clara. Uh, say so thank you for your time. Um, I've been a firefighter for 20 years. I've ran through into a lot of burning buildings in my life. I have risked my life multiple times. Um, I know what it is to go to work every day and take that risk that it could be my last. My family knows it as well. For 20 years, we've been doing this. Um, when this all started, I was very hopeful that the vaccine was going to protect everybody the way it was told we would. However, I watched as the department has set policies that have allowed people who are vaccinated to go freely and get sick and get others sick, myself included, getting sick finally from COVID with a vaccinated person. But myself, I always made sure I was safe. I wore masks, I tested regularly. I've done everything I can to protect myself, my workplace and the people I serve. Please reverse this mandate. All it is doing is hurting people and their families. It needs to stop. Thank you, God bless. And going back to telephone ending in 034, please accept the unmute to begin speaking. And your mic is open. Hi. Hi, my name is Lori Humphreys. I'm an OB tech for O'Connor Hospital in labor and delivery, which means we assist um, in both vaginal uh, deliveries and by cesarean section in the OR. I'm asking for staff because I've worked three 16-hour shifts, um, followed by a five-hour cover hole, and then another 18-hour shift, um, all to follow a day where a mom came in 
she um, actually died in one of our rooms on, in the COVID area. Thank God we had two texts that day because um, we did a postmortem C-section, which means she's dead. Um, baby came out. We tried to resuscitate the baby. Um, both baby and mom are brain dead. But this was after four hours of running back and forth. Um, again, I can only say that uh, had there only been one tech, um, we probably we probably would have been. The next speaker is Scott Larger. Please accept me on mute to begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Scott Larger. Good morning. Parked over here on uh, Taylor right now, just kind of looking across in the fog at uh, Spring Street at the crash zone here. I was on a meeting yesterday with the city and county, and there is no uh, RV safe parking programs that are available nor will be ready for their upcoming plan. They're going to start pushing people out of the creek and they're going to start going into zone three. And I keep calling it, you know, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Um, at what point do we pull out the people that we really can help right now that are in their functioning RVs? Um, there are RVs out here that are registered, they're insured, they can be moved to a safe location. That location right now doesn't exist, so hopefully the county can figure something out. Um, the plan, which is not a plan at the PD in their parking lot, um, is not going to be ready for years. So these people have no options. Our next speaker is Dana Hill. Please accept the unmute to begin. And your mic is open, Dana. Hi, my name is Dana Hill. I'm a third generation firefighter at the city of Mountain View. I've been in the fire service for 12 years and I've dedicated my life thus far to serving and protecting the community. And we don't get to pick and choose who we protect. We protect people regardless of vaccination status. We're asking for the same respect as firefighters we give the people and protect the firefighters regardless of our vaccination status. As the County Board of Supervisors, you have an obligation to protect the citizens and the taxpayers of the County of Santa Clara. And as a resident of the city of Mountain View, this COVID max vaccine mandate is not only unconstitutional to deny those with exemptions, but it will hurt the city citizens of the county and my city. And by allowing this mandate, you'll be lowering the standard of care by adding to the staffing crisis of the city of Mountain View's firefighting firefight department. Please stop the discrimination. And I humbly request you stand against Dr. Sarah Cody and rescind this mandate. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please accept the unmute to begin. I'm really alarmed to hear that the fire department doesn't believe in um, vaccinating against COVID. Um, and I've heard this is a problem with the police and the guards in the jail too. It's their responsibility to protect their health so that they won't get sick and be off work and to protect everybody around them too. And I don't want to have to worry that if I'm stopped in my car and I'm not wearing my mask because I'm driving, that some police officer is going to come to my car and, you know, spew COVID in my face around the corners of his mask. Well, I'm probably not going to be allowed to put my mask on because he needs to be able to match my picture and my driver's license. And I think all public servants have a duty of care to their communities to vaccinate themselves. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you, Peggy. Nice job. We now move on to item number seven, which is approval of the consent calendar. Peggy, if you'll please read what we have thus far, and then I've got an announcement to make. And then we'll see if there's any members of the public that wish to speak on consent items. I will with the caveat that it's long and I am not as smooth and entertaining as Colin, but I will do my best. <laughs> um, we have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to consider item numbers 10, 11, and 13 concurrently. Item number 10 is to receive a report relating to improving jail management and operations, appropriately sizing the jail population and alternatives to jail. Item number 11 is to consider recommendations relating to the framework for the county's justice involved clients. Item number 13 is to consider recommendations relating to improving public safety and justice within Santa Clara County through providing more comprehensive behavioral health care and expanding community based alternatives to pretrial incarceration. 
<clears throat> we have a request from Supervisor Travis to add item number 12 to the consent calendar. Item number 12 is to consider recommendations relating to the recommendations brought forward at the November 19, 2021 meeting of the Santa Clara County Human Trafficking Commission. We have a request from Supervisor Lee to add item number 16 to the consent calendar. Item number 16 is to approve county sponsorship of the Actera of Actera in the amount of $1,000 from the Supervisorial District 5 allocation in the Office of the Clerk of the Board, Clerk of the Board, Fiscal Year 2021-2022 budget to support Promise to Our Planet 2022. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to add item number 24 to the consent calendar. Item number 24 is to receive report relating to options for providing at-home COVID-19 tests to Santa Clara County residents. We have a request from administration to hold item numbers 27 and 28 to date uncertain. Item number 27 is to approve job specifications and amend classification plan to add classifications of cardiac sonographer 1, cardiac sonographer 2, cardiac sonographer, sonographer 3, per diem cardiac sonographer 2, and per diem cardiac sonographer 3. Item number 28 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.62 relating to compensation of employees, deleting various alternative, alternatively staffed positions in ultrasonographer and diagnostic imaging technologist classification series and adding 10 cardiac sonographer 3 or cardiac sonographer 2 or cardiac sonographer 1 positions in the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and adding the salary salary schedule to add the classifications of cardiac sonographer 1, cardiac sonographer 2, cardiac sonographer 3, per diem cardiac sonographer 2, and per diem cardiac sonographer 3, and adding footnote number 254, authorizing a differential for cardiac sonographer 2 and cardiac sonographer 3 to receive on-call pay. <clears throat> We have a request from administration to hold item number 29 to March 8, 2022. Item number 29 is to approve agreement with Young Women's Freedom Center relating to providing life coaches with lived experience in human trafficking in an amount not to exceed $676,384 for the period December 15, 2021 through December 31, 2022. We have a request from administration to hold item number 30 to the behavioral health workshop tentatively scheduled for February 2022. Item number 30 is to receive report relating to inpatient, outpatient, intensive care, residential care, and institution for mental diseases capacity with an emphasis on updated data. We have a request from administration to hold item number 31 to February 15, 2022. Item number 31 is to receive a report relating to neighborhood impacts and benefits of a short-term rental and accessory dwelling unit usage, fees and revenue and history within unincorporated Santa Clara County. We have a request from administration to hold item number 32 to March 8, 2022. Item number 32 is to receive a report relating to a collaborative motel placement program. We have a request from uh, Vice President Ellenberg to hold item numbers of 40 through 46, 71, and 72 to February 8, 2022. Item number 40 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 126, $169,999, transferring funds from the general fund COVID and other economic uncertainties reserve to the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center budget relating to enhancement of inpatient and outpatient staffing and supplies and services expenses at VMC O'Connor Hospital. Item number 41 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.77 relating to compensation of employees, deleting and adding various positions in the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Item number 42 is to approve a request for appropriation modification number 127, $418,815, transferring funds from the general fund COVID-19 and other economic uncertainties reserved to the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center budget relating to expansion of services at BMC St. Louis Regional Hospital. Item number 43 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.75 relating to compensation of employees, adding various positions in the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. 
Item number 44 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 125, $169,602, transferring funds from the general fund COVID-19 and other economic uncertainties reserved to the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center budget relating to expansion of services at Valley Specialty Center. Item number 45 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.74 relating to compensation of employees, adding various positions in the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Item number 46 is adoption of executive leadership salary ordinance number NS-20.21.11 relating to compensation of employees, adding two patient quality and safety medical director positions in the Santa Clara Valley Health and Hospital System. Item number 71 is to approve a request for appropriation modification number 70, $11,122,040.50, transferring funds from the American Rescue Plan Act funds, increasing, increasing 2013 Measure A tax sales tax revenue and transferring funds from the COVID-19 and other economic uncertainty reserve to the Office of the County Executive, Office of the Support of Housing, and the Public Health Department budgets relating to adding positions to address the COVID-19 pandemic response. And item number 72 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.40 relating to compensation of employees, adding various classified and unclassified positions in the Office of the County Executive, Office of Supportive Housing, and the Public Health Department relating to the COVID-19 response. And that concludes the consent calendar update. Well, Peggy, actually, there's four more pages that were just sent by County Exec. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Colin would be very No, happy. thank you. <laughs> you just set a very high bar for Colin. Thank you very much. Um, first, I'm going to turn to our board members to see if there's any comments, additions, deletions they wish to make to the agenda. Otherwise, we have one speaker lined up to speak about. And I'll turn to that person, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. I want to go to item 12. This is an item that I put on consent. And this is a referral re from me relating to the recommendations brought forward at the November um, 19 Human Trafficking Commission meeting. I really wanna thank all the commissioners, the advocates and the staff for highlighting countywide accomplishments and service gaps. And wanna request that when um, we are uh, examining our budget that we are also inclusive of ongoing funding for the human trafficking uh, coalition that is community-based. And that's more just a, a referral for discussion to that to that time budget time. Thank you. Um, item 26. This is the Reed Hillview report. I would, if my colleagues are open, like to add 26 to consent with additional direction. Item 26 is a report from staff for community education capacity building regarding board actions on airborne leads health effects on communities surrounding Reed Hillview Airport. I'd like to request that the board receive an off agenda report by the end of February with recommendations uh, relating to sole sourcing or single sourcing the um, lead consultant. And I'm interested in the staff reviewing Luna as our partner organization. We worked alongside the EPA and our federal allies, Congress member Lofgren and Kana, and, I, and I'm very concerned that these door-to-door um, -door efforts happen quickly because we have a lot of people in the community to educate. Um, the Eastside nonprofit Luna um, could be our lead um, agency, which would save us both time and, and um, well, time. But also, I think this is an instance where a single or sole source contract appears to be warranted. They have um, extensive expertise, a proven track record, and have the ability to understand the historical trauma in that area, cultural and linguistic, linguistic competency. And my belief is that we have contracts with them and other agencies already, which would allow us simply to expand those contracts. And that is all for um, item 26. Uh, yeah, thank you, item 26. And I did wanna just say to the staff, what a well done staff report that really allows me to take this single action if my colleagues would be supportive. Item 67 is in response to my referral and an action that will enable the county to purchase and install free period product dispensers in some county restrooms. I'm comfortable with this remaining on consent. 
but will ask that the staff come back with a work plan and a timeline for all activities that were in the original directive from the Board of Supervisors so that, um, and with a budget that comes back um, to us before our budget process so that we can complete this, this entire process with an emphasis on prioritizing leased facilities um, and um, the work needs, that needs to be done to include these in men's restrooms. Um, and also just the work plan and timeline for conducting outreach and education. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now I'll turn to the public speakers. We've got- We have three. another colleague, um, Supervisor Ellenberg. Has Oops, I see a hand waving. Yes. Thanks, President Wasserman. Uh, first, at the last Board of Supervisors meeting, I was registered as abstaining from items 51 and 79, and I wanna make a correction to the record, please. Item 51 was to approve a no-cost exclusive negotiating agreement with American Cricket Enterprises, Inc. related to a potential ground lease of county property at the fairgrounds. Uh, I had not intended to abstain on that item. I had intended to vote yes. Item 79 was the adoption of the Executive Leadership Salary Ordinance, number NS-20.21.09, relating to compensation of employees, increase, increasing the flat rate salaries of the assessor, uh, district attorney, and sheriff classifications. Um, that was the item on which I had intended to abstain. So just uh, for the record, again, only intended to abstain on item 79 and not 51. Uh, next, I'd asked for items 40 through 46 uh, to be held. And of course, that meant Peggy had to read them all until the next meeting. Um, but after some follow-up with staff from uh, VMC and OBA, I am content to put these items back on consent, but given the importance and the magnitude of these changes in supporting access to care for our patients and managing workloads for our staff, I would like to see items of this scale brought forward to Sunshine First at the Health and Hospital Committee um, prior to bringing to the board or at least for board discussion rather than placing them on consent in the future. Uh, and uh, next, it was my understanding from the November ARPA discussion, uh, my understanding from that discussion was that the feedback that was provided by the board would be incorporated into the ARPA allocation plan and brought back for final approval alongside the unresolved questions of pandemic pay for extra help employees and part-time nurses, uh, FEMA reimbursement progress, and a COVID revenue dashboard. Given that these items have not yet been presented, I would like to hold the items that relate to ARPA funding so that we can discuss them at our next uh, meeting on February 8th in the context of the mid-year budget. Um, so this would be holding items 71, 72, and 25 until February 8th. 71 and 72 relate to COVID responders in the CEO and OEM offices and 25 for the COVID small business supports. That is all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice President. And my comments were um, going to be dealing with 40 through 46. So thank you for putting those back on consent. Supervisor Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, let me just make sure I have the right number here when I ask that we leave item number 24 on the regular agenda. This is the yes. report back on uh, providing at-home COVID-19 tests. There was a request from one of my colleagues uh, to uh, put the item on consent, but I, I do think it's important that we sunshine the item and have some conversation. So let's uh, leave that on the regular agenda, please. And I will just add my comments. Uh, I too was uh, engaged by uh, the magnitude of the activities on items uh, 40 through 46 with respect to our hospitals and um, I've had a chance to talk with administration about them. I'm comfortable with moving forward on them today as uh, both you and Supervisor Ellenberg have now indicated. I will just add that I think um, there is real benefit, frankly, in having full-time permanent positions uh, perform these various duties rather than continued and or excessive a reliance on uh, extra help or travelers or visiting uh, folks who I think um, 
uh, do their best, but are uh, not the ideal solution. So, uh, and to Supervisor Ellenberg's point, uh, yes, I think these can and should be sunshine to the greatest possible degree in the future. And if that's uh, either at the full board or at the committee, uh, fine by me. But I, I agree with the need to have a little conversation about what these very significant uh, decisions uh, are, are predicated on. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn to Peggy and ask to hear a minute each from our speakers, members of the public. Thank you. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. One moment while the timer comes up. I'm unmuting you. Uh, one moment. And Mr. Soto, yes. you may begin. Okay. Um, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, where, where I'm being uh, erased from the public record is at one hour, 13 minutes, 55 seconds. You start from there on the January 20th, 2022. It's not a mistake. It's it's a literal censorship. And so um, I don't know how we're going to handle it, but the stonewalling isn't going to isn't going to cut it anymore. One, one of the supervisors needs to needs to have at least some kind of open line of communication with me. I participate in these meetings every single week all subcommittee meetings, at least as many as that I can attend, and to be uh, treating, uh, uh, whether regardless of what your personal feelings may be towards me, to be treating me like this, and to be circumventing the democratic process in such a sinister way, there needs to be some answers. You know, don't, don't force one of the poorest citizens in this city to have to fight something as large as Santa Clara County. Our next speaker is Kimberly Gutierrez, Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, Kim Gutierrez, Anti-Human Trafficking Services Program Manager at Community Solutions. I'm speaking in regards to item 12. I just wanna thank Supervisor Chavez for bringing forward this recommendation to understand the evolving needs of human trafficking survivors in our community. Achieving self-sufficiency is critical as a survivor moves towards their career, educational and financial goals. Community Solutions has been working in partnership with Futures Without Violence to identify these self-sufficiency needs of survivors and create comprehensive programming that reflects these needs. We look forward to ongoing conversation about and collaboration to meet the needs of the survivors in our community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sean Allen. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, my name is Sean Allen. I am a sergeant assigned to, the, to our jail systems and a former president, founder, and current vice president of the Fraternal Order of Police, Lot 65. <clears throat> Excuse me. With the combined 32 years of law enforcement services for our county, I believe it is important that we do not repeat the same failures that we have in the past. Our staff takes pride in providing quality services. However, we're not equipped to provide adequate services for human beings <clears throat> struggling with mental health. With respect to the victims of crimes, I implore all the decision makers to provide alternate means of care for these human beings so that we do not repeat the same failures of recent times. Building a new jail is not the answer. It is important that we put in place practices and a leader that is committed to jail services and actively invo involved in re resolving the current status of mental health care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Urvish Kumar Mehta. Please accept the unmute to begin. To all the Board of Supervisors, I wanted to mention about uh, item number uh, 11, 12, 13, and all the way up to 19 about the uh, the Human Rights uh, Commission and the United States and the and the uh, uh, and the violations of a of a law in terms of a human trafficking. It is important that you know in within our civilization system we have a disappropriation in order to address a disappropriation we need to implement certain laws ordinances and on january 22nd <clears> order <throat> you some introduced the same law based upon the roe versus Wade case as we are addressing the disappropriation on every basis all the human trafficking issues within our within the county and the respective cities are to be addressed because that is the goal of a sustainable development and would be the case that you know as we continue to progress to address that the county continues to provide the freedom 
on the issues that they are addressing and doing the better civilization. Our next speaker Thank is Catherine Hedges. Yes. Thank you can hear me. Before yes. we continue the next speaker, um, Dr. Smith, your hand is raised. Did you wish to speak now or after the public? I can speak after the public. Okay. Oh, right. Thank you. Please continue, Peggy. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Your mic is open if you wish to begin. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Catherine Hedges. Right now, I'm not speaking for Surge. I support uh, Paul Soto. He is a very dedicated member of the public. I hear him making very good comments at all of these meetings that I attend. And um, he, his remarks should not have been deleted from the record. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yesenia Ortiz. Please accept the unmute to begin. Yesenia, can you accept the unmute? Your mic is open. Hi, my name is Yesenia and I'm a family member with Silicon Valley Debug. And I came to Debug almost three years ago when my husband was incarcerated. They have been supporting me the whole way since. I'm speaking to support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral under item 13. I support no new jail and that the county explore alternatives to incarceration. Specifically now during COVID, um, my husband has been ill several times in there. There's not a six feet rule. It's not very safe for them in there right now. And it also does break up a lot of families. Um, and I do support other alternatives as there are other alternatives to incarceration and that will benefit everybody. So again, I do not support no new jail. Thank you. Peggy, before you continue to the next speaker, um, I allowed that one to go ahead, but we have 10, 11 and 13 going to be held together coming up shortly where people will be invited to speak as they wish about all three together. This is the consent calendar. This is not the time to speak about 10, 11 or 13. Thank you, Peggy. Our next speaker is Rogelio Campos. Please accept the unmute to begin. Rogelio, can you accept the unmute? They are not responding. I'll come back. The next speaker is Cecilia Morales. Please accept the unmute to begin. And Peggy, these might have been speakers on 10, 11, and 13 that have chosen not to speak. And I'm, I will come back to Cecilia Blair Beekman is our next speaker. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. Um, there's a few things about uh, Voting Rights Act issues. Um, Martin Luther King's birthday was a few weekends ago. It was really, uh, I had an interesting time. I think it's important that uh, we can actually work towards a unified effort, uh, I think, in this upcoming decade of what can be voting rights issues for everyone that can be inclusive for everyone. And I'm tired of all this kind of backfighting and uh, what, uh, just uh, defensive uh, reactionary policymaking over voting rights issues. I think people like Stacey Abrams has set a really important course for ourselves and that if we address openly, you know, the upcoming decade of uh, uh, you know, use of electronic voting, I think there's something that can unify all of us as a country. Good luck in those efforts, how we can all move forward together. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gregorio Navarroi. Please accept the unmute to begin. Gregorio, can you accept the unmute? Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, probably somebody can try to learn my, my English is not really good, but I want to speak in Spanish, okay? okay. Uh, yo no estoy de acuerdo en, yo tengo un, un ser querido en, en la cárcel y, y no estoy de acuerdo con la que hagan otra cárcel más para meter inocentes a veces adentro. Entonces, uh, Yo no estoy de acuerdo con eso. Me gustaría que ese dinero lo hiciera, lo sacaran para hacer centros de re rehabilitación para que puedan incorporarse al, a, afuera otra vez, porque a veces salen peor de cómo entran. Gracias. Bye. Peggy, can we have the translation, please? 
yes. Um, okay, so I don't agree with the, with the new jail. I have a, a love person in the jail. And I want to say that I don't agree with the new jail because sometimes we have more innocent people there. This is the case sometimes. And I would rather prefer this money to be used in rehab centers and help people to get incorporated again to the society because sometimes they go out even worse. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Luna. Please accept the unmute to begin. And your mic is open, Sharon. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Supervisors, President Wasserman. I am speaking today because I was interested in item 26 um, and it has removed, gone over to consent. And I was wanting to make a comment in regard to um, item 26. And I'm hoping that uh, I could learn more information uh, in regard to what the intent is over in the Reed Hill area and how it's going to uh, be rolled out to the rest of the Santa Clara County. Um, this report is only for lead levels around Reed Hillview. However, we know that lead is all through Santa Clara County and we're especially interested in how San Martin is going to be rolled out with this type of program. So I'm asking perhaps you could put item 26 back on the agenda. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tony M. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you so much for allowing me the time to speak today. My name is Tony Mose and I'm a resident of Los Altos and a member of Los Altos for Racial Equity and a voter who lives in District 5. I'm also a black woman born in Trinidad who immigrated to this country at the age of 13. I've lived in seven other countries and I have to say that I have never witnessed the level of incarceration in any of those countries as I have in the US. It is truly disheartening that we focus on putting people behind bars instead of focusing on ways to make them contributing and caring members of our community. We need to work on alternative ways to help those who commit crimes. Given the current social climate, now is the time to make changes by focusing on improving the mental health and the social circumstances of those who end up in the judicial system, not by opening new jails. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Julieta Flores. Please accept the unmute to begin. Julieta, can you accept the unmute? I will come back. Our next speaker is Jose Serban. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Jose, can you accept the unmute? I will come back. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. Uh, item number 41 or 42 uh, in regards to the mobile health um, crisis teams, the grant for close to 700 grand. Um, I, I would ask if we could start sending, even though it's not necessarily the county's jurisdiction, um, is there a way we can kind of uh, fill in the void of what the city of San Jose is not doing out there at Spring Street? These people could set up shop. Your mobile health crisis team wouldn't even need to be mobile. They could literally set up camp and be there 24 seven. So maybe we could uh, uh, pull some strings, ask people higher up the ladder, how we make that happen. Uh, these people should not be in the middle of traffic. They should not be in the middle of our creeks. Some really bad stuff is going on out there. Um, they need adequate care. They need to be put on holds and they need help, 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 help. Lots of help, thank you. Our next speaker is Colin Ford. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, good after, good morning. Uh, my name is Colin Ford from Fresh Lifelines for the Youth. Um, as a member of the Real Coalition, I'm here asking that the county not move forward with the building of another jail um, and support uh, County Supervisor um, Ellenberg's proposal to initiate a community dialogue um, about and study of community-based alternatives to incarceration. 
um, and expand funding for behavioral health treatment outside of jails. Um, we really need to invest in jail depopulation solutions. Uh, there need to be mental health um, solutions. We know that over 25% of the people locked up in our counties uh, jail have a serious mental uh, health illness um, and, and jails are the worst place possible for those folks. Um, so um, just here to uh, share that we need to be looking at other solutions and that building a new jail is not the solution. Thank you. And Colin, the item you're speaking on is 10, 11, and 13. So you've just spoken on that item now. And a reminder to the four people remaining to speak, this is speaking regarding the consent calendar, not 10, 11, and 13 jails, uh, mental health, et cetera. Thank you. Our next speaker is Molly M. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, my name is Molly McLeod. And for, to make it easier to participate in democracy, um, I strongly suggest putting the, um, Board of Supervisors item that's under discussion. So consent calendar instead of just the clock for the time down, this is an accessibility issue that um, makes it less confusing um, and more welcoming to participate because then whenever somebody joins, they can see here's what the item is. It's a request I've previously made and I look forward to being implemented very soon. It'll make it easier for everybody, all the Board of Supervisors, all the participants, all the staff and um, it's something that a number of jurisdictions have, have done. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Quincy Phillips. Please accept the unmute to begin. Your mic is open. All right. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Quincy Phillips, and I'm the Executive Director for Lighthouse Building Back Better, which is fiscally sponsored at Joint Venture Silicon Valley. We strongly oppose any proposal that includes the creation of a new jail. I have a long I'm history gonna, of I'm gonna interrupt. I'm gonna interrupt you and our time hasn't started. Quincy, you mm -hmm. want to speak when we're talking about 10, 11, and 13. This is the oh, so sorry. This is the consent calendar. No problem. Thank you. Yep. Our next speaker is Maria Gomez. Please accept the unmute to begin. Maria, can you accept the unmute? I will try to come back. Our next speaker is Cecilia Morales. Please accept the unmute to begin. And she is not responding. Uh, the last hand is Jose Raya from Silicon Valley Debug. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, is this on uh, items 10, 11, and 13? No, it is not, Jose. We'll be okay, there in a little while. No worries. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll sure. Hold on one second, Peggy. Supervisor Chavez, you did you want to make a comment now or wait till the speaker's finished? When the speakers were concluded. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Peggy. Going back to Maria Gomez, please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Maria, can you accept the unmute? I will go ahead and lower her hand. Oh, there you are. Sorry, I have a problem so here. Um, uh, uh, perdón, mi nombre es Maria Gomez. Y estoy aquí para apoyar. Um, uh, no estoy de acuerdo con que construyan más cárceles porque necesitamos más um, programas positivos para las personas que han tenido uh, problemas con la ley. Y estoy en contra de construir más cárceles. Gracias. And Peggy, if we could please have our translator announce that anyone who announce in Spanish, anyone who wishes to speak, what do they need to do, Peggy? Um, what, press on what? Um, use to, if they wish to speak um, on items 10, 11, and 13. No, if they wish to speak to get their microphone started. It seemed oh. that we had three or four people that might not have understood Ex the directions. A, um, if the translator could explain that they need to click on the unmute Thank you. Uh, button that pops up on their screen. Thank you. Could we please have that said in Spanish right now? 
un recordatorio para las personas que quisieran hablar en español. Si quisieran hablar en español, por favor hagan clic en el botón Unmute o quitar silencio en la parte inferior de su pantalla, por favor. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So I will continue with Maria Gomez's um, comment. Yes. So, um, okay, Maria, uh, my name is Maria Gomez and I don't support or I mean, I don't agree with the, um, with having another jail. We need more positive programs and uh, we need, yes, we need more positive problem programs for people that are getting in trouble with the law enforcement. But definitely, I don't agree with having another jail. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you, Peggy. Nice job. I'm now turning to Dr. Smith. You've had your hand up. Yes, uh, Mr. President, members of the board, as you consider uh, 71 and 72 for uh, February, I wanted to sort of clarify some of the issues in the transmittal and tell you we'll change the transmittal to be a little bit more, have a little bit more explanation. These are recommendations for physicians to respond to the COVID uh, pandemic and be able to uh, reposition our DSW workers back to their home departments. We're recommending basically uh, creating a fairly constant uh, COVID response team uh, because right now the organization is severely challenged by the high usage of DSWs, but um, we'll have more explanation in February when you consider it. I just wanted to sort of make sure that people understood that. Thank you, I appreciate that clarification. We've had so many employees serve as DSWs the last two years, uh, doing their best, but at the same time crippling the department. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that discussion. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I wanted to respond to um, one of the speakers, Sharon Luna, who was interested in learning more about what would be happening in South County. And what I'd like to recommend, Supervisor Wasserman, since the referral doesn't speak too much to South County, that we um, ask staff um, to Sylvia um, Gallegos to meet with Sharon um, and the community there to, to dig in deeper to the work that needs to be done next. Sure. Um, I, I, Thank you, I'll add that to the action. And then um, colleagues, item 94, I just wanted to say to the SEPA staff, the grant application for the California Department of Transportation for the 3 million um, to, to provide uh, support to our staff relative to encampments um, is really very exciting and looked very well done. So I wanted to say thank you to them for that. And then item 73, um, Colleagues, I apologize for this, but this is in response to a, a referral that came from Senator Cortezzi and I in April of 2020 um, relative to voter suppression and voter engagement. And the goal was to create a, a local voter rights act to promote voting as a cultural norm here in the county and to make sure all the eligible voters were able to vote. What I'd like to do is request well, that this be deferred to March 8th. Um, and, and in part um, to thank County Council and the ROV for their work to date, but I think it would give us an opportunity to smooth out some of the edges of that proposal. And that's item 73 to come back March 8th. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's the consent calendar with the various changes we've heard from the public. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is still raised. Did you wanna make a motion to approve? Oh, so moved. Thank you very much. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Vice President Ellenberg. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Peggy, roll call, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Sabidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for the public listening, we're now gonna hear items eight and nine, which I feel will go relatively quickly. And then we will hear 10, 11, and 13 um, together as far as people speaking. So your opportunity is coming up. If you wanna talk about the jails, eight and nine are not the time to do so. That said, we're now going to item number public, excuse me, item number eight, which is a public hearing to consider amendments to the fiscal year 2021-22 annual action plan for community development block grants, CDBGs, and HOME, H-O-M-E, Investment Partnership Act funds. The first thing I'm going to do is open the public hearing to receive any testimony. 
Peggy, if you will do so, please. And let's just, uh, well, for this, two minutes each. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. One moment while the timer comes up. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for this item. I am starting to learn that uh, you guys, uh, local Bay, local South Santa Clara County cities are making some honest attempts at um, very low income housing ideas. And I just wanted to uh, thank yourselves for uh, all the work that you were doing at the MTC level and that your reports came in by November. Uh, I'm just starting to really understand that stuff better now. <laughs> So thank you for that work and effort and uh, good luck in the continuing practices of, of housing for and, and just being able to openly talk about amongst ourselves in public comment time, the importance of uh, extremely low and very low income housing. And, and, and what I think is uh, mixed income ideas, I think offer an incredible flexibility in how we make choices for the future of our communities and neighborhoods. Uh, good luck in those efforts uh, to make a more open, accessible public dialogue. And um, I guess uh, if, if this can be appropriate at this time with all the new subsidy uh, funding coming in from the state and federal level uh, for, for uh, uh, homeless issues and, and finding housing for people, um, a good luck in how we can continue what are our good practices and how the subsidy money can really, really be of help to really uh, continue to, to build better our, our current homeless programs. I think it, it can help in tremendous amounts. Good luck in how you'll be organizing those ideas and, and better developing those things. And uh, with that, something can be really hopeful to address uh, homeless issues at this time, and hopefully this this funding can have a part uh, with it. With it, thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin. Uh, yes, uh, Paul Soto from Horseshoe. Um, from 2016 till today, market rate housing goals year after year have been met at 95 to 115 percent. These are facts. 2016 to, to today, uh, ELI, VLI, and like everything else, like the regular people, has never broken 25%. It has never broken that. So my suggestion is this, because it's going to take some bold, courageous action, because we can't do it. The, the status quo, the way that we're trying to move in that direction, that's not going to happen anymore. People are going to be dying on the street. OK, and I'm vulnerable. I'm one of those one of those citizens that could possibly be dead because I'm that close from being evicted, you know, in terms of the vulnerability. So this is my suggestion is that there is a pause. I'm not going to say moratorium, but a pause on the market rate housing builds until you build up the infrastructure of the affordable and everything else. OK, and then once you've done that over a three year period at 60 percent, at 60, I'm not even asking for 100, but at 60 percent, you've been able to maintain those goals for those classes of, of, of housing. Then you can continue, because if you continue at the rate now, it's not going to happen. It's it's not going to happen. The incomes are going to come in and it's going to accelerate the gentrification process. OK, and so I'm going on record with the suggestion because three years from now, I want to reference this, what I'm saying now, that the county and the city has been put on notice that this is absolutely necessary at this point in time. But I know it's going to take bold and courageous action. But I, I'm here and I'll back your play. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. I will then close the public hearing. And our next item is to consider recommendations related to implementing the one-time home investment partnership. So we have possible actions delineated on pages three and four of the agenda. Do I have a motion from any supervisor? Supervisor Chavez? Oh, we have Consuelo to speak as well. Let's hear from Consuelo first. 
Thank you, Board President Wasserman. Um, good morning. I just wanted to clarify an error in table two. Um, it should read 3,279,979 instead of the 1.9 million that's in there. Um, and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez. I would move approval of staff's recommendation. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. I'm happy to second it with a brief comment. I'd, Go ahead. Which is really just a, one of appreciation to Consuelo and to the rest of your team for bringing the item forward today. Um, these funds are working to help us uh, augment the opportunity to end family homelessness in our county. I understand that the assistance today can provide support for 200 families, and I'm looking forward to hearing the uh, progress report in a couple of months. Thank you very much. And the motion before us comes under 8B approved delegation, 8B 1, 2, and 3, which are three approvals of delegation. Any further comment on this item? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, Peggy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. For everyone listening, we're now moving on to our second public hearing, the implementation of energy efficiency measures at South Santa Clara County Fire District owned property located at 10810. No name Uno, one of the, my favorite names of a street in all of Santa Clara County. It's called No Name Uno. So I'm now gonna open the public hearing. I would say to the three people that have already registered, this is a public hearing about this item. So anyone wishing to speak on items 10, 11, and 13, as soon as we close the public hearing on this item, you may register your hands electronically to speak on the jail issue coming up. So with that, I've opened the public hearing. Peggy, would you please call on the speakers? And if you wish to speak about this item, stay on. If you want to talk about the jails, please remove yourself for a few minutes. Go ahead, Peggy. And are we using a two minute timer? Yes, we are. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. One moment. Uh, please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto. I want to challenge the integrity of any kind of negotiation that goes on with respect to uh, the city of Gilroy, that Councilwoman Armendariz be excluded from that. She has not been called out. She accepts grant money from the county to protect children. And it was the children that needed protection from her. So I absolutely Im implore this county to start taking some accountability, start taking some bold action, and start holding some people accountable. This county has not, as a whole, called that out. A little boy, do you know how tall he was? Mr. Maciel was about five, six and about 130 pounds soaking wet. There was other three other boys that were shot, two guns found and no one's in custody. She was there at the house and you don't think that she knows who it was. That's the crime. Now, unless we as a society, because I don't I don't want to be a part of a society that allows that to happen that, with impunity. And oh, well, there's no investigation. There's no, there, there, there has been no arrest. No, there's an ethical and moral issue here as well. Because if this happened, if, if the person was white and this happened, she would be up and down the street, marching up and down with all of these people demanding, demanding justice. Yet she can't hold herself to account to the same measure of justice. Yet, and the county that I live in, that I resided that was allocating grant money in that direction is saying nothing. I have to question the morals and ethics of my of my uh, board members. I have to. I, I, I'm duty bound to do that as a citizen. So I don't want her anywhere near. Any Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please accept the unmute to begin. Catherine, can you accept the unmute? Yes. Thank you. Um, this is Catherine Hedges, District 2. I'm not speaking for Surge on this issue. Um, I agree with Paul Soto. And also, I was blocked from speaking on the housing issue. 
And I don't appreciate that. I speak on housing issues all the time, and I don't know why you won't let me speak today. Um, I think we need to investigate the providers of, uh, I mean, we need more housing. Um, the speakers were absolutely correct about that. But I live in a building with permanent supportive housing tenants, and they're not getting the support they need. A lot of them were pushed out of the building because they weren't getting the support they needed. We need to investigate the providers like abode services. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pamela, Pamela Emanuel. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yes, hi. Similar to um, the previous speaker, I was blocked from talking about the housing issue and I do not appreciate that. My hand kept being lowered when I was raising it. So, um, and I'm and as we go forward with the rest of the agenda, there are, you know, needs that need to be met by the community and by the Board of Supervisors. And I hope that you guys allow everyone to speak. Um, so I'll be talking about the previous uh, statements that we're told uh, about regarding the housing issue. So I currently, me and my organization, we currently, uh, you know, do a lot of community work out in the field uh, off of spring and heading. And the city has turned off all electricity, um, even the lights that uh, the airplanes use to, those red lights that the airplanes use to guide themselves into the airport. All of that is turned off, which I'm almost positive is illegal. Um, you guys turned cut off the water you guys even pulled up the pipe so people can't have access to water um you guys took away all of the dumpsters um so now there is a big waste uh exposure in the area that has caused a lot of um rodents to come around that area and i understand that you guys are now currently going to be more involved in these um you know in these topics and i hope that you guys also involve you know not the community but not just in public comment but actually have like a, a committee where the community and those who are in house can speak about the issues that are in that area um because that is a crisis it is a health crisis it is a human crisis um there is a current disease that is spreading in that area that the rats are carrying and it's causing the dogs to uh, pass away in just a few days and that can also happen to humans but the uh, effects are more long term, but it does cause like kidney failure um, and different failures of the body like jaundice and respiratory complications. Um, and so I ask that you guys all have uh, a committee that the community can be a part of. Thank you. And for the record, we don't block anyone intentionally. I'm sorry about whatever mechanical failure might have occurred with your hand raising up and down. Peggy, please continue. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you. Uh, the way I'm understanding Paul Soto's story, he got uh, kind of an injustice done to him uh, about a few years ago this fall. And uh, a few months later, uh, it was with the Gilroy council person and the Gilroy council person had her incident uh, at her home. Uh, we, Gilroy was doing some really interesting work with housing at that time, low income and extremely low ho housing income ideas. It was kind of a model for Santa Clara County. Those good practices had to come to, to, a, to a halt and how to talk about openly. Uh, it was kind of sad that that happened. And there was a nice growth, a uh, public process being able to be talked about that was closed. So good luck how we can work on healing this situation. And, and Paul's been a bit of an injustice has happened to Paul. Good luck in our efforts to make this a healing effort to, to better understand the issue. Uh, with that said, uh, for this item, uh, Paul actually, Paul Soto, he speaks uh, some interesting words about uh, the storage capacity issues that we're working on, these en energy efficient I and ideas. They're really, really important for our future and um, necessary and, and interesting. And I thank you for this work and effort. As we are trying to build towards this uh, a new world of electricity uh, that doesn't will not need natural gas, um, I'm, I'm for this 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 uh, effort. Um, it's interesting, but it's from that uh, we have to really be considering that we're going to be mining uh, minerals from from different parts of the world uh, for this new world of electricity use we're creating. And the worker rights issues involved with that is incredibly important and really should be in the front of our minds in however we move forward with these issues. I just wanted to remind ourselves of that. And uh, 
Thank you for your time. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much, Peggy. So now we are gonna close the public hearing. This now is the time for anyone wishing to speak on items 10, 11, and 13, which we're gonna hear just a couple of minutes to raise your hand electronically. And it sounds like you're all listening. All right, Supervisor Lee, do you have comments or a motion? Yes, I'm ready for motion and comments. Thank you. So we've opened, we've closed, we've heard from the public. We are now looking to you, Supervisor Lee, for your comments and a motion. Thank you. I'd like to move according to um, uh, staff recommendation to adopt the resolution of board directors of the South Santa Clara County Fire District make all necessary findings required uh, as stated in the possible action one, two, and three. Um, and I'm ready for um, comments if I can get a second. Thank you. Second from Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Lee, your comments? Yeah, first of all, I would really want to commend staff and the uh, SCC Silicon Valley uh, clean energy for working together to help better prepare our firefighters. And for fair disclosure, I'm also a uh, new board member for the SVC as well. I'm excited about this brand not only because it will help reduce carbon emissions, which is extremely important as we are turn a turning point in our fight against climate change. But it will also help ensure that the mass and fire station has inter uninterrupted energy it needs during emergencies. In addition to helping make this fire station more self-sufficient, will also help the county to save substantial money and help relieve stress on our budget by allowing us not to be impacted by price fluctuations in the power market. So for these reasons, I'm happy to support this item and encourage staff to seek out and apply for more of these types of grants in the future. Thank you. Thank you. A motion made and a second. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Thank you very much. And as I've said half a dozen times, we are now at 10, 11, and 13. We will start with the hearing, with hearing from the public, who will have 30 seconds each to speak Mr. about. President. Yes, I'm turning to you, Dr. Smith, in just one moment. Um, Anyway, we'll do 30 seconds each. They can speak about 10 and or 11 and or 13. Dr. Supervisor, Smith. Supervisor Wasserman, if I may, I, I think that it's more uh, fair to the public to allow them to hear uh, the presentations from staff first in case they have comments on or questions about anything that's presented. Thank so. you. Turn, I'm turning to Dr. Smith right now. Go ahead, Dr. Yes, thank you. I wanted to uh, speak before the public in order to really clarify what our recommendations are and what we've been doing because you have before you hundreds of pages of documents that have been uh, developed for a long time and have a lot of information and it is uh, sometimes unclear what the recommendations are. So please, uh, we'll take some time today. I will be doing the presentations. And what uh, I will do is we'll talk, we have a present or PowerPoint about number 10, a PowerPoint from Jim Austin after that, and then a PowerPoint on number 11. But first I will take some time to give context and upfront tell, tell the board and the public what our recommendation is. Thank you, I appreciate that. So, <clears throat> Everybody, I think, agrees, uh, certainly staff agrees, that the goal is to divert as many individuals from custody as possible and to reduce the census in our jails as much as we possibly can. This will take a multifactorial effort, um, and we've already been doing that. Um, it means developing services that can be used for diversion-free adjudication, it means developing preventative services. It means developing reentry services. I think it's fair to say that Santa Clara County has been in the forefront when compared to the other 47 counties and doing all of that. We made the decision when AB 109 provided funding to actively use that funding to uh, divert individuals from custody and to get them out of custody as fast as possible. Most other counties use that for structural improvements. However, <clears throat> we currently still have about 2,400 inmates in jail. 
Um, and you'll hear later on from a lot of other people about the severity of their offenses. We've had a jack list, which is our intention, our list that's made up by the courts to divert pre-adjudication as many inmates as possible who need outside services. Right now, the jack list is at its lowest number ever, but from all of our evaluation by um, the um, pre-trial department and others, we think we'll never get below, and I shouldn't say never, it's unlikely and practical for us to get below 300 um, individuals on that list how, on a consistent basis. However, we're now down into the 60s and 70s, so that's great. We found out during COVID that we could probably get our census down into the 2000 range, and that's certainly our goal at this point. In terms of BSCC certification, this is the state entity that certifies the uh, um, jail facilities. We're currently certified at Main Jail North for about 854 inmates and at Elmwood for 3,078 inmates, meaning our certification is around 4,000. We would very much like with this proposal to um, cut that basically in half at least. Uh, we think that having as fewer beds as possible is the best approach. However, we won't get to zero and we will be obliged as always um, to provide a therapeutic environment for those who remain. We will be recommending, therefore, um, developing a plan to demolish Main Jail North, um, to demolish large sections of Elmwood, and in order to actually operate the system that requires building a new facility, at least one new facility. Um, and our recommendations will be to um, build a 500 bed facility in uh, the Civic Center area. So it will actually just be replacing uh, with fewer than the current certified number of inmates, the Main Jail North facility. So we will no longer have two facilities at um, the Civic Center, we'll only have one with a 500 rated capacity rather than one with an 854 rated capacity. We're recommending uh, demolishing much of, Maine, of Elmwood, particularly starting with the barracks, which are far older than Main Jail North. Main Jail North was uh, started operation in 1986. Some parts of Elmwood started operation back in the 50s. They both are structurally inadequate. Um, we also uh, know that the board has been considering and we think it's a reasonable idea to uh, start an evaluation process for a forensic unit that is a behavioral health unit that would likely be um, stationed at Elmwood and would allow us to demolish more of Elmwood and provide quality state-of-the-art um, hospital type services for those inmates who need them um, at that time. Both uh, new facilities if they're built or at least the one in um, the Civic Center would have state-of-the-art uh, behavioral health and planning opportunities. There's been discussion about <clears throat> remodeling Main Jail North. There are big problems with that, three focus problems. Number one, there's no place to house inmates as the remodeling would be done. Uh, number two, most of the um, cost of the remodeling would be seismic and code um, requirements that needed to be implemented. Number three, that means that there, there's virtually no way of improving the physical structure such that it creates appropriate space for out of time 
uh, out of cell time, program time, medical time, mental health time, recreational time, or other time needed to provide um, the best type of service possible. And number three, the most significant impediment is that all the money required for remodeling of uh, any building would have to come out of the general fund. We're estimating based on the evaluation of Main Jail North that it would be at least 625 to $700 million of cost. And since the cost of construction is considered is moving rapidly in the upward direction and delays are happening often, it's probably significantly more than that. So our approach is to reduce our capacity as much as possible, provide the best service we possibly can for those inmates who cannot be diverted and to divert as many as possible. So with that, I will go to the first PowerPoint. Um, let me take some time to get it on the screen. I'll try to go through this fairly rapidly because uh, much of it has been covered and um, can you see it at this point? Yes. And I want to get um, off to uh, Jim Austin who is much better at explaining this. Thank you. And before you do that, I'm just giving everybody a heads up that we'll be breaking for 30 minutes at 1230. We also have an IT issue going on uh, regarding captioning issues and the broadcast feed. The feed requires a reboot to our broadcast encoder, which will interrupt the YouTube and IQM2 broadcast temporarily. Our IT department feels they'll be able to, to fix this um, within 30 minute recess. So I'm giving all of you one hour notice that we will be breaking from 12.30 to one o'clock. Please continue, Dr. Smith. Okay, so item 10, roughly speaking. Chair. Oops, me. I'm sorry, Supervisor Simidian. I apologize, uh, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, but before the next presentation, as you're trying to get logistics worked out, um, I'd like to respectfully suggest that we allocate a minute rather than 30 seconds to the speakers. I, I, I know okay. that will, make a longer uh, meeting for all of the speakers as well. But I, I just think given the importance and complexity of the topic that uh, 30 seconds is gonna be inadequate, if that's agreeable with you and my colleagues. I strongly yes, support that, thank you. That's totally fine. And anybody who wishes to use all that time may, anybody who wishes to use less may, uh, we're currently at 113 speakers. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you colleagues. Sorry for the interruption. Thank you. So I'll try to go through this presentation pretty quickly. It's in your packet as well as 200 other pages of information. So I'm not going to read every slide, um, but the main focus here is how to improve management of the jails and the population that will still be in jails no matter how vigorously we try to reduce them. Uh, currently um, in the uh, jail population, as I mentioned, it's around 2,400 um, of that group, about 289 or 288 plus or minus a few are post adjudication. They've been sentenced. They're serving part of their sentence, at least in the jail, county jail. About 2,175 are pre-sentenced and uh, it remains to be seen for them where they will um, end up sending their, spending their sentence, if they're sentenced, or if they're released, or if they're released for time served. Um, 100, or 1,970 are charged with uh, felonies. Of that, approximately 1,700 are serious and violent felonies. Again, this is uh, somewhat dated information. It came from December 17th, because, or 14th, because we were preparing for the January presentation, which uh, got delayed. Um, County Council has provided a number of uh, memorandums, including an evaluation of the definition of a jail, legal, 
mechanisms for reducing jail population and issues related to our two consent decrees. The board asked for a budget uh, for the um, sheriff's office. This is it, I won't read it. It's in your packet, uh, but you can see the numbers and the general cost. Um, <clears throat> there are <clears throat> a number of services that are provided in the jail, um, public defender, um, pretrial services, um, housing services for when people get out, social services, um, conservatorship services, ch children and family services, and uh, behavioral health services, reentry services, probation services, custody health services, and I suppose I should have included the DA. Um, and all of those services have been provided for years and we're constantly trying to improve the services, make them more efficient, more effective. But much of the rate limiting step has to do with the physical plant, which precludes us uh, having great access or adequate out of cell time or adequate behavioral health privacy time or adequate medical time or adequate dental time. Um, so we're challenged by that. So in order to reduce the jail population, we know that we can reduce jail bookings, we can improve free trial services. Whoops, sorry. No worries, and while you're restoring- um, Expand but sentencing options. But you'll see much of this relies upon um, issues outside of the control of the Board of Supervisors. We know that the length of stay in our jails is longer than compared to other counties um, because the pre-adjudication time is longer. That will be discussed later. We know that there are other expanded sentencing options that could be um, implemented by legislative changes. Um, and as <clears throat> we've talked about, we definitely need to, and no matter what we do, we'll continue to expand our diversion efforts. So now um, I would like to go to a presentation from um, Jim Austin, who will give us a PowerPoint that he has. Um, he, let me give an introduction first to Jim Austin. We've consulted with him a number of times um, and he is the president of the JFA Institute, has a long and illustrious career in, uh, in uh, I'm screwed up here, just a second. I presume that you cannot see anything that correct. I presented. That's correct. We cannot. Okay, so he's got 25 years of experience in correctional planning and research. He was formerly the director of the Institute of Crime Justice and Corrections at George Washington University. He's published numerous um, publications in his 25 years, has been a recipient of the Peter uh, Lejeune Research Award for Criminology um, and the Society of Criminology Paul Tappan Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Field of Criminology. He's um, got a long history of doing considerable research and restructuring of criminal justice systems across the nation. And he, we've asked him to do an evaluation of our current status. Um, so, Jim, I'll turn it over to you at this point. I hope you have access to your uh, PowerPoint. I do. And, yes, uh, he does. Yes, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so just a little bit more on my background. Currently, um, I'm actually calling from 
Rikers Island in New York, where I'm working, been engaged by New York City to fix their jail situation there. And we are also under contract in Los Angeles County. And I think there's some lessons there about uh, their situation uh, that might be useful to you. Uh, what I basically do for a living is get into a contract with a county or a state that has a problem and we try and fix it for them. Uh, we are we're pretty good at evaluating how to lower jail and prison populations. That's pretty much what I'm known for. Um, and so I'm kind of tasked here to see what your trends are and what we might be able to do uh, to lower the jail population as much as we can. So if we go to the first slide, um, the, the way I approach this, we look at the jail population. This is important for you to understand. Uh, there's two ways to look at it. You should look at it. One is what's called the snapshot, which is the 2,400 people that are in the jail at any given time. And that's important for understanding uh, the number and types of beds that are needed. And we were able to look at your snapshot prior to COVID-19 uh, coming in and post-COVID, because as you all know, post-COVID has had a dramatic impact on jail populations across the country. They all dropped significantly. Um, they're now starting to rebound a little bit. So the question is gonna be how much more they're gonna rebound. So that'll tell you basically who's in the jail at any given time and how they're being housed. But the jail releases file, which is the second data file, is the key one because it tells you what's driving the jail population. Um, it tells you who's being admitted and released. Um, the basic formula that is used here is that releases times the length of stay produces your jail population. So to lower a jail population, you're going to have to either reduce uh, the number of people that are being admitted and released, the bookings coming in, or, and or reduce the length of stay. And we can get more specific about, you know, what types of people are spending the longest period of time in the jail, why they're spending such a long time, and to start targeting them to see if we can reduce that length of stay. So we looked at these releases both prior to, uh, I mean, post COVID-19, because we wanted to see what's going on currently. All right, so next slide. Um, so there's approximately, I understand, about 2 million people in the county uh, and with a population of about 2,400. Uh, that is a large number, 2,400, but that represents one-tenth of 1% 1 of your population is in the jail on any given day. So it's a very small percentage of the population is in the jail at any given time. If we look at bookings, and releases out of the jail. And these are people um, because you're gonna see you have many more bookings and releases, like 24,000, I think it is. But a lot of those bookings and releases are the same person going in and out more than once in a year. So if you look at the number of people being booked into the jail, that's about 17,000. And that's nine tenths of 1%. So again, it's a very small percent of your population each year is going to be brought into this jail system. The other thing we want to look at is the what's called the incarceration rate per 100,000 population. Uh, Santa Clara's rate is one of the lowest in California. Um, the California rate is 201 people per 100,000. Your rate is 127 per 100,000. Uh, the U.S. rate is 199. So Small number of people percentage wise are coming to the jail. Uh, your usage of jails measured by an incarceration rate is quite low. So what that starts suggesting is that those that are coming in are coming in largely for serious charges and are spending uh, a significant period of time before they get released. Uh, next slide. So these are your uh, crime and adult arrest trends um, 2011 to 2020. The 2021 data is not quite available yet, um, but I'll try and give you some sense of what that's looking like. The, the top blue line is the total number of 
what we call serious crimes being committed in your county. And it's a relatively flat uh, trend with a slight uptick um, beginning in 2018, 19, then it dropped in 2020. The drop in 2020 is COVID-19. That's what caused that drop. Because uh, in this group, it's mostly property crimes, theft, burglary, thefts in particular dropped significantly uh, after COVID-19 uh, struck. The green line are the violent crimes. And that's a different picture. You can see that violent crimes have been increasing uh, since about 2014 rather steadily. Uh, in 2020, it kind of was flat. The preliminary 2021 data for California and the nation is an uptick in homicides and aggravated assaults. Um, there's a lot of discussion why that's happening, um, but you need to be aware that that's probably uh, uh, going to increase the violent number for 2021 once it gets reported. The jail population, um, which is that blue dotted line right between the green and the red line, uh, that shows a steady decrease. As Jeffrey mentioned, the county has been doing a lot uh, to try and reduce its jail population. You had over 4,000 people in the jail in 2014-13, and that dropped to 2,000 in 2020 due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, it's bounced back up now to about 2,400. It's not shown in this chart, but this is looking at the, the, the trend there through, through 2020. Uh, the big drop again in the uh, jail population in 2020 was the misdemeanor arrest dropping. Police, well, there's less misdemeanor level crime being committed, uh, certainly the property crime. And there is also an effort by police agencies pretty much across the country to stop physically arresting people for these low level crimes, um, in part because of the COVID-19 concerns, uh, but also they were trying to keep the jail population down as low as, can, as they could. Uh, there was no drop in the felony arrest. That has uh, that did drop in 2015, but it's been flat. So there's no real change there. Next slide. So this is looking at more dramatically COVID-19's impact. Um, the blue line is the population last day of the month. Again, you see that big drop that happened in March and April, and it's a direct relationship of the bookings just plummeting. You guys see those bookings are now starting to rebound a little bit, but they did again drop in September, October, November. Part of that is seasonality. Typically, we'll see jail populations fluctuate uh, within the year, and it's not unexpected to see a drop in the winter months. But it's now looking like the jail population is stabilizing at about the 2,400, maybe 2,500 level. Okay, so next slide starts getting into the more details of this. So this is a detailed chart that is looking at the current population on February 1st, 2020, when you had 3,300 people approximately. And then a year later, February 1st, 2021, that's after COVID. So here you see the drop clearly uh, from 3,300 to 2,300. Note that the average length of stay to date, so this is, you look at that snapshot, how long had the people on average been in the jail? It jumped from 163 days to about two, almost 300 days. Um, female population dropped dramatically. Uh, male population also dropped, but the women really dropped from 400 to under 200. If you look at the number of charges um, that people have, you can see most of them have multiple charges against them. Um, there's a group with five or more. Uh, that group, uh, although it dropped, their length of stay has increased dramatically from 190 days to 315. You'll also see, though, that the percent of the people that are in the sentence status dropped dramatically from 747 to 364. So the population became increasingly pretrial, but most importantly, they 
were staying longer uh, than the pre-COVID group. Next slide. These are the charges, both pre and post COVID-19, February 1st, 20th, February 1st, 2021. Prior to COVID, 83% um, of that jail population had been charged or convicted of a felony crime. Oh. About almost half of them were for violent crimes. Uh, those would be murder, sexual assault, rape, uh, aggravated assault, battery, robbery, and other violent crimes. After COVID, uh, the population re it remained numerically the same, but it's now 63% of your current jail population has been charged and or convicted for a violent crime. And you can see how much that length of stay has increased from 238 days to 381 days. Uh, felony drug dropped dramatically. So again, fewer people coming in for the drug crimes and the felony nonviolent and the misdemeanor groups, they all dropped dramatically. So you see a big shift of who's in the jail. It's gone, it already had a high proportion of violent felonies, but now it's almost two thirds of felony uh, for violent uh, charges. And these are multiple charges, by the way. These are not just a single charge, but multiple charges. Next slide. Looking at some of the uh, security and mental health issues, and I'm familiar with this because one of the jobs I did before was to install a new classification system. Classification basically shows the security risk of the prisoner. Um, and it's basically what it's doing is rewarding people for good behavior uh, and putting people who don't behave properly into the higher custody levels. So here you can see a very large drop in the number of people after COVID who were in the minimum or low custody level from 1200 to 608. Medium dropped, the high custody people increased. So this population has hardened in terms of its classification levels. It's much more of a medium and high custody group than it was before. In terms of mental health, which is your behavior health uh, patients, uh, you can see we had drops there too, principally in the routine utilizer. So these are people that have a mental health issue. Uh, they would not be called acute or subacute. They've been stabilized. They're probably on some form of medication, but they can function in the general population. There is a sizable group there uh, that are in the intense utilizer and moderate utilizer. Any Future development of a jail system would have to ensure that those people are going to be properly housed and have access to treatment programs to deal with their severe mental illness. Again, these people are spending a longer period of time in the jail than before. Next slide. All right, so this is looking at releases now. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, 25,000 releases being produced by 17,000 people. There is a very interesting group, about 5,800 people who were booked and released five or more times in a calendar year. So this is a group that is probably good candidates for deflection into mental health community beds. Probably a lot of what's going on there is alcoholism, drug abuse, homelessness. Uh, they don't spend a lot of time in the jail but they are going in and out, in and out, and uh, whatever we're doing with them is not working very well. They are identifiable, we know who they are. Uh, we can link them to your mental health service system and see what's their relationship there, but it's a key group to kind of keep your eye on. Um, it's also important to know that again, the most of the people that are going in and out of this jail spend a very short period of time. Specifically, 13,500 of the 25,000 are gone within a, uh, 24 hours. Oh. There's this very small group that's spending more than 90 days, about 2,000. And I just kind of reiterate, that's the group that's really going to drive the size of your jail population. Uh, next slide. 
So this really starts telling you what's driving the, the population. Um, here we're looking at releases by what we call the method of release. So how did they get out of the jail? Uh, the group that is occupying the most beds at any given time are people who are going to be sentenced to state prison. So during this time period, there are 480 people who were released to the CDCR. You can see their length of stay is extremely high, 505 days, but they on any given day are occupying over 600 beds. If you look at the snapshot, they are pretrial but they will be convicted and be given prison sentences and then they will be sent to state prison. The next largest group are people who are convicted and get credit uh, for a sentence, time served, followed by people who are released to a rehabilitation program, followed by people who get transferred to another county or agency who has a warrant on them for other criminal charges, followed by people who did a, a sense of time served. So that's the disposition when they finally reach it. Uh, and then finally, we have people that are being released on supervised own recognizance, bail bondsmen. Now those, those two have very large numbers of releases, but their length of stay is very short. They are representing close to half of your releases, but they only occupy a couple hundred beds at any given time. So if you want to start impacting the jail population, the policy takeaway here is you kind of think of it in terms of two buckets. There's this large bucket of people that are coming in and out of the jail. You could have an impact on the jail population by not allowing them to come in at all or somehow even in a more efficient way, get them released. That would be your supervised own recognizance group and your bail bondsmen. But the other groups are people that don't get out because largely of their charges, which are felony, they're being convicted of their crimes, and it's taking a certain amount of time for that conviction and sentence to occur. So this is basically the decision-making process of the courts. Uh, probably the biggest issue in any jurisdiction I work in is this thing called continuances where a person appears in court and one party is ready or not ready for a variety of reasons to proceed with the hearings. And so the judge will issue a continuance, two weeks, a month, two months. So you have people in the jail that are spending, in my opinion, excessive periods of time for what would only be called bureaucratic kinds of reasons. If we could get some efficiency in the courts, I can guarantee you we could lower this jail population rather significantly. So that's a challenge though, uh, um, but there's ways to do that. And, and hopefully over the next year, we'll be able to try and implement some of those, those ways of doing that. Uh, next slide. Okay, so major points I just wanted to make, you have a very low incarceration rate as compared to other California and US jurisdictions. You've dropped your jail population from a high of 4,100 down to 2,057 by the end of 2020. That was driven by COVID. It was not driven by any policy that was implemented by the county as a COVID driven drop, which was affecting the amount of crime and arrests and bookings. Since then, it's rebounded, it's back up to 2,400, and we have to be careful that this doesn't rebound any further. Um, as the population has declined, it has become increasingly composed of people who will be found guilty of violent crimes. Uh, the county, as I just kind of alluded to, we're looking at implementing what we would call case processing reforms. So this is we're working with the courts, public defender, district attorney, to see if we can find ways to reduce this problem of excessive continuances, uh, delays in court processing. And this is for people, I just wanna add, for people that are in the jail, uh, those are the ones we're concerned about. If we can get the people out of the jail, I'm not so concerned about the continuance because they're out of the jail and, and their freedom is, is, has been restored. But if they're in the jail, 
we should be mindful of these continuances that are delaying, uh, you know, the final disposition by the courts. So that's my presentation. I'd be glad to entertain any questions people might have. Thank you, Dr. Austin. I appreciate that. I'll look to our board members for any questions of you or Dr. Smith. This is item 10, which is to just receive a report. Um, when supervisors have finished uh, their questions of either Dr. Smith or Dr. Austin, we'll then start the public speaking, and then at 1230, we will break. So I don't see any hands raised. Supervisor, could I suggest that we, uh, can, since we're, the board's considering uh, 10, 11, and 13 all together. Maybe we do a quick presentation about 11 and then go to the community. Sure, that's that. That's just fine. Then when we come back and hear from the community, then we'll go to um, item 11 for board discussion. Supervisor Chavez, you had a question? No, I just wanted to recommend the same that we hear all the presentations at once and then be able to um, yeah. listen to the public and then ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see this presentation now? Yes, we can. Okay, so item 11 was a direction from the board to come back with a framework for justice involved clients and what we would see from the past, what we've done and what we need to do for the future. And of course, this was built more consistently upon uh, Dr. Austin's approach and building on what we've been doing already. Um, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, what we're recommending is that we look at this decision from really three perspectives. Uh, one is uh, maximizing um, our continuum of care for services for those individuals who can be diverted from the jail system. Like I mentioned, it's about two to 300 on the jack list. But as um, Dr. Austin mentions, there's large numbers of individuals who are booked and then released fairly quickly. So um, a big focus of reducing the population is to um, try to avoid booking those individuals to begin with and get them out faster. Um, and that also requires uh, appropriate referral structures. But as he points out, the population that really drives the total bed capacity is the serious and violent felonies and the individuals who are going to be there much longer than that churning crowd. Um, we also rec are recommending a care plan for community services so that pre-adjudicated individuals can be diverted as fast as much as possible. Um, number three, we recognize that no matter what we do, um, there is still a large population of serious and violent felons, and we still have an obligation, both moral and uh, legal obligation, to treat those individuals fairly, whether or not they've uh, committed a serious violent felony or whether they're waiting for adjudication or whether they're post adjudication. And so we're recommending redesign efforts to get out of a 40 year old building and to reduce again, to reduce our total rated capacity from about 4000 down into the 2000 range, which requires initially a facility in Civic Center to decant, as they say, individuals from the current main jail north while we demolish it and um, readjusting of the um, population at Elmwood in order to uh, decommission large sections of element Elmwood. We think it's important to bring up some critical considerations. Um, whoops. Sorry. No Only the courts can deal with uh, the penal code and the decisions to incarcerate individuals. The board does not have the independent authority to um, incarcerate or de-incarcerate individuals. 
we have the responsibility to take care of individuals who are incarcerated or ordered incarcerated. Um, once an individual is uh, confined to incarceration, they have to be incarcerated in a facility that meets ESCC um, status requirements and also federal, other federal and state requirements. Um, individuals, therefore, cannot be in independently incarcerated in a psychiatric hospital in large numbers. It is true that from time to time, individuals are transferred from the jail to medical hospitals and observed by custody and incarcerated chained to their beds. That's not done with psychiatric hospitals because of the risk uh, associated with it, you know, having a um, deputy in a psychiatric hospital with unsafe situation to begin with is not a good solution. It's certainly not a solution for 2000 individuals. What we're recommending as a redesign is uh, 500 bed uh, high security, probably maximum security is the wrong word, but we know that about 500 of the current inmates are serious and violent felons at great risk to do damage either to themselves or to others. We also are recommending medium security reprogramming and low security diversion, detention and elimination of the meet a low security camp at Elmwood, which would decrease our um, bed capacity significantly, which is a good thing. So decreasing both at Elmwood and um, in Civic Center. Um, I think we already went through um, the facility population issues uh, from uh, Dr. Austin, the only thing that I would point out is on this page, which shows our total jail population and our free trial diversion population. You can see that over to the far right, as um, COVID happened and our incarcerated population went down significantly, our free trial uh, supervision population went up. Uh, but these are now individuals who are in the community being supervised, typically by electronic monitoring, but also by um, personal monitoring. And um, obviously that's one way to address concerns that the public has about safety, but it's also a way to maximize the time out of jail. Um, I won't go into this because uh, Dr. Austin went through that completely. We know that um, there is inappropriate or I should say inadequate housing space outside of the jail system um, and we are committed to improve that. Um, but we also know that the jails themselves have inadequate space for mental illness treatment, uh, out of cell time, medical treatment, dental treatment, and recreational treatment. Um, Elmwood has been evaluated numerous times There's recommendations to demolish 12 buildings out there um, and 22 not marked for demolition but require significant upgrades, but the upgrades are much um, easier to accomplish than Main Jail North because for the most part those buildings are not, um, well those buildings are not uh, designed for high acuity inmates and for the most part the ones that we're talking about are the low and medium acuity. Um, we recommend further needs assessment for um, demolishing Main Jail North and Elmwood that's just uh, basically getting an RFP to do it. In terms of treatment uh, options for the um, mentally ill individuals. Um, we have concerns are, are across the continuum of care. Obviously, we have concerns in the jails. We have concerns for individuals who are released from the jails. We have concerns for people who are in the community um, with severely severe mental illness. And we have concerns with 
those who uh, don't have severe severe mental illness but still have mental um, problems that inhibit their behavior in the community. So we'll move ahead with these community engagements. We've been doing a lot, as Dr. Austin already points out, we minimize our incarceration rate, but we can always do better. Um, these are comments about um, the population that came from the community. Um, in general, I would say um, strong, strong, strong um, concern about having mentally ill individuals in the jail and not having adequate options um, and concern about structural racism and concern about uh, the possibility that if you build a jail, you fill it up. Um, regional mental health facilities <clears throat> were suggested. These would be <clears throat> forensic units, so-called, um, essentially a hospital within a jail appropriate for usage by uh, surrounding counties because the number of individuals who would be within our county appropriate for this type of service will fluctuate significantly. Uh, this is something the board should consider. Um, the board's talked a number of times about a mental health facility at Elmwood. This would be the type of facility that the board can consider. Um, but obviously we need to do more uh, planning for that kind of model. Um, we would have to have a design team come in tell us what it looks like and give us some idea of how to build it, what the right size would be. But, you know, obviously a good effort to try. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this um, <clears throat> probably is not necessary except to say that the um, structure of a behavioral health of a jail's facility requires behavioral health uh, capacity and a forensic unit, which we're talking about possibly at Elmwood, would require uh, full medical services. Um, this I've already talked about and our recommendations I've already talked about. So um, that is what we've got for you today. We're here to answer questions if you have any Questions, again, recommending from staff that we move ahead with design planning for a 500-bed facility in the uh, Civic Center, planning to demolish Main Jail North, planning to demolish large sections of Elmwood, um, and uh, to consider the possibility of uh, behavioral health facility at Elmwood, if the board wants us to begin the process of evaluating that. Thank and you, Dr. obviously that all goes with the commitment to have ongoing diversion services and to work closely with the courts to minimize pre-adjudication time, work with uh, the DA and the public defender to minimize um, those times. Now I'll shut up. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, uh, Dr. Austin. Appreciate all that. Do we have any questions of either of these doctors? PhDs, MDs, JDs, Super uh, Vice President Ellenberg. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to wait because there was a good amount of um, additional information, things that had not been um, uh, delineated or or for which there were no foundations laid and i just need a little bit more time to review all of the the new and sometimes conflicting information that was presented so i would like to hold my opportunity to do questions until after the 12 30 break please thank you very much and i'll turn to supervisor lee yes thank you uh, president Wasserman. is this a good time i could ask that some of the questions on the presentation would that be okay Yes, it is. Okay, okay, fine. Uh, I think uh, for the presentation, Mr. Austin, um, one glaring uh, um, of, of note of interest regarding the the uh, population that's really large 
is this group called the In and Out? And I don't mean the burger joint. <laughs> I'm talking about the people you named that has come in and out uh, so frequently. And the number there is just staggering large, right? Over 5,000. You mentioned in your comment that one of the ways to minimize that population is to, quote, not allow them to come to jail. So would you elaborate on what are those strategies you're talking about that we might be able to consider in the moving forward? Yeah, that, thank you for the question. The, uh, the number one strategy that's been implemented around the country is, is building these so-called deflection centers. So, uh, you know, people, uh, let, let's assume you know, a crime has been committed, but it's usually it's a minor crime. It's going to be a theft. It's going to be a public drunkenness. It's going to be something that's related to substance abuse and mental illness. And that's why these people, they go in and out, in and out. So they're not doing something so harmful, but it's just like, you know, it's, it's getting the attention, not only of the police, but also of uh, the community. Uh, so frequently you'll see these are, these are calls for service being made by business owners, you know, who are, are having the same problem. So if you can develop what's called this deflection center or, or compose it, composite and rather than bringing the person to the jail you'd bring them to the deflection center and you would try and get them stabilized uh, but ultimately ultimately they would have to go to some kind of long-term care kind of program that you would have in the in the community i'll just say these these are difficult cases to deal with uh, their behavior is 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 well established uh, and uh, they're, they're difficult, but do they need to be coming to the jail? No. Mm -hmm. Right. No, I, I agree completely. <clears throat> now, um, on looking at the data, um, it shows that even though our jail population has decreased, right, one uh, sad realization is that the stays are longer and some are actually almost double and much longer, right? right. Uh, and that seems to be not just happening right here in Santa Clara County. It looks like it's happening nationally. Now, um, a lot of those are driven, seems to be by folks with high bail, say set for more than $5,000 or those who are held on more serious charges. Um, for example, in one study, although they made up less than one in four admissions in 2019, the people with the high bail amounts occupy more than two in three jail beds. Mm -hmm. And that's the research also showed that in 2019, those admitted to county facilities for the violent felony charge spent on average more than 100 days in jail compared with, say, 40 days or less for a nonviolent felony or even fewer than nine days for misdemeanor. Um, do these two reasons also account for the longest stays? Yes. The uh, well, and the bail schedule is set by the court, right? So again, um, there's absolutely good reason to look at those bail schedules and get them uh, corrected, uh, so that more people could afford uh, bail. But part of the uh, longer length to say that you're seeing is because of the drop in the misdemeanor population. So mm -hmm. that population is not coming in nearly as much as it used to. And so what's left are the people that are, are coming in for the felony charges, and in particular, the violent charges. And those are the kinds of crimes that have higher bail schedules and are more difficult to resolve. Again, remember, these are not single charges. Most of these people with violent charges have multiple charges, mm -hmm. uh, probably an average of two, three, or four on average they have. Mm -hmm. So again, these are charging decisions being made by the district attorney, and uh, it, it's it's. Uh, I kind of point out, you know, the, the sheriff really doesn't have much control over this. You know, they basically are bringing in people, uh, they're getting people from law enforcement, and then it's up to the courts to release. You don't get out of that jail unless a court order is being made. So it's it's the courts that are really uh, controlling this length of stay, and that's probably the group that really needs to be worked with to to get that length of stay down. Right. Um, the report also mentions that the jail population suffers uh, from the um, like chronic schizophrenia, psychosis, mood disorders, um, and and of course they need to be treated uh, with you know medication and therapy while while in custody. Um, I just want to get your thought of of what you hear is happening in other places uh, yeah. outside of county, and maybe also our um, our custody health to to chime in to. What have right. we been doing currently on these issues? So let me, it's a good opportunity for me to give you two examples. One is Los Angeles mm -hmm. County and then New York City. 
Mm -hmm. um, Los Angeles County is under a, a, a consent decree over its mental health situation, as is New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons, not probably the reason why they are on a consent decree and that they cannot get out of their consent decrees is that the facilities they have do not provide for what the consent decree is requiring in terms of out-of-cell treatment. Mm -hmm. Typically, if you're acute or subacute, you need to be out of your cell at least 10 hours a week for structured recreation and another 10 hours for treatment. Uh, those two systems, because they've got older facilities that were never designed to do that, mm -hmm. uh, they can't meet the consent decree. So mm -hmm. uh, in LA, it's the Men's Central Jail. Um, in, in Rikers, it's virtually all their facilities. Now, and because they haven't replaced, and again, I, I think we need to think about you know, replacing, like reducing the footprint, uh, replacing with facilities that meet these constitutional standards because New York did not do that. They, they've lowered their jail population more than anyone in the country. They've gone from 22,000 down to 5,400. But they now are proposing, and hold on to your seat, an $8.2 billion construction program to replace all of their facilities on Rikers Island. And they have to do it because their facilities cannot meet today's constitutional standards. Same thing with Los Angeles, Men's Central and their other facilities were never designed or built to handle the mental health population. And so uh, in that place, we're recommending a smaller jail population, but they're gonna to have to build, you know, a 500 to 600 bed mental health facility if they ever hope to get out of the consent decree. And if you don't get out of the consent decree, a federal judge is gonna order you to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's important that we kind of understand, unless you're going to abolish the jails completely, you know, you have to recognize you're gonna have some population and they will need treatment and care that meets the constitutional standards. Hey, thank you. Um, I, I certainly there might be more questions, but I'll go ahead and uh, let uh, my other colleague to ask the question. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Allenberg. We'll be breaking in nine minutes for IT. You're muted, Vice President Allenberg. Why don't we break nine minutes early rather than um, have comments interrupted? Okay, then we're still going to go till one o'clock. So you don't wish to use the last eight minutes now? I would rather start uh, afterwards so that I'm not uh, perhaps okay. paused mid questions. Okay, does anybody else wish to fill the last eight minutes? Seeing none, we are going to adjourn now and resume at one o'clock. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. Stopped.
And I've just been informed our reboot was completed and the captioning is working. Nice job, Tiffany and IT department. Recording in progress. Hello there, Peggy. Good afternoon, President Wasserman. Good afternoon. Would you please take roll call? Supervisor Lee. Lee present. Supervisor Chavez here. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I guess we're 30 seconds. You're, you are a little bit early. I was gonna slow walk it until one o'clock hit. No, nope, nope, <laughs> no worry, give, give me 10 seconds, sorry. Peggy, you, you need to be in charge of Mike today. <laughs> and I have one o'clock now. There Supervisor Lee. Present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I will come back. President Wasserman. Yes. And one more call for Vice President Ellenberg. You do have a quorum. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let's um, start with our speakers, and they'll be given one minute each, as was stated before. And then we will come back and address um, agenda item number 11. Our next speaker is Amber Mopress. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. You will have one minute to speak. Hello, my name is Amber Mopress and I represent the African American Community Service Agency. I oppose building a new jail and I am in favor of creating opportunity and rehabilitation services to help solve the mental health and substance abuse crisis in our county. Creating such services will help our county so much more than if we build a new jail. I do not support any any system that disproportionately locks up our black and brown community, our, our black and brown communities, yet many communities have spoken out against building the new jail, and I stand with them. We need alternatives to incarceration. We have developed trusting relationships with our community here at the AACSA and understand the direct services needed that focus on mental health and substance abuse to help them get better. Fix what is broken within the walls that we currently have. We don't need a new building to do that. Implement these efforts in the current jails and allocate funds to providing the services that will sustain our community upon release. Supervisor Wasserman, excuse me. Yes. Um, let me take this off first of all. I, I rejoined the meeting at one o'clock and it looked like it had already started and wanted an opportunity to introduce my referral unless you're planning to have two separate public comment sections. No, we're having one public section comment okay. section. So go right and, ahead on item 13. Thank you very much. I also just adjust myself here. Okay. Thank you. I certainly oh. want the public comment to be able to address 13 as well, if they like. Um, the referral that I'm, that I'm bringing forward for my colleagues' consideration asks that we think about the role that the county plays in the broader criminal legal system and use the levers over which we have control to provide options that increase public safety and do it justly and with financial rigor. The county is responsible for hosting a jail and for the conditions in which a person is held in custody. Law enforcement, the district attorney, uh, and the courts all play roles in determining who is put into jail within that linear criminal legal process. But, but really at some level, incarceration of any resident may represent some gap in the county's social safety net. County government, that's us, we have the power to provide and expand county resources and programs and other efforts to ensure that people's basic needs are met and that they aren't locked up 
due to a lack of sufficient mental health or substance use disorder treatment, supportive housing, health care, appropriate crisis inter intervention, and so much more. We have the opportunity today to say that we will redouble our efforts in those arenas, the ones over which we do have oversight and direction, and see how much safer we can make our community before, if at all, uh, building, another, building another jail. I have some um, questions and comments about administration's reports, but I'd really like to hear public comment uh, first and then come back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peggy, let's resume with our second speaker. One moment. Our next speaker is R. Conda. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello, President Wasserman and members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm Richard Conda, Executive Director of Asian Law Alliance and a proud member of the Real Coalition. Please do not move forward with the building of another jail. Asian Law Alliance strongly supports Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal to start a community dialogue about and study of community-based alternatives to incarceration and to expand funding for behavioral health treatment outside of jails. Our practice of treating health conditions such as mental health, substance abuse, or social conditions such as homelessness and poverty with criminalization and incarceration does not promote public health and does not ensure public safety. Thank you for your concern for our community. Thank you again. Thank you, Richard. Our next speaker is Renee Rashid. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Renee Rashid, and I'm speaking today as president of Los Altos for Racial Equity, or LAIR, and as a voter in Los Altos. LAIR supports the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in item 13 and is against any new jail construction. In light of statistics that show over 40% of our detainees suffer from mental health issues, um, that over 85% of the detainees are in pretrial phases and therefore innocent by law, and that the percentages of Black and Latinx people in your jails far outweigh the percentage of the population, we cannot support the construction of a new jail. If we build a new jail, we will definitely fill it, and we do not need to incarcerate more of our BIPOC population. We support alternatives that work on the root of the problems that cause crime and address mental health issues. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Pedigo. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Father John Pedigo, Catholic Charity, Santa Clara County, and member of REAL. I cannot morally support the funding of a new jail. In my 30 years as working as a priest in the community, I have seen how incarceration has not been an experience of personal and social transformation for rehabilitation, but rather a dehumanizing experience that not only affects the person and their family, but the entire community. I support Supervisor Ellenberg's call for dialogue. Rather than direct funds to, for, for new construction, we should direct funds to prevent incarceration on one end and on the other end, fortify re-entry services. In addition to supporting social services and counseling, recovery support, literacy for all ages, job training and placement, and support of affordable housing, we need resources and community development. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nick D. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Nick and I'm with the Party for Socialism and Liberation and I just wanted to say no to any new jails as even the presenters on 1011 have led us to believe that um, any solution to um, reducing the prison population, getting racial equity and having better mental health treatment is not within, is, is within a non-carceral solution. So I think that should be pursued instead as is with item 13, um, not only not only that, the community doesn't want it. Um, I've seen even the Fraternal Order of Police didn't want it. And it's not in line with the resolutions made by uh, certain supervisors and the board members. And it is not even in line with the Buddhist invocation that we had at the beginning of this meeting. So um, so for all intents and purposes, I would say no on any new jail. Thank you very much for your time. Apollo. There you go. Apologies. Mm -hmm. Kiana, your mic is open. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kiana Simmons, and I'm a community member in policy at the Bill Wilson Center. I'm urging the County Board of Supervisors to not move forward with the building of another jail, but to invest in community care alternatives. We agree with the referral submitted by Susan Ellenberg, stating that the board should direct county administration to generate 
actionable recommendations for implementing a strategy for a county that does not involve building any jail. Just this month, the Board of Supervisors declared mental health and substance abuse a public health crisis. Across the county, prisons and jails incarcerate a disproportionate amount of people who have current or past mental health conditions, and facilities are not being are not meeting the demand for treatment. Nationally, 64% of jail inmates have mental health conditions, and locally, the jail is the largest mental health provider in the county. Why do we allow punishment before care? For decades, the Bill Wilson Center has been running as an intermediate between the carceral system, low-income families, and youth with mental health conditions. Our programs are modeled after a care-first approach, and we know that jailing people does not deter or reduce crime. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kira Kazantis. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, I'm Kira Kazantis, CEO of Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits and co-convener of the nonprofit Real Coalition. 47 nonprofit organizations, many of which are county contract partners, stand in alliance with the Care First Jail Last Coalition in opposing the building of another jail. We also support County Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal to initiate a community dialogue about and study of community-based alternatives to incarceration and to expand funding for behavioral health treatment outside of jail. We should really invest in the gaps in our safety net, including prevention, behavioral health services, and stop investing in the failure of this system that traumatizes people and families, does not prevent crime, and has a poor track record that is now being investigated by the state. We need to invest in jail population, depopulation solutions that address the root issues that fuel incarceration, housing, treatment, and non-carceral behavioral health supports. And we should also invest resources specifically into black and brown community-led models of safety, restoration, and healing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tim McKenzie. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Dr. Tim McKenzie. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Stanford. I'm a co-chair of the Mountain View Local Group of Silicon Valley Democratic Socialists of America, and generally, and engaged resident of the of the county and Mountain View. Um, I am wholly against building a new jail. Um, I don't think that it's possible for us to uh, move forward as a society if we treat mental health and addiction, which is another health public health issue, as criminal justice issues. Um, strong support for the recommendation from Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, and just as a comment uh, related to something that was mentioned earlier of, of we would need to consider the idea of abolishing jails. Um, I would highly recommend if you haven't already done so to read Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. It's almost two decades old. Um, there's a lot to consider in there. Uh, no new jails, please. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mary Ellen Doherty. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin. Mary Helen Doherty, a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart Impact. My brother struggled for many years due to his mental illness, confounded by alcohol and other drug dependency. Bill spent time in and out of jail in our small Midwestern city and was never provided any alternatives to incarceration that may have prevented his eventual death by suicide. There are many, many folks in our community, way too many who are people of color that need and deserve behavioral health services and end up in jail like my brother. The SB debug decarceration court extensively documents this truth. Please exercise your leadership on behalf of our residents in need of life-saving interventions, not a new jail, and support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral and the recommendations in the SB debug report. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Rita Giles. Please accept the unmute to begin. Rita, can you accept the unmute? One more time I'll ask and I will come back. Our next speaker is Joanna. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Joanna Shing. Uh, I'm a Santa Clara County resident and staff attorney with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley's Health Program, which serves historically excluded people with mental illnesses and disabilities. As we stated in our letter, we're extremely concerned about the county executive's faulty plans to build a new jail in spite of the county's own community engagement process, which indicated tremendous support for new and non-carceral solutions to safety. Mental illness and substance use are public health matters, not criminal. It's clear that jail is not a source for rehabilitation, but instead exacerbates racial inequities, housing instability, employment loss, and trauma. 
The county should instead further invest in community-based resources, such as the mobile crisis response team, permanent supportive housing, and voluntary outpatient services. Black and brown communities in our county deserve to feel safe and to thrive. We strongly urge the board to support community-based alternatives to incarceration instead. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Reese Inghart. Please accept the unmute to begin. Reese, can you accept the unmute? I will come back. Our next speaker is Andrew Siegler. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Um, I'm sorry, Andrew is actually using an older version of Zoom. Gotcha. Um, I may be able to make this work. Hmm. Um, we'll see if this works. Andrew, can you accept the unmute? Hi, sorry about that. Nice job. Um, <clears throat> Good, good afternoon to the Board of Supervisors. My name is Andrew Siegler and I'm a voter living in District 3 of Santa Clara County. I also have a mental health disability and receive treatment in this county. I urge the county supervisors to all vote no on items 10 and 11 and to support, support supervisors, Supervisor Ellenberg's item 13. A new jail is not the answer to what amounts to a mental health crisis. We need more funding for programs that do not include police or incarceration. Preventive progress such as job training, supportive and affordable housing, counseling and therapy, behavioral health, detox programs, and the mobile crisis response teams. Again, I urge you to vote no on items 10 and 11 and support item 13, please. Thank you. For your Thank you. Okay, one moment. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Agramont Giustiano. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I'm with Rex Race Equity and Community Safety at Sacred Heart Community Service District 2. We need more preventive care and solutions for members in our community. Jail does not solve the problem. People should not be criminalized for being poor or having an untreated mental illness or being homeless or struggling with addiction. And ultimately, the system's failure, which is perpetuating a racially unjust and unequal society. During the pandemic, the county found ways to divert people from going to jail due to COVID safety. Efforts and funding should be made to continue this approach. No new jail. Instead, invest the money into mental health services, drug and alcohol recovery, harm reduction, education, affordable housing, permanent supportive housing, domestic violence shelters, advocacy and support, and trauma-informed care. By doing this, you'll be creating opportunities and pathways for members in our community to truly thrive and be a safe environment for everyone. Let's create communities that care. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cosette. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Cosette Fitzgerald and I live in District 4. I have a mother who has worked as a Santa Clara dispatcher for over 30 years and she has witnessed the abuses and harm embedded in Santa Clara's criminal justice system firsthand, from people's phone calls to the beliefs of officers she has worked with. It's a guarantee this new jail will be filled to capacity, but a new high security jail will not address the systems that fuel incarceration. Regardless if this is a small population, these are still people with families whose needs won't be met by incarceration. Jails are inherently toxic environments that cause trauma, loss of autonomy, and disconnect from families. Also, 88% of those in our jails aren't yet convicted of a crime. Supervisor Ellen Burke's referral provides a pathway to really help our most vulnerable residents by constructing and expanding mental health and substance use facilities and programs. For Santa Clara County, the jail is our largest mental health and drug addiction provider. Let's provide care before punishment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Veronica, Veronica Amador. Please accept the unmute to begin. Veronica, can you accept the unmute? Uh, I'm gonna go back and try Rita Giles again. Rita, can you please accept the unmute? Yes. And your mic is open. Great. I'm Rita Giles. I'm a member of Bend the Arc, an attorney and a resident of District 5. 
I urge you to reject the recommendation to build a new 500 bed maximum security jail. Remember that over 80% of the people in our jails are pretrial. They have not been found guilty of a crime. Labeling them violent felons does not make them so. It speaks to the way the DA has charged them. Much of the problem with our jails relates not to physical buildings, but the treatment of those who are incarcerated. We need to change the problematic culture that pervades our jails, as well as renovate existing facilities. Many of these people in jail have mental health needs. Continuing to warehouse them is a failed response to people coping with mental illness and substance abuse. They deserve support and treatment, not incarceration. Please vote no on building a new jail and support. Our next speaker is Reese Inghart. Reese, can you accept the unmute this time? Yes. yes. Uh, hi, my name is Reese Enghardt. I am a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart, and I live and work in Santa Clara County. Being queer myself, I am speaking in solidarity with my LGBTQ plus siblings, specifically black and brown, who are disproportionately harmed by the carceral system. Jails are toxic environments, loss of control over your body, disconnection from community and family, enforced solitude or loss of privacy. All of these cause trauma. A new jail will further the trauma. It will not change things. But system impacted people know what to do in the county sponsored community input process. They suggested replacing a jail with a rehabilitative community center staffed with medically qualified healing centered experts. So I urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13 that includes input from system impacted people every step of the way. Please decarcerate, renovate and innovate. Do not build another monument to racism, punishment and trauma. Thank you. Going back to Am Veronica Amador, can you accept the unmute? Veronica, can you accept the unmute? I will come back. Our next speaker is Ralph King. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello, I'm Ralph King from Surge Sacred Heart. Yes, on alternatives to incarceration. I represent Silicon Valley Climate Action Now, a group that addresses the root causes of the climate crisis with direct actions in Santa Clara County. 27 members of our group oppose new jail construction. Our organization's impact depends on solidarity, yet systemic racism divides us. We believe a new jail will only increase the racism that ravages our country. <clears throat> Without racial justice, Climate justice will never be possible. As Hop Hopkins of the Sierra Club recently wrote, quote, we will never survive the climate crisis without ending white supremacy. Here's why. You can't have climate change without sacrifice, sacrifice zones, and you can't have sacrifice zones without disposable people, and you can't have disposable people without racism, unquote. Again, please vote no on the new jail and support alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Molly Brennan. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon. My name is Molly Brennan and I am a homeowner in District 1 and an attorney with the health program at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. The Law Foundation of Silicon Valley is a legal services nonprofit serving historically excluded individuals in Santa Clara County living with mental illness and other disabilities. I am here to urge you to vote against a new jail. Rather than providing services, rehabilitation, and public protection, incarceration exacerbates racial disparities by causing loss of jobs and housing, disconnection from families and communities, trauma, and adverse health impacts. Investments in correctional mental health services perpetuate false beliefs of substance use and mental health issues as criminal matters. True public safety means investing directly in the outcomes we want through community-based services and treatment, such as accessible mental health care and counseling, trauma-informed education in our schools, vocational programs, and robust housing. Allocating resources into our community and away from our carceral systems will prevent harm, heal people, and build up our community. Our next speaker is Elisa Koff ginsburg Please accept the unmute to begin. Elisa, can you accept the unmute? Yes, I did, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Elisa Koff Ginsburg with the Behavioral Health Contractors Association. BHCA strongly supports Supervisor Ellenberg's referral. Investments in correction-based services lessens the resources for community-based solutions. 
and will exacerbate the workforce shortages behavioral health organizations are already experiencing. Behavioral health providers and the county BHSD have shared with you the challenges of recruitment and retention of qualified clinicians and other key treatment health providers. The choice to invest in a new jail and hire qualified treatment staff will result in inadequate staffing at both. In our county several years ago, an enhanced effort to recruit psychiatrists for jails immediately resulted in a shortage of psychiatrists in the health and hospital system. Please use the process outlined in Supervisor Ellenberg's memo. Our next speaker is Janine Valadez. Please accept the unmute to begin. Oh, I apologize, Janine, one more time. Did it work this time? Yes, sorry about that. Thank you. My name is Janine Valadez and I'm a District 5 voter living in Los Altos since 89. I'm a city commissioner but speak as a county resident today. I don't doubt your desire to find effective solutions to ensure public safety, but despite your hopes that a carceral facility can address the societal challenges our community are facing, challenges that induce or abandon people to break laws, the punitive system cannot solve these problems. That because the jail is dense with felons completely ignores that many are convicted unjustly because they cannot afford to mount an effective defense or through faults in the police system or because they are victims of racial bias. Your stats fail to amplify that even violent crime can be the result of poor mental health and societal deprivation. Hospitals within jails don't help because they don't solve the societal bias against those who have incarceration on their resumes. Let's stop fooling ourselves. The carceral system is neither equitable nor curative. I beg you to reimagine public safety. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Stakely. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello, my name is Catherine Stakely. I live in Sunnyvale and I'm a member of Surge and the Care First Coalition. We do not want a new jail. I had some problems with some of the presentations today. We heard a lot about charges and violent charges, but these are charges, not convictions. More than 80% of folks in our county jail are just awaiting trial. They haven't been convicted of anything. And speaking of violence, our county jail has a history of guards committing violence against folks in the jail, including the murder of Michael Tyree. So we can't blame this all on inefficiencies in the courts. This isn't someone else's problem. You have the ability today to choose to invest in the gaps in our safety net so folks don't end up in jail in the first place. So no new jail and invest in a community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item number 13 that includes uh, input from system impacted people every step of the way. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lavere Foster. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name is Lavere Foster and I represent the African American Community Service Agency. I oppose building a new jail because we need to shift our focus to services that can actually help people mental health and substance abuse services, appropriate housing, those are services that actually help people. Let's not build a new jail. Instead, let's acknowledge how these systems of oppression have disproportionately affected black and brown people for so long. Let's discuss how we plan to make impactful change in our community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ol Olamide Abios. I apologize if I mispronounced, please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Olamide Abiose, and I'm a graduate student with Abolish Stanford, member of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I urge the Board of Supervisors to vote yes on item number 13 and no on items 10 and 11. It 10 and 11. In November 2020, this board voted to suspend new jail construction and look into in alternatives to incarceration. So it is confusing that it's taken over a year of community advocacy to push the board to stay true to its commitments. You've heard from hundreds of community members and dozens of incarcerated individuals and thousands of petition signers, all of whom have emphatically stated no new jail. What the board has lately demonstrated is a failure of imagination and a lack of political courage. During the pandemic, we saw a massive decrease in the jail population and a racial justice uprising that taught us a better world is not only possible, it's necessary. A vote for a new jail forecloses that possibility and it renders hollow the board's statements on the sheriff, on racial justice, on public health and more. I urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13. Our next speaker is Lonnie Ballard. Please accept the unmute to begin. Lonnie, can you accept the end? Whoops, one more time. 
There you go. Um, my name is Lonnie and I'm a District 1 resident and a member of Surge. <clears throat> I used to not think much at all about jail inmates. Whatever they did, they got what they deserved. However, I've come to learn that what they deserve is not always fair and equal. And it's people of color who are most negatively impacted by our current system. In addition, jails are not restorative. Jails do not rehabilitate. Jails separate families. We have a chance now to transform our county's carceral system. We should not fear what we haven't yet imagined. I look forward to halt plans for a new jail and in, invest in the alternative to incarceration process outlined in agenda item number 13 that includes input from those directly impacted. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alexis McNabb. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, this is Alexis McNabb, a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice in San Jose District uh, and voter, voter in District 3. My brother lives with various developmental disabilities and mood disorders, and while he hasn't spent significant time in jail, which I recognize is due in part to my family's race and class privilege, I understand that anyone who is incarcerated could so easily be my brother. He didn't need a facility when he was a child. He needed trained, well-compensated people to support him and my family. Yes, decarcerate as much as possible and also make sure that your focus does not go into another locked facility, but into services which will help families. Services which are consistently developed with full input from those who have lived experience of incarceration every step of the way. Follow the powerful leaders and family members and the Care First Coalition and others who have spent decades fighting for dignity and access to care for their loved ones. We urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carol Stevenson. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Carol Stevenson. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and a lifelong resident of the county. After Michael Tyree was murdered, I joined a debug demonstration in front of the jail. I remember how we crossed heading and looked up at the building and we could hear people from inside banging on the windows to communicate with us. Our chants on the street joined with the noise coming from the community members in the jail, which impressed on me how important our work is together to change our system of incarceration. These past two years have made even more clear that we are only as safe as our fellow community members. The health and safety of system impacted people is the health and safety of us all. When I think of that day in front of the jail years ago, I'm reminded that those places are toxic environments that create loss of autonomy, disconnection from family, and enforced solitude, all which cause trauma. Today, you can decide to interrupt that ongoing violence on our fellow community members. I urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and invest in alternatives to incarceration process in item 13 that includes input from system impact. Our next speaker is Tina Brown. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon, this is Tina Brown. I am a system impacted family member here with Silicon Valley Debug and the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I asked the board to decarcerate, renovate and reimagine public safety. I know through many years of my own lived experiences of having loved ones in the county jails that building a new jail will only continue harm. It does not help our community and is not public safety. These are failed and toxic systems that harm individuals and their families because they lack services of care. If they did work, then my family members would not currently be sitting in state prisons. I urge the board to listen to the community and halt plans for a new jail and use a larger version, a larger vision of care first by investing in the community county alternatives to incarceration process that has been laid out in Supervisor Ellenberg's referral item number 13. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Rachel Kay. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Rachel Krantz. I live in District 5 and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. In June 2020, the Board of Supervisors affirmed we must acknowledge the histories of systemic racial injustices and the role government institutions continue to play. Jail is one such institution. In our county, black and brown community members are disproportionately incarcerated. 
I am here today because that injustice affects all of us. I am also a therapist. For over 20 years, I've worked with people recovering from trauma. I know that in order to heal, people need to be in a safe place, which is not a jail. We urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process in agenda item 13 that includes input, input from system impacted people every step of the way. Thank you. Our next speaker is Liz Finney. Please accept the unmute to begin. Um, yeah. Um, so um, my name is Liz and I live in District 2 and I'm a member of Rex, uh, the Race Equity Community Safety Committee. And as one of the 2% of San Jose's Black population, I strongly recommend that the board rejects the proposal to build a new jail. As others before me have mentioned, we don't need more incarceration. We need to fill the gaps in our community safety nets. This system is racist, classist, and white supremacist. The disproportionate incarceration of my people is immoral and untenable. Instead, we must focus on providing care and resources that will alleviate the symptoms of poverty and prevent the circumstances that create what you label as crime. Vote no on a new jail and yes on care for our community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole Boaz. Please accept me on mute to begin. Um, hello, my name is Nicole. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and I live in District 2. Um, in June of 2020, the board adopted a resolution affirming that Black Lives Matter. And that resolution said that, quote, it will take action on every level of government to create meaningful change. It also said, the County of Santa Clara is committed to examining policies and working with communities to serve our mission in its full capacity, to dismantle systems of oppression, and to ensure equity, inclusivity, and social justice. Today, the board has an opportunity to uphold these goals. Today, you can decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. By halting plans for a new jail and supporting the alternatives to an incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Parkman. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Brian Parkman. I am a member of the community group Hero 10 and a resident of District 4. I urge the board to reject building a new jail and look towards other systems that are counter to incarceration. Uh, if the county is serious about looking at a therapeutic model, to reduce uh, jail beds, then making a uh, new jail is really a counter to that said goal and will only really lead to failure again. I urge for no new prison and look to war alternatives. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hector Hernandez. Please accept the unmute to begin. And your mic is open, Hector. Hi, uh, I'm a member of the I'm a resident of, resident of mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a sorry about that. I'm a resident of Santa Clara County, and I'm against uh, making a new, new jail because it's we need to find better solutions for mental health services and support vulnerable members of our community as well as children to not see themselves behind bars in the future. To give much return. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leslie Z. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, Leslie Zeiger here. I live in District 5 and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. This past year, you've heard me make emotional appeals against the new jail and four non-carceral non alternatives. Today, I'll be pragmatic. Leaders from our county's departments have all made cases for why we need to reduce incarceration and punishment. The public health and custody health departments have called for a reduced jail population. The Office of the Public Defender calls for access to the people they are defending and explains that less people should be held pretrial. A report from Oakland said, quote, the desire to harm oneself is a predictable aspect of the circumstances of incarceration. And last week, AG Bonta opened an investigation of our county sheriff's department partly from allegations relate, relating to conditions of confinement in its jails. So why are you gonna give that? Our next speaker is Jen Meyer. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
Hi, my name is Jen Meyer. I'm a D2 voter and a member of Local 521 and Surge. I'm also an artist who went last winter to photograph the demolition site of Main Jail South. And I felt my heart sink because it seemed inevitable that the county would just build yet another monument to misery and racism there. But it is not inevitable. We know that because in Sacramento County, under a consent decree like ours, the Board of Supervisors recognized that a new building would not change the practices of the Sheriff's Department, would not change how jail harms those inside would not change how jail systematically undermines our black and brown communities. In Sacramento, the board recognized the need for upstream interventions that both reduce harm and prevent crime. We are asking you to have the wisdom and courage they did. By the way, when Jeff Smith repeats the misleading phrase serious crime, remember the prosecutorial practice of upcharging to folks force folks into plea deals, as well as the legal presumption of innocence. We urge you to halt plans for a new jail and invest in the ATI process laid out in item 13. Thank you. Peggy, I'm going to ask you to hold just a minute. Um, I've been informed that Dr. Austin, who spoke earlier, needs to leave in 20 minutes. So I wanted to ask board members if you had any questions that you were expecting to ask Dr. Austin after the public spoke. No. I see a no from Supervisor Ellenberg. Can I have, have an audio no from the others or a yes? Supervisor Chavez? Yeah, no. No, thank you, Supervisor thank Lee. You. Yeah, I actually do have a quick question about the deflection center that we talked about earlier. I'll talk to Austin if she might be able to help answer some of those questions. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Um, thank you for explaining to us about this concept of a deflection center. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more and also give us a reference of where we can look more into this information of uh, installing something like that? Dr. Austin. With respect, Supervisor, this is Martha Wapensky. He was on the Zoom and I'm seeing that he's not on here anymore. If you'd like, I can take your question and answer it off agenda through Dr. Austin. Yeah, that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. If uh, if he's not here anymore. Thank you. He's this is the clerk. He does appear to still be in the room, but is a guest for some reason. Let me promote him. I'm sorry, he is as a panelist, uh, but he's not responding. Okay, so uh, Supervisor Lee, ask your questions. Martha will make, uh, thank you, Martha, for that. We'll make note of them and reply when possible. Thank you. Did you have any more questions you wanted to ask? Uh, no, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, Supervisor Simidian, did you have any questions you wanted to get to Dr. Austin? No, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Peggy, let's resume our uh, speak speakers from the public, and I apologize to the public for that interruption. Our next speaker is Gregory Kepferly. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, I'm Greg Kepferly. I'm the CEO of Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County and am voicing support for Supervisor Ellenberg's opposition to building a new jail and instead to expand behavioral health treatment and facilities and alternatives to incarceration in Santa Clara County. But just one example, the county is already uh, having a very effective programs that can do this. One example is ProGrip uh, that we provide those services. We have an 8% recidivism rate uh, for the young men that are in that program uh, versus a 40% recidivism mm -hmm. rate uh, within the county. So you can just start uh, uh, reducing the jail population quickly by expanding existing programs and services, investing in behavioral health support, treatment facilities, as well as the alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is Lori Catcher. Please accept the unmute to begin. Lori, can you accept the unmute? Hi, yes. My name is Lori Catcher. I live and vote in District 2, and I'm a member of Surge. It is clear that there's a positive connection between having housing and reduced incarceration. In the community engagement report, one participant from the in-custody survey commented, when I have a place to live, I don't get arrested. At a meeting of the Adult Behavioral Health Board earlier this month, 
the Office of Supportive Housing shared graphs showing that the number of arrests and the number of days in jail decreases significantly for those in permanent supportive housing. Yet the county's framework report neglected to do a thorough analysis of the long-term cost benefits of providing housing versus a new jail. Let's spend our tax dollars wisely and stop criminalizing poverty. First, center the experiential wisdom of system impacted people and utilize rigorous data to provide what our community members need, which is what will provide safety for all of us. Halt plans for a new jail and invest in the county community alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda. Our next speaker is Julia M. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Julia Mangioni. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and of the Care First Coalition. I'm a resident and small business owner here in Santa Clara County. I always thought that jails existed to keep our society safe, but now I know that jails are where we cage people that we have failed as a society. It's time to stop enacting harm against our most vulnerable community members, their families, loved ones, and our greater society by caging them, regardless of how those cages are reformed or supposedly state of the art. No one can heal or recuperate in a cage. We have heard this from experts over and over again. Any percentage of our population in a jail over 0% is too much. It's time to uphold your racial justice commitments and center the input of those most impacted people to develop the alternatives we need and deserve. Vote with your constituents and your conscience today to reject plans for a new jail and say yes to developing robust alternatives. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julieta Flores. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Julieta Flores y este yo pertenezco a la familia de Silicon Valley uh, Dibag y este comparto mi experiencia de que tengo un ser querido dentro de la cárcel. Eh, mi ser querido este fue condenado a 215 años sin pruebas y aparte este el trato que les dan dentro a mi ser querido le ha dado tres veces COVID allí adentro porque están demasiado amontonados. Y también este apoyo que no se no se haga lo de la cárcel porque en realidad no les están enseñando nada salen salen mal de ahí y creo que deberían de buscar otras alternativas para ayudar de veras a las personas que entran ahí y tratar como seres eh, humanos verdad porque yo he ido a visitar a mis a, a mi inmate y me han tratado muy mal demasiado mal especialmente en Elwood so deberían de tener un poquito más de cuidado y fijarse bien y tener de veras un verdadero apoyo. Gracias. Um, my name is Julieta Flores and I belong to the Silicon Valley Divac. And I have a loved person in a jail and he was uh, sentenced with 215 years without any proof. The treatment that they are given is not good. He, he has already three times COVID because of the because the jail is too crowded and they are not having the uh, they are not having good conditions. I vote against this jail. Um, people are actually are going out of the jail in pretty bad conditions, and we should look for another alternatives. And they are not treated as human. This is um, they are having every time I go and visit my inmate. They, that, they are having really bad conditions, especially in Elwood. So uh, you, we really should be very, very, very careful about the treatment. And again, I vote against this. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kim Guptal. Please accept the unmute to begin. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Kim Guptal, and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice and a voter in District 4. We ask that the board support agenda item number 13 to develop alternative non-carceral services and resources. When I learned that 88% of people inside our jails are awaiting trial, I was dumbstruck. How is that fair? And knowing that those people are disproportionately people of color enrages me. You know all the arguments. You even signed a resolution to eliminate institutional racism in the county. Do the right thing. I join my colleagues in the Care First Coalition to urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and to invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration laid out in agenda item 13 that includes impact, excuse me, input from system impacted people every step of the way. 
We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Again, do the right thing. Our next speaker is Kathy Cordova. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon, supervisors. I'm Kathy Cordova, Executive Director of Recovery Cafe San Jose, a member of the Real Coalition and a resident of District 4. On a daily basis, I meet with folks who are living with personal trauma and hear their stories. For nearly eight years, Recovery Cafe San Jose has dealt with folks who experience trauma, including addiction, homelessness, mental health challenges, racialized trauma, and very often incarceration. They live with the scars left by the war on drugs. Generations of families have been destabilized emotionally and financially by drug-related arrests and incarceration. I commend the recent board referral declaring substance abuse and mental health a public health crisis. Unfortunately, those most impacted by this crisis end up in jail. I ask that you support Supervisor Ellen Berger's Ellenberg's referral number 13 and um, jail alternatives and a person-centered system of care that recognizes people can change. Our next speaker is Nathan Park. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Nathan Park. and I'm a member of Sacred Heart Community Service, a resident of the Washington Guadalupe neighborhood. I'm a friend and mentor to youth with incarcerated loved ones who live and work in District 2. I can't stop thinking about my friend's brother who was caught in the wrong place at the wrong time with the right skin color. He has been incarcerated for five years awaiting sentencing so that the other youth incarcerated in his case will be old enough to be tried as adults. Moving forward with a new jail will signal an abandonment of the board's June 23rd, 2020 Black Lives Matter resolution to eliminate systemic and institutional racial inequities in the county. I urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out and supervising Ellenberg's agenda item three that includes input from system impacted people every step of the way. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Maristella Tapio. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maristella Tapia. I'm a District 4 voter and a member of Mothers Out Front Silicon Valley chapter. I'm also a sociologist. Mountains of sociological research tell us incarceration does not reduce crime. It does produce long lasting harm against the, among those it affects who are by design more likely to be poor people and people of color. It's not just scholars who get this. The randomly sampled voters the county paid to survey get that the jail is discriminatory and that we must find a better way to treat people with mental illness and addiction. Scores of organizations and advocacy groups in Santa Clara County that range from education to community-based and civil rights organizations, academics and legal scholars and nonprofit organizations have all written letters to the board in opposition to the building of the new jail and in favor of funding more humane alternatives to incarceration. The presentation prior to the break mentioned that the new jail would provide 500 more beds, but nothing was said about how these beds would address the problems of mental health and poverty that overwhelmingly contribute to crime and incarceration. In fact, apologies, our next speaker is Nancy Cavionas. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi. My name is Nancy Cavionis, and I'm here today not only as a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice, but as a member of the Jewish community. My synagogue is in Supervisors Committee and District, and I live in President Wasserman District. Here's a novel idea. Intervention at the community level will decrease or eliminate incarceration. If we really cared about the people in our jails, we would be investing resources in keeping people out of jail to begin with. I urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and invest in the community county alternative to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13 that includes input from system impacting people every step of the way. I implore you to use your imagination. A different, non incarceral future is possible. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pancho Guevara. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Poncho Guevara and I serve as the Executive Director of Sacred Heart Community Service and as a member of the Real Coalition. In solidarity with the Care First Coalition, I'm asking the county not to move forward with the building of another jail. There is no humane solution involving a replacement jail. 
You have to remember we were in this position because we needed to replace a jail that was traumatizing and lethal, traumatizing and lethal to those incarcerated, traumatizing to the staff assigned to this environment, devastating to the families and communities of the incarcerated. Even the most state-of-the-art facility that we designed today will prolong our dependency on an ill-fated carceral model that is disproportionately harmful to black and brown people. We are a community where we put our money where our values are, a community of vision, courage, and innovation. We support County Supervisor Susan Ellenberg's proposal to initiate a community dialogue about uh, and study of community-based alternatives to incarceration and to expand funding for behavioral treatment outside of the jail and new non-carceral solutions. The pandemic forced us to take a pause and rethink our models. We have to seize this opportunity to reimagine systems that incarcerate uh, of incarceration, mental health, rehabilitation. Our next speaker is Esha Shaw. Please accept the unmute to begin. Esha, can you accept the unmute? Yeah, I'll be back in one minute. Uh, Esha, your mic is open. Yeah, is it okay if you, have, you skip me and I go next? Sorry. Go ahead and speak, please. Hello? Yes. Can I go next? Not right now? No, we're, we're taking everybody in order to be fair to everyone. Okay, fine. Go right ahead. Yes, I am going. The first state prison in California was constructed in 1852. For the next 100 years, only nine prisons were constructed in the state, in state of California. Then Reagan came to power and 24 prisons were constructed in 50 years and somehow there were enough people incarcerated to fill them. This creates two possibilities. Either there's re enough restrictions to state resources that have continued to worsen to the point where people are incentivized to commit more crime, in which case the problem clearly resides in prevention and you should support um, Susan Ellerberg's proposal or the basic economic principle of supply creating demand is true and more jails create more incentive to imprison people. I urge council members to recall what they learned from Econ 101 and vote against the jail and for Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal. Our next speaker is Yaron Liu. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Yaron Liu and I'm a public health researcher at Stanford. I want to share key findings from our recent study in the Santa Clara County jails that show we need community-based alternatives to incarceration, not a new jail. Jails have exacerbated the county's mental health crisis, especially during COVID. Restrictive policies intended to prevent COVID outbreaks have further isolated people from their loved ones and violated human rights, as medical isolation in a jail is indistinguishable from solitary confinement. People in custody do not trust jail health staff and are less likely to get vaccinated as a result of that mistrust. That will not change with a newer, shinier, fancier jail. It's inherent to the custody setting. What we found was that incarcerated people do largely trust their doctors outside of jail. We need health providers and strong social supports outside of jail walls in order to ensure our best chance at improving mental health and public health in the county. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Stewart. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Linda Stewart and I am a member of Surge and I live in District 4. There's no denying that the mass incarceration of black and brown people stems from white supremacy, which is the most shameful legacy of our country. Boldly reimagining public safety is a huge step in the right direction to end this legacy. In her novel, The Stone Sky, N.K. Jemisin wrote something that has stuck with me since I read it two years ago. Quote, for a society built on exploitation, there is no greater threat than having no one left to oppress, unquote. Do not allow this proposed jail to be a new source of oppression. Do not allow Santa Clara County to be a society built on exploitation. I urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13 that includes input from system impacted people every step of the way. I ask the board to decarcerate, re-innovate, and reimagine public safety. Our next speaker is Catherine Ono. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
Hello, my name is Catherine Ono. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and I live in District 4. We, your constituents, have spent months providing input on the county's approach to public safety and offering alternative solutions as requested by the board. However, the county executive's report functionally ignores this input along with many of the board's referrals. It does not meaningfully engage with the care first approach advocated by the community. Evidence shows that we cannot incarcerate our way to public safety, nor can we build our way out of inhumane jail conditions when cages are inherently inhumane. Supervisors, you have in the past committed to addressing systemic racism and to properly caring for people with mental health issues. You have an opportunity here to back up your resolutions with meaningful actions. I urge the board to permanently halt plans for a new jail and invest in renovations and community-driven alternatives to incarceration as outlined in Supervisor Ellenberg's referral. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ali Miano. Please accept me on mute to begin. Ali, can you accept the unmute? Hello? Your mic is open. Hello? Yes, go ahead and speak. Hello? Oops. Hello? All yours, Peggy. Can you all hear me? Yes. We can. We can hear you. Hello? OK, I will. we'll come back and see if we can get that to work <laughs> later. Hello. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon, um, Super uh, President Wasserman and the board. I'm Catherine Hedges, a resident and business owner in District 2 and a member of Surge. The Care First Jails Last Coalition asked the board to halt plans for new jail, vote no on agenda items 10 and 11, and vote yes on agenda item 13. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. The current system isn't making the public safe. It's a legacy of slave patrols and Jim Crow, and it's a significant factor in the racial inequity in our county. It's hypocritical to preach racial equality while recommitting to the carceral system. Think of all the ways we can prevent incarceration with the $100,000 per person per year we're spending on jailing people. And I'm disappointed that this additional expert witness report was presented at the last minute, undermining the public's ability to respond to the points raised and the slanted language used. Who in our community who isn't invested in the carceral system is supporting a new jail? We need to follow the roadmap in Supervisor Ellenberg's memo for agenda item 13. Our next speaker is Samina Usman. Please accept the unmute to begin. Yes, hello. My name is Samina Usman, and I am the Senior Government Relations Coordinator for the Council on American Islamic Relations uh, Bay Area Chapter. I'm also a member of the Real Coalition and a resident of District 4. I support Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal to initiate community dialogue and, and a study of the community-based alternatives to incarceration and to expand behavioral health treatment outside of jail. I oppose building a new jail. The estimated cost of a new jail will be about 390 million dollars that could have been used for affordable housing, mental health services, and a mobile crisis response teams, which would create long-term solutions rather than spending over $100,000 per person in staffing and operation costs to keep a person in jail. Addressing root causes would need systemic change, such as ending criminalization of social conditions and investing in the community rather than the system. Syst systemic changes means having making basic needs like housing, food, education, employment, behavioral health care. Our next speaker is Kyle Wang. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon. I'm Kyle Wong, a student at Stanford and a proud member of Abolish and the Care First Coalition. But more than all of that, I am a lifelong resident of Santa Clara County speaking against the construction of a new jail. I don't think I have anything else to add about how prisons statistically fail to keep us safe because that's all been said already. But I'd instead like to remind us that this isn't just a matter of numbers or statistics as Dr. Jim Austin and Jeff Smith might lead you to believe, but human lives and human dignity. Prisoners are people with names and families, not just problems or percentages to be measured and optimized on a chart. Growing up here, I've always believed that Silicon Valley is a place of innovation, not incarceration. And if this is supposed to be true about the place I am still proud to call home, then why do we continue investing in prisons and systems that fail our people over and over again? Why are we so afraid to imagine something better? 
Our next speaker is Tatiana. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you, supervisors. I am Tatiana Foltz, a member of Standing Up for Racial Justice, resident, trauma therapist, and small business owner in District 4. I myself am a survivor of violent crimes. Today, I ask you to hold on items 10 and 11 and no new jail and invest in alternatives to incarceration. I, you know, this is no longer about data. Data is, a, data supports alternatives to incarceration. It is about our ther authoritarian control. JFC talked about risk factors and one of their publications on their website noted that black people they call blacks trigger quote unquote false positives for more likely to be violent after leaving the systems. Dr. Smith mentioned therapeutic environments and you cannot have therapeutic environments in there. Part of why I did not report my trafficker and rapist was because of this racist system. Peggy, if you'll hold just a minute. Um, we have a number of people inquiring how many more speakers, um, I guess wanting to plan whatever they're, they're doing between uh, now and then. We currently have 91 more speakers in the queue. Thank you, Peggy. Our next speaker is Peter Camacho. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, can you hear me? We yes. can. Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is Peter Camacho. I'm a student at Stanford, member of Abolish Stanford, which is part of the Careford Jails Last Coalition, member of the Justice for Angela King's Justice for All Coalition, and the external chairperson of the Northern California Philippine American Student Alliance, which serves thousands of Filipino students in San Clair County. Today, I'm here to urge you to vote against the creation of a new jail and to instead say yes to alternatives of incarceration. As someone who's been able to work with the County Human Rights Commission on the resolution in support of the Philippine Human Rights Act, I know that the Board of Supervisors can't and has taken a great stand in support of the interests of the community which they serve. And we know that building a jail is not one of those community interests that's seen from the multitude of communities today and from the community input over many months. What we see now is the lack of resources being allocated to important community services. I need to really address these issues, and today the Board of Supervisors has the opportunity to actually take action towards a better future for our and provide much needed resources, ensuring its commitment to care for and deals with us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lydia Bustamante. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon. My name is Lydia Bustamante. And I live in Campbell, but I'm also here representing the 55,000 members of Sacred Heart Community Service, a local nonprofit that organizes the community to address the root causes and symptoms of poverty across Santa Clara County. As a former District 4 Commissioner for the County's Human Rights Commission, who has received complaints over the years of human rights issues in the jails and toured the inside of these antiquated facilities to listen to and support people who with lived experience in there, I recognize the complexity of the issues in front of you. But what has moved me to show up to you before you today is that there are clear alternative processes that can help build a pathway toward the empowerment of people. Addressing root causes would need systemic changes such as ending criminalization of social conditions and investing in the community rather than the system. I strongly urge you to vote yes on, on item 13 to implement alternatives to incarceration and no on 10 and 11, which recommends building a new jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara Hansen. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, this is Barbara Hansen. No incarceration is a North Star. Receiving interventions and supports to eliminate that need for incarceration is imperative. However, it is important to remember that those with mandatory sentences in our jails never will receive the, the supports and interventions needed because the facilities where they're housed are insufficient and inhumane. We cannot forget them. Our history and, and dismantling institutions is not admirable. The movement to shut all mental health facilities and fully funding the community to fill in the gap dates back to JFK and, and Jimmy Carter who could not complete it. But we continue to empty our mental health facilities believing the community could adequately make up the difference. It did not. And the result of a bold stroke without the attention to un unintended consequences has brought us to where we are today, needing to build a mental health facility. Let's be careful and take careful steps. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlotte. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
My name is Charlotte Theodore and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart Un uh, Community Service. I live in District 4. Moving forward with a new jail would indicate an abandonment of the board's June 2020 resolution to eliminate systemic and institutional race racial inequalities in the county. I have an aunt who has been in and out of the prison system her entire life, due in part to extreme mental distress. I know her and I know her heart. It is true that she has committed crimes, but it is also true that if she had been afforded community supports and mental health care, her story could have turned out very differently. Your community does not want a new jail. The county currently spends more than double the median income in Santa Clara County on each inmate per year. These funds could easily be invested in alternatives that have far greater recorded success than the cycles of incarceration we currently have. I urge the board to vote no on items 10 and 11 and allocate those funds to the community solutions that your constituents are demanding. I urge the board to invest in community county alternatives to incarceration process laid on agenda item 13 that includes in input from system impacted people every step of the way. Our next speaker is Andrew Bigelow. Please accept the unmute to begin. Can you accept the unmute, Andrew? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Right on. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, I mean, to echo, echo everyone that, that has already spoke, I, th I think that folks can hear the amount of speakers that are here today um, and the overwhelming ask to not build a new jail. Um, I, uh, my, I live in San Clair County. Um, I'm an organizer at Debug. I work with families who have loved ones inside the jail. And, uh, and nobody, nobody wants a new jail who's inside there. And, um, I, I just want to really, really ask the, the voting members and the supervisors to see that, you know, I don't know whether process has had this much community involvement and the overwhelming ask to not build a new jail um, throughout this process over the last year plus. Um, so please listen to the people of San Clara County and the people who are here um, who have been a part of this process and asking this the whole time. Our next speaker is Narrowly Campos. Please accept the end mute to begin. Whoops, one more time, Narrowly. Hi, my name is Narrowly with Debug's Community Release Project and I'm part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I am speaking today to urge urge the board to vote no on items 10 and 11 and vote yes to support supervisors Ellenberg's referral under item 13. I support no new jail and for the community to explore our alternatives to, to incarceration. Many of the folks we support through our community release projects are transient and do not have any resources when coming out of the jails, but this is where we come in to support. But in Unfortunately, some of these people do not have that support. And this is, this is why we need to create alternatives for incarceration and provide folks more resources that they need. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mercedes Carbajal. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you. My name is Mercedes Carvajal, part of the Sacred Heart Community Service in the Real Coalition. I'm also a District 4 resident and my family has been victims of crime, yet we still believe that incarceration is not the answer to rehabilitation. We don't support a new jail and we urge you to not approve it. We also completely support my district representative, Supervisor Allenberg's proposal. You need to study more alternatives to incarceration a real community dialogue to study this more in depth, like the proposal on item 13. You also have over 90 nonprofit members and leaders of the Real Coalition who have started this brainstorming for you. There are options. Remember the survey you did to randomly uh, sample borders. They also emphasize that they would like to see more county money go towards mental health and human treatments. Please listen to your community. Those dollars should go more towards prevention and addressing current mental health services. Please oppose the construction of new jail and move forward with item 13. Our next speaker is Julia Voss. Please accept the unmute to begin. Julia, can you accept the unmute? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Julia Voss. I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice and a local voter who lives and works in District 4. 
As an educator and a parent, I've seen how ineffective incarceration is as a way to combat harm in society, both to members of the public and to the people who end up in prison, up to and including so-called violent offenders. As research overwhelmingly shows, jails do not reduce crime. Jails don't help those convicted of crimes award future arrests and rebuild their lives. Jails further damage the well-being of the many mentally ill people swept up by police. And jails do an especially poor job of protecting those at highest risk for harm, vulnerable people in marginalized communities. The current Santa Clara County Jail is overcrowded and riddled with corruption, and it should be abolished. In its place, along with fellow surge members, I urge the bar board I urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and to invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13, which includes input from system impacted people every step of the way. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Our next speaker is Nancy. Please accept me on mute to begin. Hi everyone, my name is Nancy. Uh, I'm with the Party for Socialism and Liberation and I'm calling in support of Supervisor Ellenberg's referral um, and also support of the community-based alternatives to incarceration. As someone who has family members who've fallen into the carceral system out of crimes of survival, I know how hard it can be. This community does not need more punishment. They need more support. They need more care. I also find it very interesting that a lot of the presenters mentioned the word violent a lot especially since we know who's going to end up in these jails. It won't be the real crim criminals. It won't be the venture capitalists that prey on our society. It won't be the CEOs that commit wage theft. It won't be the developers that displace our families. It won't be the billionaire tax evaders that contribute nothing to our society. No, it will be people of color. It will be poor people. It will be people like my dad. This cannot be the way forward. We need to do better. So that is yes on referral 13, and that is no on 10 and 11, no new jails. We have to do better. We have to dismantle this system of oppression. Thank you. Our next speaker is Raj Jayadev. Please accept me on mute to begin. This is Raj with Debug. If this board votes to build a monument to mass incarceration in the form of a new jail, it cements our county to a future of furthering systemic racism and criminalization of mental health, substance abuse, and poverty. But if this board instead supports Supervisor Ellenberg's referral, you're reflecting what was overwhelmingly called for through the engagement process, the incarcerated, their communities, random voter polls, all saying no new jail. The CEO is pushing for a new jail because they're invested. They put a lot of time and resources in designing it years ago. That's why the report makes no sense. It complains mental health with risk levels, assumes people are ineligible for lease based on charges, has no projection analysis on the impact of decarceral plans that the county has already started. James Austin's data confuses crime with DA discretionary charging practices. And then it concludes with a new jail, coincidentally what they wanted all along. We ask you honor the resolutions you pass, the call for constituents, and reject the CEO's jail and support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Luke. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Amy Luke. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and a professor of college writing and rhetoric in District 4, speaking against the building of a new jail and in favor of alternatives to incarceration. When I teach rhetoric in my college classes, I'm teaching how to engage as good citizens through writing and speaking, what Quintilian called the good man speaking well. Key aspects of this citizenship practice are considering who's involved and what are the shared values they have in making such decisions as you are making today as a board member. In our rhetorical situation today, we, the citizens of Santa Clara County, who you asked for feedback, so many of us here today are your interlocutors. We've established a set of shared values in the board's recent resolutions around Black Lives Matter. We've heard supposed agreement about the importance of listening to system impacted communities expressed in board reports and proceedings. And what these communities are saying is this, we don't want a new jail that is moving in the wrong direction. We urge the members to live up to your civic role as good people speaking well today. Our next speaker is Kathy Blake. Please accept the unmute to begin. Kathy, can you, there you go. Hi, my name is Kathy Blake and I represent the African American Community Service Agency and I live in District 4. I am very opposed to building a new jail and many other communities have spoken out against building a new jail. Please listen to us. We are the ones in the community every day with our boots on the ground and we understand that the majority of the inmates may need services, mental health services and substance abuse services rather than to be locked up. 
A new jail does not so solve any problems. It only exacerbates them. Thank you very much. Apologies, I muted myself. Our next speaker is Lauren H. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello. Um, the jail uh, construction project is, uh, I, I am not prepared to speak fluently. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Azucena. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Azucena, can you accept the unmute? There you go. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Azucena, and I'm a community organizer with Siren and a resident of District 2. I'm here to voice my strong opposition to the building of a new jail in Santa Clara. This community needs adequate care services that will improve all of our lives and address our needs. Jails do not do that. Jails have been proven time and time again to disproportionately reduce the quality of life in the cities that they were built. I do not want to see a new jail in our county. I want services and resources that will help people not put them in a cage. I urge the board to halt new plans for a new jail. I urge you to oppose items 10 and 11 and please support item 13 to continue studying and proposing alternatives to incarceration with input by those impacted by the system. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carly Peach. Please accept the admit to begin. Hi there, this is Carly. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. All right, my name is Carly Peach and I am a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. And I live in Supervisor Smidian's district. You might recognize me uh, from the meeting we had a few weeks ago. I am also a professor at San Jose State University and a member of the California Faculty Association. And I'm here to support alternatives to incarceration and to lift up the testimony of the community members who have been here waiting for hours to tell you in 60 seconds how much jail has hurt their families and their friends. Uh, Raj from Debug has put it well in our meeting with Supervisor Smitty and that a new jail is a down payment on the carceral system, locking us into continuing to put our resources into a path that harms people, separates them from families and separates them from opportunities to grow. I urge the board to support alternatives to incarceration following agenda item 13 to decarcerate, renovate and reimagine public safety. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kylie Clark. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, supervisors. My name is Kylie Clark, and I'm the public policy coordinator at West Valley Community Services, a nonprofit fighting poverty by providing critical services to the low income and unhoused of our county and proud member of the Real Coalition. As an organization, we stand in strong opposition to the construction of a new jail and in support of Susan Ellenberg's proposal. As a nonprofit serving many disadvantaged communities, including the formerly incarcerated, unhoused, food insecure, and more, we have witnessed firsthand the negative impacts of the carceral system on hundreds of lives, in particular people of color. Those who will be impacted by your decision, including current inmates, have spoken, and they do not want this jail. Yet the power to make this decision lies in your hands. Please exercise this power by representing and listening to these voices and vote no to a new jail and yes to community dialogue and alternatives. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicholas Hurley. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, Board of Supervisors. My name is Nicholas Hurley. I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart, a member of Stone Church at Willow Glen and a homeowner in District 4. I'm here today to say no to building a new jail in the county. My faith demands that I seek justice that rolls down like waters, but jails are not justice, especially not for people of color. Justice set things right. While jails rip families and communities apart, they treat human beings struggling with mental health issues as criminals and do absolutely nothing to set right any harm done prior to entering a jail. What we need is alternatives to incarceration as advocated by Supervisor Ellenberg. Jails are not justice. Do not build a new jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nizreen Baroudi. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
Yes, hi, my name is Ms. Shane Baruti. I'm a supervising public defender. I'm speaking today as a private citizen and I live in District 1. I'm opposed to the new jail and support supervisor Ellenberg's referral. Four points in light of Dr. Austin's presentation today. He said, one, most of the people in jail are there for pretrial and for more than one felony. It's important to note the DA often charges numerous felonies in the alternative, even though the crimes constitute one course of conduct. Two, how much would it cost to improve the current jail facilities as opposed to rebuilding a whole new one? Three, the point that the population consists of serious or violent felonies slated for state prison makes little sense since he's also saying they are pretrial. What someone's accused of does not mean that that's what they will ultimately be convicted of. Four, the DA is not currently pressured into making offers that are likely to resolve cases. So when he mentions the length of time you, people are detained pre-trial, are we talking about the last two years during COVID? Thank you. Our next speaker is Sabrina Monet Lamontagna. Please accept the unmute to begin. Sabrina, can you, there you go. Hello. My name is Sabrina Monet Lamontine, and I work and reside in Santa Clara County. Um, I am representing the African American Community Service Agency as well as the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, Silicon Valley Chapter. I do not support any system that disproportionately locks up our Black and Brown communities. Therefore, I oppose the building of a new jail. We need to dismantle systems of oppression and work to ensure racial equality. We need alternatives to incar incarceration. I am in favor of building re rehab services to help support the mental health and substance abuse public health crisis in our community. Creating such services will help our county so much more than if you build a new jail. Put care first. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lily Bow. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Lily Bow, and I'm a student at Stanford Law School, a member of Abolish Stanford and the Care First Coalition, and a resident of District 5 in Palo Alto. And I'm here, um, like everyone else before me, to urge the board to vote no on items 10 and 11, and yes on item 13 in order to make our community safer and healthier. Our county does not need a 500-bed jail. The research on public safety overwhelmingly demonstrates that locking people up does not keep people safe or make them whole. We've learned this lesson the hard way through a failed social experiment and mass human caging with devastating impacts on our community. What we do need is more voluntary services and robust supports for people who are suffering from mental illness, substance abuse, homelessness, and other symptoms of poverty and inequality. We need interventions that prevent violence and harm before they occur. These are the non carceral investments that will actually keep our community and county safe and ensure people can meet their very basic needs. Our next speaker is Srila. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Srila. Um, uh, I'm a resident of District 5, a graduate student at Stanford. I'm here today in solidarity with the Care First Jail Last Coalition and Abolish Stanford. I'm here today to voice my support for no new jails and for non-carceral solutions, such as those in Supervisor Ellenberg's referral. Now, I'm an engineer by training, so typically I do like numbers, but in the presentations we saw earlier today, those numbers lacked a lot of context. While you could say that there are, oh, okay, maybe one or 2,000 people that have been incarcerated, that does not count the number of lives, the number of families, the generations that are destroyed from the trauma. It does not account for how much the jails don't work. I've been impacted by violent crime. The, incar the carceral solutions do not work. So please listen to the people who are closest to the impact. Please listen to your constituents today and vote Yes, for Supervisor Ellenberg's referral. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Ellie Dunn. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Ellie. I'm a sociologist affiliated with the Stanford Decriminalization Coalition, Abolish Stanford, and the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I am strongly against building any new jail facilities. Building a new jail goes against the Care First Jail Last approach that the board voted to pursue in November 2020. Instead, please renovate the existing jail and work to reduce incarceration to make the living situation for incarcerated people more humane. This ask is in alignment with the majority of the surveyed focus groups from inside the jail who are exactly the people you should be listening to. 
I'm in support of Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal to look into and implement community-based alternatives to incarceration and center system-impacted voices. Incarceration shouldn't be a prerequisite to receiving care. The community needs non-carceral behavioral and mental health facilities, not an expanded carceral system. I'm against agenda items 10 and 11 and in support of agenda item 13 and looking at the board's prior commitments to care, social and racial justice, you should be too. Our next speaker is Ronnie Zeger or Zeiger. Please accept the unmute to begin. Ronnie, can you accept the unmute? Oops. There Thank you go. Know. My name is Ronnie Zeiger. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and a voter in District 5. Early in my career as a physician in our Santa Clara County Hospital and Clinics, when I would see patients who were incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, I was struck by how hard it can be to do things like manage your blood sugar when you're on the inside. Many years later now, I understand that the evidence-based approach to community safety and public health is not actually to focus on building a better jail, but instead to prioritize support systems that pe keep people out of jails. Indeed, incarcerated people experience a two-year decline in life expectancy for each year that they're incarcerated. I've also learned how important it is to look for conflicts of interest when assessing evidence. It is striking to me that County Executive Jeff Smith has also been acting Chief of Corrections where he has stalled doing maintenance work while recommending an unstudied maximum security jail. I take his recommendation. Our next speaker is David Mineta. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Wasserman, Supervisors and Cat Administration. Thank you for the time to weigh on this important decision. I'm here representing Momentum for Health and as a member of the Behavioral Health Contractors Association and Real Coalition. Momentum has extensive experience providing mental health and substance use disorder services to community members, both in custody and out of custody. Dr. Austin's data showed about one fifth of jail population went to jail five times per year, and he suggested that population generally has misdemeanor charges and mental health and substance use disorder charges. The imperative is to find another solution to the traditional practice of criminalizing behavioral health disorders, particularly in our overrepresentative Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. The historical record of this county support of behavioral health for its residents is clear. This vote doubles down on that historical record to keep developing the health-serving behavioral health system. A community coalition of race equity advocates, behavioral health constituents, and so many others raise our hands to support you in this effort. We support Sue Ray. Our next speaker is Chris Dunlap. Please accept the unmute to begin. Chris, can you, there you go. Good afternoon, President Wasserman, members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm Christopher Dunlap, member of Surge at Sacred Heart in San Jose, allied with the Care First JLS Coalition. I'm also an active member of Grace Lutheran Church in Palo Alto in District 5. Unjust incarceration of brown and black people is just one wound among so many inflicted by systemic racism on our society and on our communities. But that is the wound that the board can begin to bind and heal today. Toward that end, I join every other member of the public who has spoken so far to ask the board to support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral and alternatives to carceration which include input from people impacted by the system every step of the way and to oppose agenda items 10 and 11. I trust that each supervisor will vote for justice, treatment and rehabilitation for our community's most vulnerable residents and against a damaged and racist carceral system that is manifested by a new jail. This proposed jail is a stain in our community. We do not want it. We cannot afford it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cheryl Thompson. Please accept the unmute to begin. Cheryl, can you accept the unmute? And your mic is open. Cheryl, your mic is open. Uh, we must have some kind of technical issue. I will come back to her. Uh, our next speaker is Claire Saul. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
Hi, I am Claire Sewell. I'm a student at De Anza College and a member with Sacred Heart Surge Care First Jail Last Coalition and Abolish Stanford. My father has worked as a nursing assistant in county jails and has expressed how COVID regulations have been essentially impossible to implement. It would be rather inhumane to invest in a new jail rather than community like needs like public health. If you care about reducing crime, there are better solutions in the community than a new jail. A report in American Sociological Review estimated that 10 every 10 additional organizations focusing on crime and community life in a city of 100,000 residents leads to a 9% reduction in the murder rate and a 6% reduction in the violent crime rate and a 4% reduction in property crime rate. Therefore, I oppose 10 and 11 and support 13. The criminal legal system is rooted in structural racism. We are not investing in our community by building a new jail. Investing in our community means investing in systemic change, such as meeting basic needs like housing, education, and healthcare must be prioritized. No new jail, yes to alternatives to incarceration, and I support Ellensburg's referral. Thank you for your time. Hold on. Next speaker is Tina Wong. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin. Tina, can you accept the unmute? Tina is not responding. I will come back to her. Um, and I will go back to Cheryl Thompson. Um, Cheryl, can you accept the unmute? And your mic is open but we cannot hear you. Are, is your microphone, are you muted on your end? I will go ahead and, and skip and come back. Um, our next speaker is Flory. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yes, thank you. My name is Flory Imberman and I live in Mountain View. I'm an educator and a member of Ben the Ark Jewish Action. I'm also a member of Congregation Kol Emet and Congregation Etz Chaim. My younger sister of blessed memory had a drug addiction for most of her life. She spent time in jail where she never received any treatment for her addiction. After she served time, she learned she was bipolar. Our community is suffering from a mental health crisis. People need diagnoses and treatment. Putting humans in cages will not help them and will not help our community. I urge you to immediately stop plans to build the new jail. Let's invest in our community with alternatives to incarceration. What can we learn from other counties and cities around the country? Our next speaker is Mary Glauner. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you, President Wasserman and Supervisors. My name is Mary Gloner, speaking as CEO of Project Safety Net, a coalition dedicated to youth suicide prevention and mental health wellness in Supervisors and Medians District. As Vice Chair of County's Race and Health Disparity Committee Board, a real coalition member and district for resident. I ask the Board of Supervisors to advance mental health policies and investments that positively impact young people, especially those incarcerated. As detailed in Vice President Ellenberg's referral, it is essential that behavioral health programs and facilities are tailored to young people, which will divert them from incarceration. Please draw from the wisdom, lived experience, and trust of community when establishing the work group tasked to develop recommendation. As of today, 13% of jail population are transitional age youth, 18 to 24, one and a half times represented in our county. Recently, I learned of the trauma experienced by a 19-year-old who observed three suicide attempts by different jailmates in a single week. Please think of them when you vote. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amina Mahmoud. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Mina, and I'm with Abolish Stanford and the Care First Jail Last Coalition. I'm pursuing a master's in public policy, and I firmly believe a new jail will not be beneficial for anyone in our county. Jails are inevitably vehicles of systemic racism, and they merely punish and dehumanize citizens instead of addressing root causes of the harm, which are almost always unmet needs. In fact, the traumatic experience of incarceration can leave people more vulnerable and more likely to cause harm. Any money that goes towards a new jail is counterproductive and does nothing to address harm or ensure public safety. This isn't even considering all the individuals that are wrongfully incarcerated because of the color of their skin. I'm in support of shutting down the new Santa Clara County Jail and would like our resources to instead go towards non-carceral mental health resources that address poverty and racial inequities in our county. This is real public safety. 
There are so many existing frameworks on how to do this. I urge you to engage with them. And I urge you to prioritize the healing and needs of our black and brown communities. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah St. Julian. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Deb St. Julian. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and Urban Sanctuary Center. The realities of systemic racism changed my life. In my faith tradition, we are taught that facing hard truths sets us all on the path of freedom. The hard truth is that our jail, prison, and injustice systems have resulted in the disproportionate mass incarceration of Black, Latin, Latinx, and other people of color. These systems are racist at their core. Our county has the opportunity to turn from this systemically racist system. We urge to the board to halt the plans for a new jail and to invest in the community alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13 that includes system impacted people every step of the way. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leif Erickson. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Leif Erickson. I'm the retired executive director of Youth Community Service, YCS, and a resident of Palo Alto and District 5. I'm also a member of the Real Coalition. As a longtime nonprofit leader in North County for youth wellness and racial equity, I'm calling to support Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal for a community dialogue and study of behavioral health alternatives to financing a new jail. To Supervisors Simidian and Chavez, I want to thank you for your longtime commitment, leadership, and compassion for mental health issues, youth issues, and racial equity issues. Your leadership has been critical to strengthening and humanizing our Santa Clara County community. Thank you. I encourage you to apply your track record and reputation to bear on this issue of alternatives to incarceration and contribute to the thoughtful momentum towards choosing more effective alternatives instead of a new jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lauren Renaud. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Lauren Renaud with Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and the Care First Jails Last Coalition. I know some and I hope all of you are going to do a brave thing today. Look at the 60 plus letters of support, the emails, the hundreds of phone calls, the 1300 plus petition signatures, the 200 plus postcards from across the county telling you we have much better ideas than a new jail. We know we need non-carceral mental health services. We know that all research and successful drug policy shows that treatment should be increased. Building a jail is too consequential a decision to move forward with and such shoddy reporting backing it up. As the chief executive said, this, the words are wrong in the report. This is not, we cannot move forward with this. We urge the board to halt plans for a new jail, invest in alternatives and include input from system impacted people every step of the way. No on 10 and 11, yes on 13. Please decarcerate, renovate and reimagine public safety. Thank you. Our next speaker is Angelique Martinez. Please accept the unmute to begin. Angelique, can you set the unmute? Can you hear me now? We can. My name is Angelique. I'm a self-determined advocate at Young Women's Freedom Center, and I live in District 5. I am, I am in support of the Care First Jail Last, and I am speaking on agendas items 10, 11, and 13. We urge the board to reject both reports and agenda items 10 and 11. We support Supervisor Allenberg's referral laid out in agenda items 13 to stop the new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13. That includes input from system impacted people every step of the way. We ask the board to decarcerate, re-innovate, and reimagine public safety. Our community doesn't need any more jails. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel Zapian. Please accept the unmute to begin. Daniel, your mic should be open. Um, there may be a technical issue. I will come back to him, but his mic should be open. Uh, our next speaker is Jeremy Barus. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. This is Jeremy Barus, Senior Policy and Organizing Manager with Amigos de Guadalupe, Center for Justice and Empowerment, and also a member of the Si Se Puede Collective and Real Coalition. I'm asking the county to not move forward with the building of another jail. We need to invest in jail depopulation solutions that address the root issues that fill incarceration, like housing, treatment, and non-carceral mental health support. Not building a new jail and instead investing public funds into health care and social safety net services would be taking a stand for people and families who need and deserve care, not cages. Incarceration is harmful to the health of human beings and our community. Our jail and practices within the jail are inhumane, unsafe, and only further deepen racial health disparities. So in closing, I ask the Board of Supervisors to take a stand and not to move forward with the building of another jail. Our next speaker is Claire Courtright. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon. My name is Claire Courtright and I'm a staff attorney in the health program at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley and a member of the Care First Jail Last Co Coalition. The Law Foundation is a legal services nonprofit that advocates for the rights of historically excluded individuals, included in, including incarcerated individuals in Santa Clara County jails. Our agency has worked in the jail in the acute psychiatric unit. We urge you to vote against proceeding with the construction of a new jail today. The county executive's report and recommendations fail utterly to consider alternatives to a new jail in good faith, as we wrote to you in detail in November. This county disproportionately incarcerates people of color and vastly disproportionately incarcerates mental health consumers. A new maximum security jail perpetuates and enables those injustices. We know that uh, we are looking to you for progressive leadership here today uh, and we support Su Supervisor Ellenberg's recommendation. Our next speaker is Xavier Espana. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Xavier Espana. I'm a member of Silicon Valley Debug. I am a local in District 1. I am in support of the Care First JLS Coalition, and I am speaking on the agenda items number 10, 11, and 13. We urge the board to reject both reports and agenda items number 10 and 11, and support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral laid out in agenda item number 13 to stop the new jail, and invest the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item number 13 that includes input from safety from system impacted people every step of the way we ask the board to decarcerate renovate and reimagine public safety while incarcerated myself in elmwood i seen someone who was handcuffed with his hands behind his back get slammed into a wall knee in the face and have about five different ceos put their knees on his back and neck in the hallway outside of a pod behind the visiting room when my mother asked what was happening i lied because I didn't want to worry her more than she already was. Jail is not a place for rehabilitation or humanity, which is solidified. Our next speaker is Mishi Ellingson. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, this is Mishi with Democratic Socialists of America. I'm a District 3 homeowner, uh, Supervisor Lee. We all want the same things. We want to be safe and we want to reduce crime. Incarceration does not work. In the United States, we have the highest incarceration rates in human history. If jails worked, we would have no crime. Diversion programs such as victim-centered restorative justice do reduce crime and reduce recidivism. Build a new jail and it will be filled instead of addressing root causes of crime such as inequity and access to resources. We have criminalized poverty, drug, sex, and mental health crises. These should not be crimes. Do not spend good money after bad. We need a new way forward. If this is a democracy, you will listen to your constituents and support care, not cages. Thank you. Our next speaker is Derek. Please accept the unmute to begin. Derek, can you, there you go. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi there, my name is Derek. I'm an organizer with Sacred Hearts Rex Committee, a member of SEIU Local 521 and a resident in District 2. I am calling to say no to agenda items 10, 11, and yes to item 13 brought forward by Supervisor Ellenberg in solidarity with the overwhelming cloud of voices from faith, labor, community organizers, education, public health, 
elected officials and public officials alike. I and many members of Local 521 have lost or have loved ones who are impacted by the criminal punishment system and are being separated from their families uh, and communities while they await trial as we speak. The state of California and Texas, where the JFK has done similar work, I might add, have decided to close prisons in late 2021, partly because of the reduction in population as a result of investing in community alternatives. Lack of innovation, not the absence of one jail, will be the cause of it. Our next speaker is Molly McLeod. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Molly McLeod, and I am speaking in favor of Supervisor Ellenberg's um, referral for strengthening the community support system. Um, I am a mother of uh, my son who was incarcerated, um, and I've spoken about that before. For me, this goes to um, disability as, as a centering, um, the need to provide services so that people are not locked up and and um, I, um, Chair Wasserman, I, I really um, noticed your use of the word crippling early on um, in the context of dis disaster service workers and um, it not having enough resources. And I think that um, our ableism and racism is so deeply entwined that we cannot um, look at alternatives because we're so used to incarceration culture. And so I joined Surge at Sacred Heart because I wanted to look within and make changes. Our next speaker is Caleb Zerger. Please accept the unmute to begin. Caleb, can you accept it? There you go. Hi. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Caleb Zerger. I'm a, a Stanford student. Um, and I would also yeah, like to speak okay. against uh, the building of a new jail. I mean, so I like many speakers before, and I'm sure probably even uh board members have uh you know have, have loved ones who have struggled with uh mental health and uh with substance abuse and opiate addiction um and i think when when someone is close to you when you care about them you know that the absolute last thing that they need is incarceration like they need systems of support and no one would like would prioritize sending a loved one to jail and so when i hear these these plans being talked about that says oh well there will be you know, hundreds or thousands of people struggling with these issues incarcerated. Mm -hmm. uh, I and we have to just accept that. I feel like it's it's asking people to accept something that most people would really not accept for their loved ones. And we have to think about uh, why we think that some communities should accept this. Uh, thank you. Our next speaker is Yoli. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, I'm an organizer at Debug in support of the Care First Jail Last Coalition. We urge the board to support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral in agenda item number 13 to stop the new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item number 13 that includes input from the system impacted people every step of the way. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. As an organizer at Debug who supports families that leave that have loved ones inside. We see the harm and fear that they live with, especially in these unknown times with this pandemic. Our community does not need another jail, but to look into alternatives that focus on what individuals truly need. Let's stop failing the community and let's show that we care. Thank you. Our next speaker is Caitlin N. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi there, uh, my name is Caitlin Nyman. I live in District 5 and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart Community Service. Um, in 2020, this board declared racism to be a public health crisis. And today I'm asking you to demonstrate your commitment to dismantling systems of oppression by supporting Supervisor Ellenberg's referral to improve public safety by expanding behavioral health care and alternatives to pre-trial incarceration and to oppose agenda items number 10 and 11. Even if our county has a comparatively low uh, incarceration rate compared to the rest of the state, we still incarcerate more people than any other industrialized nation. And those people who are incarcerated are disproportionately black, brown, and poor. Our country, our county will spend $247 million this year on jail staffing and operating costs. This will not reduce crime in our county, nor will it make our community safer. And in fact, our sheriff's department, who as of last week is under investigation for human rights abuses, uh, will be in charge of that facility, and that sounds pretty unsafe for the affected population. Um, I urge you to reject Jeff Smith's fear-mongering that we need a new high-security facility. I have questions. 
Our next speaker is Jose Valle. Please accept the unmute to begin. Jose, can you accept the unmute? Hey, how you doing? There you go. All right, this is Jose Valle, yeah. Silicon Valley debug, care first, jail never. The Board of Supervisors, County Council and Administration have a great deal of pressure today. This pressure will be telling of who or what these individuals represent every day moving forward as our representatives. Will their vote to ref will their vote reflect the constituents of this county who overwhelmingly do not want to build a new jail and support efforts to decrease the jail population and fund alternatives? Or will their vote reflect other interests that will not stop the inhumanity of those behind the walls? and it will only make their oppression a commodity. Our next speaker is Cynthia Longs. Please accept the unmute to begin. And your mic is open, Cynthia. Hello, my name is Cynthia Longs. I'm a voter in District 1. I am a system impacted family member, Oops. a member of Care First Jail Last Commission and a debug advocate, can you hear me? Shoot, one moment. What happened, can you hear me? We, I'm sorry, we have two mics open. I thought that Mr. Vaya had finished, but he did have a few more seconds. Mr. Vaya, if you could hold for just one moment and I'll, well, yikes, I'm so sorry. One moment. Um, Jose, if you could pause for just a moment. And Cynthia, if you could go ahead and finish, and then Jose, I'll come back to you. I thought you were finished. Thank you, Peggy. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I urge the board to reject uh, both the reports and agenda items 10 and 11. These reports are unstudied and faulty. I urge the board to support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral and agenda item 13 to stop the building of a new jail and invest in the community and the county alternatives to incarceration. My son was overcharged and he's in the main jail. He has communicated to me some of the inhumane treatment in jail. And I am aware of other things that he has not told me because he does not want to worry me. This has happened during COVID and prior to COVID. Remember the people in jail are innocent until proven guilty. The folks inside nor the community wants a new jail. A new jail will not help the mentally ill who need the help, who need help that they, they are not getting the help inside, nor will it fix the racist treatment of those inside. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. I oppose a new jail along with- And going back to Jose Valle. Jose, I'm unmuting you again. Um, I think, did you have additional comments and we cut you off? All right. No, no. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you uh, you coming back to me, but I, I did uh, finish what I had to say. I appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nathan Alsh. Um, please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon, Board President Wasserman and Board of Supervisors. My name is Nathan Olsh, the Director of Policy and Operations at the San Jose Downtown Association, serving over 1,800 business members. This is a very pressing and important item for us and our downtown in San Jose as we discuss public safety and mental health every day. As we supported Supervisor Ellenberg and Lee's referral on January 11th, declaring a drug and mental health crisis, we would like to be sure that the county is consistent and coordinating with partners in its investment in our community, which includes behavioral health facilities and leveraging current and new services affecting those with mental illness. Otherwise, a jail becomes a revolving door of endless trips behind bars. Our business community, employees, residents, visitors encounter behavioral health issues on our streets and community constantly and on a daily basis, and we need to do more to help these folks. We look forward to further information and dialogue and appreciate the leadership of our county board. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lourdes Best. Please accept the unmute to begin. Lourdes, can you accept the unmute? Yes, hi. Um, Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Lourdes Best. I'm a community organizer with Silicon Valley and also a past 
um, family member participant. My fa family ended up at Debug by helping to advocate for my brother's case while he was facing a case in Santa Clara County. I am writing to support Supervisors Ellenberg's referral under item 13. I'm not in agreement with building a new jail and that the county explores alternative to incarceration. Placing people in cages is counterproductive. When a parent has become incarcerated, the entire family becomes impacted. My niece and nephew still deal with the impacts of my brother's incarceration, although he's home. We have to bear witness to the hidden consequences that develop in children who have a parent behind bars, such as behavioral problems and depression, to name a few. You have the decision to make your county a better place without the need for a new jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christopher Logan. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Chris Logan and I'm the organizing manager at Sacred Heart Community Service. Um, and I'm joining the great cloud of witnesses supporting the reinvestment from incarceration system into community driven supports. Um, the staff person providing the presentation was incorrect when he said that our county has been at the forefront of incarceration innovation. We are significantly behind other counties in California that have made significant investments in alternatives to incarceration. As a black man, I know that my people are disproportionately incarcerated relative to population, and the same is true of my Latino vecinos. It is important to me that we are not continuously building monuments of the oppression of myself and my people. As a voter, I'm watching to see if the supervisor, supervisors will follow through with their commitment to addressing the systemic causes of racism like incarceration. I support Supervisor Ellenberg's memo to the board and oppose any plans to build a new jail in our county. Our next speaker is Lena Nguyen. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello. Your mic is open. Hi, my name is Lena Nguyen and I live in District 2. I'm here today with Saren in support of item 13 on the agenda. We need to create a non-carceral alternative to address the root issues that fuel incarceration. No new jail mean, doesn't mean no accountability. Folks inside are calling for a more effective and humane approach to accountability, healing, prevention, and restorative justice. We urge the board to invest in the community and the people. And that means investing in the health and the well-being of the community, which also includes those who are incarcerated. The board should halt plans for a new jail and invest in community. No on agenda items 10 and 11, and yes on item number 13. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Lesser. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi. My name is Sarah Lesser, and I am a social worker and school counselor um, at Kahila Jewish High School in Palo Alto. And um, I am a member of Ben the Ark, Jews for Social Justice and the Care First Jails Last Coalition. And I wanted to um, urge the supervisors to vote no on building a new jail um, and yes on 13 and support Ellenberg's um, proposal to fund mental health care. Um, working with youth who have had families in, um, in prison, I understand how devastating it can be to, um, to whole communities. And I really wanna encourage supervisors to put money towards preventative services to keep people out of jails. Thank you so much for your time. Our next speaker is Danny Salas. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Danny Salas. Um, I'm here with the Stanford Decriminalization Coalition and the Baller Stanford with the Care for Jail Last, Co Last Coalition. I live in District 5. I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. Last year, homicides in St. Louis dropped by 25%, and at the same time, the budget for a jail was zeroed, and alternative forms of public safety were supported and invested in. A new jail won't make anybody safer, especially not the actual people trapped there. Investing in our communities with mental health support, housing, and health care will make everybody safer. I urge you not to support items 10 and 11 and to support 13. Today, you will be choosing whether Santa Clara the County's future is in locking away real humans in their lives or in supporting our community. I hope you make the right choice. Thank you. Our next speaker is Arabella. Please accept the unmute to begin. And your mic is open. 
Hi, my name is Arabella Guevara. I am part of the Young Women's Freedom Center. I am a local voter, live and work in District 2. I'm in support of the Care First, Jail Last Coalition, and I'm speaking on agenda items number 10, 11, and 13. We urge the board to reject both reports in agenda items number 10 and 11 and support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral laid out in agenda item number 13 to stop the new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda number 13. That includes input from system impacted people every step of the way. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Thank you. Our next speaker is M. Horst. Please accept the M. Newt to begin. Uh, one moment. M., please accept the M. Newt to begin speaking. Hello, my name is M. Horst, and I live and work in Supervisor Semedian's district. I echo the overwhelming, and I believe thus far, unanimous consensus of fellow voters who have spoken today in urging the board to oppose items 10 and 11 and to pass the actions put forward by Supervisor Ellenberg on agenda item 13. Um, as a transgender person, I've seen firsthand the effects of the intersectional character of marginalization on the people I care about. Even in today's earlier presentations, we've seen the perverse incentives associated with new jails. When conditions limit available beds, the county executive has shown great success at executing alternatives to imprisonment. Building a new jail will directly financially motivate imprisonment over alternatives to incarceration, um, alternatives such as those presented in agenda item 13 that can improve outcomes for people who have been booked, that can ameliorate the well being of your citizens, and that cost less than jailing in the long term. Um, I think we've seen an abundance of evidence from the, the hundreds of people who are speaking today, and I emphatically oppose the construction of a new jail and cede the rest of my time. Our next speaker is Jose Servin. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, board. My name is Jose Servin, and I'm the director of organizing at SIREN, the Services, Immigrant Rights, and Education Network. I'm here today to stand strongly against any proposal to create a new jail in our community. Incarceration is a disastrous practice that separates families and perpetuates harm against those that need help the most. We must expand our imaginations beyond cages. Santa Clara County residents need housing, we need hospitals, and we need services, not an expansion of the failed practice of incarceration, regardless what the numbers say. I urge you to listen to those here today and commit to proven effective solutions not rooted in the punitive carceral system um, by voting yes on board member Ellenberg's item number 13. And I see the rest of my time. Our next speaker is Rupiti. Please accept the unmute to begin. Uh, hello, can you hear me? We can. Hi, my name is Rupini. I live in District 5. I'm speaking today in support of decarceration, investment in community-based alternatives, and no new jail. Uh, as you know, the current jail system has been plagued with corruption and cruelty, killing Michael Tyree and Andrew Hogan, and causing deplorable living conditions for all jail residents. Some people, like today's presenters, have tried to exploit this suffering to justify a new jail, but there is no evidence that a new jail wouldn't recreate the same culture of cruelty and neglect that is inherent to the racist carceral system. We know that the real problems faced by our most vulnerable communities need solutions like permanent supportive housing and freely available mental health and addiction recovery services, not incarceration. Instead of pouring hundreds of millions of dollars investing in more cruelty, please follow the wisdom of system impacted individuals to create effective and humane solutions to addressing harm in our Our next speaker is Carmen Brammer. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Carmen Brammer and I'm a member of uh, Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet, The Real Coalition, and I reside in District 2. I urge the board to halt plans for the new jail and invest in the community county alternative to incarceration process item number 13. Our jail systems are racist. In 2021, the board declared that racism is a public health crisis. Therefore, the board needs to live up to this and decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Our county has a unique opportunity to not continue with the status quo of incarceration and instead explore and invest in community alternatives and mental health services. A majority of Santa Clara County residents do not support a new jail, and I find it frustrating that we continue to waste time and money with this process. I request the board to do your job and listen to us. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is William, Ar William Armaline. Please accept the unmute to begin. William, can you end? Accept, there you go. And your mic is open. Bill Armaline, and I'm the director of the San Jose State University Human Rights Institute, criminal justice chair for the NAACP of San Jose and Silicon Valley, member of Silicon Valley Debug, and I live and work in District 2. I'm in support of the Care First GLS Coalition, speaking on agenda items 10, 11, and 13. We urge the board to reject both reports and agenda item numbers 10 and 11 and support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral laid out on agenda item 13 to stop the new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13 that includes input from system impacted people every step of the way. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Uh, we've also submitted letters uh, from HRI and NAACP, have spoken to many of the members, uh, and as usual, uh, members and, and members of the community should feel free to contact us at any time with questions concerning our recommendation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aram James. Please accept the unmute to begin. Aram, there you go. Yes, this is Aram James. I'm a retired public defender. I'm also a, a retired organizer from uh, Debug. A uh, supporter of debug, a member of the Coalition for Justice and Accountability, say no to a new jail. I sent you all a letter uh, that was directed to Joe Semidian. I live in Palo Alto. That was titled yesterday in the Daily Post, vote no, 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 no on a new jail. What Dr. Austin didn't tell you is it's costing $400,000 a year in Rikers Island. And guess who's number two? Santa Clara County, $100,000. Uh, uh, per inmate per year. That was 400,000 per inmate per year in New York City. What has it done for us? We have 2 million inmates in this country, but what we don't tell people is we have 600,000 inmates that are released onto the streets every year without adequate services or rehabilitation, which makes us less safe, not more safe. Joe, I need you to vote no. Cindy, no. Our next speaker is Kathy Mattingly. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, I'm Kathy Mattingly, District 4, in opposition to items 10 and 11 and in favor of Supervisor Ellenberg's referral number 13. I am Social Ministries liaison between my parish and over 50 parishes in the Diocese of San Jose. We feed the unhoused, provide meals for Catholic Charities Refugee Program, form Catholic Mental Health Ministries, facilitate courses in racial healing, equity, and justice, seek shelter and housing crisis solutions, as well as promoting the restorative justice response to repairing harms to victims, rehabilitating offenders to provide restitution to victims, and to become productive members of society. This decision intersects strongly with all of these issues. Alternatives can and do make a difference in the near term as well as in the future. We can do better, we can find ways to rehabilitate inmates and to keep the next generation out of jail by providing meaningful access to education, opportunity, and justice. Our next speaker is Anna Malara Glenn. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, this is Anna. I work at Sacred Heart Community Service and represent my husband and daughters as residents in Bodas in District 1. I urge you supervisors again to halt plans for a new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13 that includes input from system impacted people every step of the way. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate and reimagine public safety. These public comments today echo op-ed pieces over the past few weeks by Aaron Zisser, Dr. Mars Abari, Jekla Doris Cordell, Gardner Health Services, SV Debug, and Ujima Adult and Family Services. The list of supporting organizations on the Care First landing page includes faith communities, scholars, doctors, community organizations, and direct service providers. There is overwhelming support from your constituents to halt the building of the new jail and instead invest those funds in alternatives to incarceration for the care and good of Santa Clara County. Do your duty, supervisors. Vote no on 10 and 11. Our next speaker is Darcy Green. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Darcy Green. 
I'm the chair of the County of Santa Clara Race and Health Disparities Community Board. Our board was asked to make recommendations to the Board of Supervisors regarding race-based health disparities. And at our January 19th meeting, our board authorized the writing of a letter to you in support of Vice President Ellenberg's referral. Our board believes an investment of public dollars into, a, into building a new jail would perpetuate racial inequality and race-based health disparities, especially in health care delivery, as well as in health outcomes for individuals linked with the county justice system. Racial inequality can be seen in every aspect of the criminal justice system and the overrepresentation of Black and Latinx residents in our county jail system creates a direct link between incarceration and racial health disparity. National solutions call for decarceration and alternatives to policing and expanded access to behavioral health treatment are effective strategies for eliminating health-based race disparity. Health disparity, thank you. Our next speaker is Gordon Frischlad. Please accept the mute to begin. Gordon, can you accept the unmute? There you go. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Great. Uh, my name is Gordon. I'm a resident of Sunnyvale and a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. The state of incarceration in this country is in dire need of reform, and in this county, uh, more so. Uh, there are far more people in jail than their particularly crime warrants and before they have even been convicted. The cost of incarcerating so many is exorbitant. It disrupts their lives so harshly that it makes nearly impossible to ever regain a semblance of typical life with home and job, again, let alone medical treatment. If you build a new jail, it will be used filled with people who don't need to be there, halting recovery and rehabilitation, dividing families, disrupting lives. I'm urging the board to halt all plans for a new jail and instead invest in community alternatives to our incarceration via the process laid out on agenda item 13 that includes in input from people impacted by the carceral system. Also, shame on you, Jeff Smith, for dropping such so much new info on the same day as an important vote. You had 15 months to come up with methods and cost estimates, and not only did you not do that, but you misrepresented the data and costs. You did not collect any drugs. Next speaker is Brad Matson. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Vicki Matson, and I'm a voter in District 1. I'm a member of Surge and Orchard City Indivisible. I'm urging the board to uphold your stated commitment to racial justice and do what is both fiscally and morally responsible by halting plans for CEO Smith's new jail and voting in support of Supervisor Ellenberg's referral. I fully support investment in alternatives to incarceration, especially treatment programs for addiction and other mental health issues. As a volunteer at Salinas Valley State Prison, I have spoken to so many system impacted people whose stories represent our failure to provide community care and non-carceral interventions, especially for people of color. Do not continue to support the false narrative that jails make our community safer. President Wasserman, I ask you to represent me with your vote. Our next speaker is Michelle. Please accept the unmute to begin. Michelle, can you accept the unmute? Hi, my name is Michelle Coleman. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and Indivisible San Jose. I originally became an activist because I was horrified at America's system of mass incarceration. Recently, the issue turned unexpectedly personal to me. A young man in my family was arrested during a mental health crisis in LA County, which has a robust alternatives to incarceration program. He is now in a community-based treatment program, healing and rebuilding his life. Jail is a place of violence and trauma, not a place of recovery and care. Another world is possible. It's time for our county to join LA, Sacramento, San Diego, and Alameda counties in building that better world. I urge the board, board to vote yes on exploring alternatives to incarceration. As a final note, I was appalled at Jim Austin's insinuation that all of the people charged with violent felonies will be convicted. Our next speaker is Pamela Emanuel. Please accept the unmute to begin. Yes, hi, my name is Pamela Emanuel and I'm speaking today as a system impacted family member as well as a member of the jail coalition. 
Um, I urge the Board of Supervisors to vote yes on item 13 and no on items 10 and 11, which recommends building a new jail. My brother, um, he awaited a trial for three plus years and was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison for a crime that he did not commit. I also have family members who and loved ones who have been inside the walls of Santa Clara County, um, and they have walked out of there with more mental health issues than they did prior to entering. However, um, you know, there are many stories similar to mine regarding our failed justice system. It costs 60, over $60,000 uh, to house our loved ones inside Santa Clara County, and 88% of those are simply awaiting their trial. That is... Um, Harvard's education tuition. I highly advise Sacramento. I highly advise you all uh, to vote against building the new jail and follow SAC and LA um, and invest in the community. Our next speaker is Megan Swift. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Megan Swift and I live in Vote in District 4. I'm a member of Surge in La Mesa Verde, an organization that works to feed families in San Jose. President Wasserman, I was moved by your November 16th recognition of 67 community-based organizations who, in your words, stretched and sacrificed their organizational capacity to heroically serve the most vulnerable members of our community. Do you remember? Imagine what community-based groups could do while working with Santa Clara County for decarceration. Your previous presenters talked about crime as though it's inevitable. Services, education, and housing make communities safe. Access to mental health care and access to addiction services makes a community safe. Jails fracture families, fracture communities, and do not fix the underlying causes of crime. Please haul plans for the new jail. Invest in the alternatives to incarceration process in Agenda Item 13. Please decarcerate renovate, reimagine public safety, reject reports in 10 and 11, and Jeff Smith, do better. Our next speaker is Sandra Asher. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon, my name is Sandra Asher. I'm a voter in President Wasserman's district, a board member at Parents Helping Parents and Community Solutions, and a member of Surge. As a disabled woman with an autistic child who has significant mental health challenges, I support the Care First Coalition because people with disabilities have a 43% chance of arrest and a disproportionate risk falls on young black men. Mental illness and disability are not crimes. I urge you to vote against the prison industrial complex and invest in the alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13. Sacramento had two consent decrees, yet the Board of Supervisors voted twice against the construction of a new jail. Our county is the seat of innovation. Let's innovate and reimagine public safety. On June 2020, this board adopted the Black Lives Matter resolution. Were these just words or will your actions match your rhetoric? Thank you. Our next speaker is Emma Hartung. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi. Um, my name is Emma Hartung. I um, am a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and Malaya Movement. I live in District 2. I work in District 5. Um, and I'm calling on you to vote against the jail and yes on Speaker Ellenberg's proposal for, for alternatives to incarceration. I know too many people who've been faced with jail and prison time um, when what they really needed was support and resources in their communities, not through a carceral system. We know that when jails are built, they'll be filled, um, which will traumatize Santa Clara residents who are incarcerated there, so much so that even focus groups inside the deteriorating jail do not want to build a new one. We need healing and resources for Santa Clara County that happen in our communities, not inside jails. And we need to be led by the most impacted people as agenda item 13 has been. So please listen to your constituents, vote no on 10 and 11 and no to a new jail and yes on item 13. Thanks so much. Our next speaker is Heather Cleary. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, this is Heather Cleary, CEO of Peninsula Family Service and a member the Real Coalition. I am asking the county not to move forward with building another jail. I support Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal to initiate a community dialogue about and study of community-based alternatives to incarceration and to expand funding, funding for behavioral health treatment outside of jail. Not building a new jail and instead investing public funds into healthcare and social safety net services would be taking a stand for people and families and children who need and deserve care and who you have sworn to represent. Please listen to the community. The comments are clear. 
Your community does not support this jail. Fund the community, don't punish it. Thank you. Next speaker is Gabby Travis Lopez. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Gabby Chavez Lopez, um, and I'm from the Latina Coalition of Silicon Valley, and I'm also a member of the Real Coalition. I, too, on behalf of myself and our members, are here to ask the county not to move forward with the building of another jail. I support County Supervisor Allenberg's proposal to initiate a community dialogue and a study of community-based alternatives to incarceration. Currently, Latinx residents are overrepresented in the county jail by nearly twofold and Black residents by nearly fourfold compared to their percentage in the county overall. We must do better. I'm going to use the remainder of my time to also address this process as I have been waiting as a, as a nonprofit leader and as a, as a single mother um, almost an entire workday to be able to give my uh, my input. It is a privilege that I that I probably don't share with most of the people that I represent. And I would just like there to be a better process for giving public comment. Thank you so much. And let me know if I can be of any service. Our next speaker is EWG from Surge. Can you hear me? Yep. We can. Hello, my name is Diana Rundler. I am part of showing up for racial justice at Sacred Heart and part of the, the Care First Coalition. I'm going to, about two years ago, I was walking down the street and I saw a man lying on the sidewalk. So I called to get him medical attention and the 911 operator asked me what to do because this she didn't know. Building this new jail will cost over $300 million and maintaining it and staffing it will cost hundreds of thousands of more dollars. We need to invest that money in the community support services in mental health services and in, in, in recovery services. So I am um, asking the board to vote um, not to build a new jail. So no on 10 and 11 and yes on 13. Thank you. Our next speaker is Samuel TM. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Sammy. I'm with Silicon Valley Debug. Um, no new jail, yes to alternatives to incarceration as lined out in Supervisor Ellen Bird's referral under item 13. Um, I want to make sure that uh, we are listening to our community members <clears throat> who are currently or, and formerly incarcerated and their families above all else. Um, they are the leaders in this movement. And I want to personally thank all the system impacted community members who've spoken up today um, for their leadership. Uh, personally, I, I really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, Board of Supervisors, if you're truly in solidarity with the Black, Brown, and low income people of our community, invest in services, housing, education, and healthcare. Not a new jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nahar. Please accept the unmute to begin. Yeah. Um, hi, this is Nihar Agarwal, and I'm a member of Racial Equity and Community Safety, or Rex, would take our community services, and I'm a resident of District 5. I'm calling to say no to agenda items 10 and 11. We urge the board to haul plans for a new jail and invest in the community through alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item 13 that includes input from system impacted people every step of the way. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. When we talk to our communities, we hear this over and over and over again. Jails do not solve any problems, they don't help our communities, and they certainly don't increase our most basic sense of community safety. Opportunities to decarcerate and actually care for our community members is the only way to move forward in how we reimagine our communities and move closer to a future where we're all safer. What we need to do is um, center our, our community members in these discussions as the alternatives and incarceration work plan proposed in agenda item 13 would do. Our next speaker is Kevin from Surge. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi. My name is Kevin Keller. I'm a member of Surge at Secret Heart, and I live in District 1. I am a white passing Latino man, and though I haven't been directly impacted by our legal system, I have seen how it has disproportionately impacted my community. I urge you to listen to the voices of the people who are impacted. Four out of the five focus groups inside the jail were not in favor of building a replacement jail, and they're the ones who are most impacted. How can you justify doubling down on this system? We have spent over $100,000 a year in staffing and operating costs to have someone in jail. How much better 
would our community be if we spent that on youth programs or child care services? Both proven approaches to improving the well being of people and reducing crime. I urge the board to halt plans for a new jail and invest in community alternatives to incarceration as laid out in agenda item 13 that includes input from our system impacted people every step of the way. I ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paco. Please accept the unmute to begin. Paco, your mic should be open. Uh, but that looks like there might be a technical issue. I will come back to him. Uh, our next speaker is Linda Bookman. Please accept the unmute to begin. I am a public health nurse with Surge and a 30 year county resident committed to the idea of justice for all. I've been on this call since 9.30 a.m. When, when all of you spoke those last three words at the end of the Pledge of Allegiance, justice for all. We've been listening to public comment for over two hours and I encourage you to notice and ask, where are the comments from supporters of 10 and 11? Perhaps there are none because they perpetuate an unjust system of incarceration that is outdated and needs reimagining. With respect to Mr. Austin's illustrious career advising on biased systems, I recommend Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt's groundbreaking book, Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice that Shapes What We See, Think, and Do. Chapter five, how free people think is of particular importance on this issue. Please have the courage to respect system impacted people, which I would argue is all of us, and take a new route in public safety. Yes on 13. Our next speaker is Aaron O'Brien. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon, Aaron O'Brien of Community Solutions. The issues before you today are fundamental to who we are and who we want to be. Do we want to be a community that jails are mentally ill rather than providing them treatment in the most appropriate environment? Do we want to be a community that is willing to support a carceral system that disproportionately harms people of color? Do we want to be a community that supports the multi-generational trauma to families caused by incarceration and separation? A couple of years ago, our country collectively seemed to be putting a stake in the ground, saying that status quo was no longer acceptable and that we were committed to making serious changes for racial and social justice. I worry that that has become lip service across the country, but in Santa Clara County, we now have the opportunity to stand behind what we said mattered. A jail and the justice system are just a part of the whole, but an essential microcosm of the society we want. I stand in support of Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal. Our next speaker is Steph. Please accept the unmute to begin. Steph, can you accept the unmute? She is not responding, so we will come back. Uh, our next speaker is Colin Connors. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Cool. Um, I've been hearing uh, during this Board of Supervisors meeting, I've been hearing uh, several public speakers from the Sacred Heart organization offering public comment during this meeting. I find it funny since there's an item on the agenda to tr grant a $350,000 contract with Sacred Heart for Services. Can the Board of Supervisors Ah, a board of supervisors address this total conflict of interest during this meeting? Or do we have to submit a public records request to figure out the cabal between the board of supervisors and Sacred Heart? Oh, on the subject of jail, build it. Build two. There are too many poor and middle class families working hard in San Jose to feed their families, all the while you're releasing inmates into the communities through the covered measures. People, get a clue. Stop releasing felons back onto the streets to rob and kill the same people that vote for you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Desiree Victor. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Desiree Victor and I'm the director of the Young Women's Freedom Center in Santa Clara County. The organization behind supporting the county's public initiative to get to zero girls incarcerated 
in supporting women, girls, and transgender non-conforming youth that are navigating the system. I say this because we currently have zero women, girls, and transgender non-conforming youth in custody in Santa Clara County at this time. This serves as an example that investing in community instead of mass incarceration has significant and positive outcomes for our community. I'm a local voter living and working District 2. I'm an advocate for our most marginalized communities, including those that have been most impacted by the criminal justice system. I have experienced the impacts of investing in mass incarceration. It tears families apart, causes significant trauma and harm, pushing communities as a whole further into poverty and away from thriving. Building a new jail is not addressing the issue, but rather sustaining it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Melissa. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Melissa and I am a member of Debug. I am here to reject both reports and ag agenda items number 10 and 11 and support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral laid out in agenda 13. Um, we ask the board to decarcerate, renovate and reimagine public safety, decarcerate to create space to renovate. People who have been to Elmwood um, before prefer barrack living. Sounds like those who want a new jail are out of touch with life and have political interest and not um, to those on the inside or closest to the issue. I've heard so many times that the facility is inhumane, but what truly is inhumane is having your freedom taken to be confined is inhumane, especially for years and years. Being sent to prison from our jails is inhumane. It's inhumane not to explore all alternatives before confining somebody. It's inhumane that someone who is confined may never ever hug. Our next speaker is Karen Matsueda. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Karen Matsueda. I live in District 2 and I'm a member of Surge and the Care First Coalition. I have lived the very real trauma inflicted by the criminal justice system through my brother's struggles with mental illness. As a family member and as a person of faith, I value restoration and reconciliation, neither of which are the focus or the outcome of our jail system. I also support the work plan for alternatives to incarceration and, and oppose plans for any new jail. This is not wide-eyed Pollyannic dreaming. A new jail might slightly reduce the depths of harm until the new jail also decays and it will. To continue to invest in punishment and human warehousing perpetuates a system that does not create community safety or restoration. We perpetuate what we invest in. This is a once in a generation opportunity to invest in new ways to create public health and safety for the broader community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kevin Ma. Please accept the unmute to begin. Afternoon, supervisors. My name is Kevin Ma. I live in D5 Mountain View. And I like to thank the board for previous actions in favor of mental health. As we know, you've approved a psychiatric hospital in Sunnyvale. You will be having a discussion item on mobile crisis response team expansion into the West Valley slash West County, which is an indication that, you know, even for regular people, mental health resources are very hard to find in this county. And as such, we should be also investing the same kind of resources into our criminal justice system so that people can be intervened before, you know, locking them, locking them up inside a concrete room. So I do wish to see the county actually put resources into these alternatives that, you know, could actually address the root causes that led to the situation that caused the incident. So uh, thank you for listening to the voices. Thank you. Our next speaker is Becky Moskowitz. Please accept the unmute to begin. Becky, can you, there you yeah. go. Um, my name is Becky Moskowitz and I live in San Jose and I'm an attorney with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. We all want to live in a community in which all members have housing and access to the care they need to stay well, regardless of race. Building a new jail will siphon enormous sums into a carceral system that exacerbates racial disparities, causes trauma, and destabilizes individuals' and families' lives. This is particularly true when our sheriff's department is rife with corruption and uh, has caused 
numerous incidents of physical violence. In my work as a patient's rights advocate within the main jail, I have seen firsthand how this punitive setting leads to poor mental health outcomes, increasing the likelihood that individuals will have difficulty reintegrating upon release. It is clear from the community engagement process that our county is eager for change. Non-carceral alternatives that promote racial equity and support mental health, such as expanding our next speaker is Anna, A N A. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Anna Zeiger. I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart, and I live and vote in District 5. As a young person, I want a future where you invest in this community and divest from putting people in cages. Thriving communities have resources, not jails. And in front of me, I have a list of 55 community organizations who have written in firm support of this fact and care deeply that the board vote yes on item 13 and no on 10 and 11. I will shout out as many as possible in the next 20 seconds. The CSIP with the Collective, Civil Rights Corps, Vera Institute of Justice, Silicon Valley Climate Action Now, Alphabet Workers Union, Los Altos for Racial Equity, Los Gatos Anti-Racism Coalition, Bill Wilson Center, Community Solutions, Project Safety Net, Community Health Partnership, West Valley Community Services, Pathway Society. Our next speaker is Alexis Roman. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, open. my name is Alexis, and I'm a member of the Young Women's Freedom Center, and I live in District 4. I'm in support of the Care for Still uh, Last Coalition, and I'm speaking on agenda items 10, 11, and 13. We urge the board to reject both reports and agenda items number 10 and 11, and to support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral laid out in agenda item number 13 to stop the new jail and to invest in those community-based alternatives to incarceration laid out in agenda item 13 that includes input from systems impacted people every step of the way. Community-based alternatives to incarceration are critical to addressing the current needs of those most impacted, those incarcerated and their families, while continuing to prohibit the construction of a new jail that's not the answer to supporting those most impacted. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Our next speaker is Emily Hendon. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Emily Hendon, and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart. I live and vote in District 4, and I'm in support of the Care First Coalition. I'm showing up today to plead with you to do the right thing and vote against building another jail. Please take this opportunity to take a meaningful stand against our racist system of mass incarceration. We do not need a 500 bed new jail. Instead, we need to invest in non-carceral facilities for inpatient and outpatient care in Santa Clara County and expand options for behavioral health treatment outside of jail. So please listen to your constituents, uphold your commitment to racial justice and vote no on agenda items 10 and 11. Instead, I strongly urge you to support item 13, Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal to study and propose alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lou Dimes. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, can you hear me? We can. <laughs> Um, yes, I'd like to call and, and say, uh, well, one, I'm president of Black Outreach, and I believe that we should not build a new jail here in Santa Clara County. Uh, everybody in here has been <laughs> kind of overwhelmingly saying that they don't want this built. We know from the statistics, from all the data, that this is something that's not beneficial to the community. This is tons of money that could be put towards mental health services and preventative programs instead of being reactive to these issues that are constantly brought up for reasons as to why we should build a new jail. We need to realize that the things that we've been trying for decades and decades are racist and they don't work in terms of fixing the issues that they've caused and we need to try something different. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Schuler. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
Hi, uh, my name is Karen Schuler, and I'm a voter in Supervisor Wasserman's district, and I'm a member of Orchard City Indivisible, and as well as Together We Will San Jose. I asked the board to chart a true course for reducing the jail population and providing non-carceral alternatives for community safety. Both of my siblings have struggled with addiction and mental health issues, but because we were a family with class and um, resources and privilege, they were able to get the proper treatment and they were able to go on and lead productive lives. This kind of treatment should be available to everyone. We need community-based treatment programs that are free and accessible. I am in support of shutting down the new Santa Clara County Jail and believe that there should be alternatives to incarceration, mental health services, and that address the root causes of crime, poverty, and inequality. Thank you. Our next speaker is E.W. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon. My name is Edie Washington. I am a member of been the art and I live in district four. Today I am here because I'm a mother, a mother of an eight year old black son. And I am extremely concerned for his future. My son is five times more likely to go to jail than his white counterparts, just based on that he's black. Because I understand how vulnerable my son and other people of color are, I have to support and ask you to support Supervisor Ellenberg's proposal for an in-depth study into alternatives that include people from communities most disrupted by the jail system and their allies. Our jail system is broken. No charts or stats will change that fact. Please, let's be intentional in change. Care first, jails last. Our next speaker is Milan Ballantin. Please accept the unmute to begin. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Hello, my name is Milan Ballantin and I represent the voiceless and countless families that have been impacted by the criminal justice broken system. As a community servant leader here at the African American Community Service Agency, also known as AACSA, I support Super Supervisor Ellenberg's memo and do not support building a new jail. We need to invest in the resources and services, which should include more marketing and accessibility with a road, no wrong door approach. This will continue to bend the arc of the moral universe and provide real community safety. And instead of spending so much money on this new jail, let's take new action on using that money to invest in communities in new ways, our local nonprofits, mental health services, economic empowerment, and allowing the community to thrive. Please do the right thing and vote no. Our next speaker is Mohit Mokim. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, I have lived in Santa Clara County, District 5, for the last decade. I graduated from Stanford, was a researcher at the university, and I'm currently a law student at Stanford. I'm deeply committed to promoting true safety for all in Santa Clara, and for that reason, I'm with Abolish Stanford and the Care First Coalition. I find this proposal shameful and disappointing, especially in a supposedly liberal Bay Area County. It is suggested in the presentation that in order to decrease the current jail population, we actually need to build a new jail. It's funny to watch me build the watch me uh, try uh, watch the board of supervisors. Pardon me. Uh, try to fit a square peg through the circular hole. If the county were seriously committed to decreasing the jail population, it would have to be a little bit more imaginative than, for example, James Austin. They'd have to invest, instead of investing in a new jail, invest in funding social health and health, uh, other services. This is a ridiculous proposition, and I implore the supervisors to reject it. Our next speaker is Urvish Kumar Mehta. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you very much to the Board of Supervisors. I wanted to emphasize on two things. First, <clears throat> is the plans <clears throat> is the plans to build a mental health treatment facility for inmates. And second, is the new jail part proposed framework for addressing the needs of a Santa Clara County inmates. Now, both the parts are differentiating from each other as that what our critical need is, is to is to decommission those facilities to improve the living condition for inmates. So we must rather concentrate on the behavioral health services, mental health services, and also as what uh, President of JSA 
organization provided the statistics and what the CEO Jeff Smith has provided the statistics about what are the improvements that has been made and what is the statistical analysis says. However, it is equally important that, that when we have, when we are reducing uh, the facilitation within the jail, it would be equally important to consider to improve the facilities for the behavior. Our next speaker is Jennifer Hughes. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hughes. I'm a psychiatric registered nurse and I've worked for Santa Clara County at Valley Medical Center for almost 10 years. I'm also the vice president of RNPA Nursing Union. I'm pleading with the Board of Supervisors to reject item 10 and 11 and support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral item 13. I've witnessed firsthand the revolving door of people in the mental health system due to the lack of adequate um, in, inadequate mental health services and lack of facilities, this vulnerable population often slips through the cracks. Our system is broken and we need to fix it. Jail is the last place to care for this population and we've neglected the specific needs of these people for a very long time. They often get neglected or mistreated while being incarcerated. I support investments for mental health treatment and expanded substance abuse facilities in the community. Please vote yes on item 13. Our next speaker is Gail Marie. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Gail and I vote no on building a new jail and yes to building better lives for people of all social classes. Um, I am a registered voter since the age of 18, resident of Santa Clara County. I am a white Latina female who has worked the voting poll since the age of 13. I am now 50, as I mentioned, and I have um, had great mentors in life. I, my godfather was Wester Sweet. He was one of the first black attorneys to practice law in San Jose, worked alongside of Cesar Chavez. My aunt, Angelica Tovar, was um, a member of the LULAC Foundation. She helped to start it and K-5 programs for minorities. Uh, the reason why I mentioned this is as I said, they were great mentors and all it took was one mistake and one poor choice for me to become a felon myself. I have been incarcerated in spite of having a college education, being an honor student, ROTC. So I have been inside of Elmwood and I feel that this money would be better used to improving the jails that are already standing, uh, putting filters in the water because the- Our next speaker is Chloe Bacon. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Chloe Bacon and I live and work in Santa Clara County as a supportive housing social worker and I'm a resident of D4. I'm also a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and part of the Care First Jail's last coalition. I am against building a new jail because it diverts money and resources away from investing in one of the primary causes of incarceration, lack of access to mental health treatment and services. Being incarcerated is also one of the most triggering and unhelpful places for someone to be with mental illness. I'm a social worker working with folks that have experienced chronic homelessness, and for so many of them, a period of incarceration, long or short, was one of the main factors that set off their housing instability. For many, incarceration could have been avoided if they had access to quality mental health and substance use care. In addition, many of my clients share that their experiences in jail and prison still affect them today, and manifest in worsened mental health symptoms. No on building a new jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paco Polar. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Paco Polar. Oh, sorry, one second. I'm really sorry about that. Um, my name is Paco Polar. I am a member of the Stanford Decriminalization Coalition. I'm here in solidarity with Abolish Stanford and the Care First Jail Last Coalition. And uh, I would like to speak specifically to the temptation to downplay this as a crisis because it's been normalized in, in this entire country. I'm worried that a lot of the supervisors perceive this issue as something that they're not going to get flack for because it's so normalized and worry that if we do something quote unquote radical, that then that crisis, if something goes wrong, will land on their shoulders. But I want to inform you that based on data from the Bear Institute, Santa Clara County has the highest jail disparity after accounting for demographics for Latinos of any county in all of kind of California. Let me say that again. Of any county in California, Santa Clara County has the highest jail disparity um, racially for Latinos. This is a crisis of ridiculous proportions and very much we are an outlier for doing nothing, not an outlier for doing something. 
Our next speaker is Christy Connors. Please accept the unmute to begin. Christy, can you accept the unmute? Yes, I just got the unmute. Sorry about that. Yeah, hey, I'm here today representing Bay Area Freedom Alliance, and I just wanted to speak about as we have continued to um, lower the penalty for different crimes that are being committed around the state, including the string of robberies, aka flash mobs that are going on, all we're seeing is a rise in crime. Um, police and the, the district attorneys aren't able to process criminals, they're not able to put people in jail, and therefore we've seen a huge rise in crime in the area. It might not be super violent, however, we've continued to make violent crimes less violent, getting people out on the street more quickly. This then turns out to make our communities less safe and crime rises, but it's not being recorded because it's not considered violent or criminal, which is ironic. Vote yes on 10 and 11. Let's build the jail. Let's also continue to contribute money toward the mental health. I noticed it, there has been a lot of CARES money and ARP money that's being put into healthcare. Let's continue to do that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Corinne McIntosh Sacco. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Corinne McIntosh Sacco. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in independent practice. I'm also a member of the Sacramento chapter of Showing Up for Racial Justice. In March 2021, the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors voted exactly what the community is asking you to do today, to deny the expansion of our county's main jail. This issue is important because it directly mirrors what occurred in our county. And we believe that our county's experience can serve to guide you in how you decide to proceed with this initiative. We've had consent decrees for violating the constitutional rights of folks in cages. And our board of supervisors were brave and courageous enough to shut this initiative down because they know that there's research that shows alternatives to incarceration improve public health. I implore you to follow in the courageous steps of our supervisors here in Sacramento County and vote no. Our next speaker is Brian Nockin. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Brian Odin. I am a lifetime Santa Clara County, San Jose um, citizen. Uh, um, I was just recently in a position where, you know, I watched all my cousins go in and out of jail growing up. And I was put into a position where I was kind of like charged with some stuff that was nonviolent crimes that they marked me as a felon and gave me a strike. Um, and I didn't have any like type of outreach or any help or any assistance. We as African Americans, Latino, Black and Brown people need more mental health services. We do not need new jails in our, in our city, in our county. We need more help. We need more money to be funneled into the community to help the youth, to uprise them, to give them ways to make income, to be able to survive and compete with these Caucasian people. We need more, less, less criminals, lab, less labeling black and brown people criminals and giving them the, the, the tools and the opportunities to live and thrive in this valley. And going back to several people who did not respond earlier or had a technical issue, Ali Miano, can you accept the unmute to begin? Thank you very much. Sorry, before what happened was uh, due to the challenges of trying to attend one of these meetings while also having a job. In any case, as a member of SURGE and the Los Gatos Anti-Racism Coalition who lives in District 1 and teaches at Stanford University in District 5, I wanna say that it is a travesty that the board is even considering this proposed jail. Bringing in so-called specialists to legitimate this huge expense which will no doubt make millions for construction developers, is a ruse for a project that will do nothing to alleviate our jail population. Fair pretrial systems and more supported communities will. Please vote against this proposal and work to strengthen our communities with investments in education and mental health. If you don't, given the great number of organized, powerful voices and testimonies you've heard today, you can bet you'll be looking for another new job uh, after the next election. So please reject ag uh, agenda items 10 and 11 and support them. Uh, another call for Tina Wong. Can you accept the unmute? 
Tino Wong is not accepting. Uh, the next speaker is Steph. Can you accept the unmute? Yes, can you hear me now? We can. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Steph Hansen Quintana and I'm with Sacred Heart Community Service. Um, I'm a voter in District 2. I'm also a candidate to ordain ministry in the Presbyterian Church and also spent several years of my life uh, working as a legal service provider at a county jail. Um, in my training as a pastor, I learned that sin is all that separate us from the dignity and humanity of our neighbors. So I'm here to tell you, uh, to tell the supervisors that voting in favor of a new jail is not only wrong, but sinful. Allowing this new jail to be built is to directly sanction death, generational trauma, and systemic racism. So writing statements about racial justice is easy. You all did a lot of that a couple of summers ago, declaring racism as a public health crisis compared to actually voting and investing in infrastructure that furthers racial equality. The latter is harder, but we must align our words with our actions. So today, I pray that your commitment to racial justice may not be our next speaker um, trying again is Veronica Amador. Veronica, can you accept the unmute? One more time for Veronica. And she is not responding. Um, we do have two additional raised hands. Um, did you want to take them, President yes. Wasserman? Yes, let's give it a try and then we'll put an end to it. Um, our next speaker is Joycelyn. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. I'm sorry, Joycelyn has an older version of Zoom. Okay, uh, the next speaker is Sharice Domingo. Um, one moment. Actually, we're going to go to Audrey Parker. All right. If you could accept the unmute, so Audrey. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Okay. My name is Audrey Parker. I am a parent. Uh, my son was incarcerated. He is now still incarcerated, but he was incarcerated at Amwood. And I am vote. I would like the vote to be not for a new jail, but for uh, to uh, put like um, they had uh, when he was there. They had uh, uh, classes. A lot of uh, young men are in there that didn't even finish high school. So uh, they had classes. They also had uh, where the parents were meeting with their kids. Uh, once a week, and it really helped the kids and the parents, and they they shut that down. They shut the schooling down. So that's what they need. We need a place where uh, for the mental health, some schooling, some preparing them to come back to the community. Our next speaker is Sharice Domingo. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Sharice with Deep. I've lived in San Jose for more than 20 years now. But before that, I used to live in East Palo Alto, which was home to a toxic waste facility that egregiously violated all kinds of environmental laws. We had high asthma and cancer rates. When we fought that waste plant, we learned that there was such a thing as, quote, acceptable levels of toxics that the government was okay for us to live with. That was their aim. This is similar to the reports from the county, from Mr. Austin, that there seems to be an acceptable level of incarceration, as though these numbers were static and a given. But that's not reflective of the spirit of what you approved in November of 2020. You promised a process to look at alternatives to incarceration, but the county has been taking the idea of a new jail as a given. Without having to explore all the alternatives to new jail, how can the county even know what facility would even need? I support Super Supervisor Ellenberg's memo to give us a chance to come up with true alternatives to incarceration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joycelyn. Joycelyn, can you accept the unmute? Hi, uh, my name is Jocelyn Aguilar. I'm a member of Young Women's Freedom Center and I'm a local in District 5. I'm in support of the Care First Jail Last Coalition and I'm speaking on agenda items 
10, 11, and 13. We urge the board to reject both reports and agenda items 10 and 11 and support Supervisor Ellenberg's referral laid out in agenda item number 13 to stop the new jail and invest in the community county alternatives to incarceration process laid out in agenda item number 13. That includes input from system impacted people every step of the way. We ask the board to decarcerate, renovate, and reimagine public safety. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Pamela Emanuel has her hand up, but she previously spoke as speaker number 114. Okay, then we are closing the public speaking portion for items 10, 11, and 13. And Peggy, on behalf of the board, thank you very much for your Herculean effort with speakers for exactly the last three hours. We have now heard reports on 10, 11, and 13, and from the public. I have DA Rosen wishing to speak, and then Supervisor Simitti. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, and good afternoon, member, members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, from the perspective of the DA's office, we have provided a memo to all the members of the board, as well as to uh, Jeff Smith, Miguel Marquez, and other justice partners. And I believe that it was published on the, the public portal for this meeting uh, yesterday. So I guess what I would say is I, I don't see this as either or. I think it's both. Um, we need a jail, we need a humane jail that protects and promotes human dignity and facilitates and encourages rehabilitation for those that are inside of it. Uh, we also need more mental health and drug treatment options for everyone in our county. We use our jail in Santa Clara County sparingly and carefully for those, for only those who are too dangerous to release or are flight risks. Fewer than 10% of individuals charged with crimes are held in our jail. So we're talking about 90% or more that are safely released. Our jail incarceration rate, to remind you, is among the lowest in California and the United States, more than 40% lower than the average meaning we're using incarceration only when we have to and we are using other options other alternatives whether that's drug treatment whether that's mental health whether that's weekend work or community service um, also historically our current jail population is more than 50 percent lower than it was at its high shortly before i took office the individuals in our jail are overwhelmingly there overwhelmingly there for either currently or previously committing serious or violent felonies. Uh, the percent of felonies charged resulting in conviction for those that are in our jail is in the high 90s. Uh, the percentage charged of felonies who are acquitted uh, is well below 1%, uh, meaning that individuals that are in our jail for committing serious and violent felonies, which is the vast majority of those in our county jail, um, will ultimately uh, be convicted of felonies and some will be sentenced to jail, some will be sentenced to prison, it depends. Uh, we don't see cash bail in our DA's office as a condition of release, which has also contributed to having a low incarceration rate and a low jail population. So I, I just would say that we need a jail, uh, we need a humane jail that helps and rehabilitates the individuals that are there so they come out and become productive members of our, our society and we also need more mental health and drug treatment i don't see this as either or i see it as both thank you thank you mr da now we turn to uh supervisor simidian then vice president ellen thank you uh, mr chair i'm going to see if i can get my uh, technology to let me both speak and be seen so uh if i uh, I'm not coming through, please let me know and I'll uh, address bandwidth issues again. I had a, a question on just item 10, the first of the three items before us, uh, that I wanted to uh, ask uh, of the county executive or his staff, uh, which may or may not lead to a motion. But uh, Mr. Chairman, I am looking again, just at item 10, uh, and the only recommended action at packet page 139 is that we receive the report. That's it. That being said, 
uh, at packet page 141, which is page three of the 15 page uh, enclosure for those who don't have packet pages, but at packet page 141, Dr. Smith, there are at the top of the page, I'm gonna call them four different recommendations that are noted colleagues. Uh, it says to address these areas, and I'm reading verbatim, Mr. Chair and colleagues, administration recommends creating an attorney level position in the county council's office to act as a monitor or expediter of court cases processing, uh, court case processing for those detained in jail. It goes on to say, in addition, administration recommends a social worker position to facilitate the move of individuals more quickly out of jail into court ordered placements. Uh, and finally, administration recommends the formation of a multidisciplinary team, MDT, of criminal justice stakeholder, system stakeholders to meet weekly to review the jail roster and identify individual case opportunities to expedite case adjudications. And then in the following paragraph, and forgive me colleagues, this is a little long, in addition to focusing on these areas, further analysis and research should be completed on use of discretion by law enforcement agencies and individual officers as to arrest versus site and release. In addition, further analysis and research should also be done regarding which crimes are charged and how often by the district attorney's office. Court detention decision data, including increased bail amounts and length of criminal sentences by individual judicial officers should be completed. Finally, an overarching study regarding the effectiveness of our community-based treatment providers should be done to ensure their programming is being done to fidelity. So by my count and clustering, that's one, two, three, four different recommendations, but they're not actually contained, Mr. Chair, in the recommended action, which is simply to receive the report. So my question is, is there any reason why we couldn't, shouldn't, or don't need to move uh, uh, a recommendation which would direct administration to do all of those things with respect to an expediter, uh, a multidisciplinary team, a uh, social worker position, and the further research and analysis? Dr. Smith, through the chair, if I may. Sure, and of course you can make a motion. Yeah. The you certainly can move to increase, incur, include those things as recommended actions. We, um, from a staff perspective, would take a yes vote on the um, general report as indication that we should come back to the board with recommendations for adding those positions. And let me try to explain why we're suggesting that and what's going on now. We currently have a multidisciplinary group of the justice partners that actually tries to work on these issues because as we know, the decisions that are made uh, about um, in, inmates or arrestees or booked individuals affect all of the other parts of the system. And so you can only be effective and efficient with everybody at the table working together. And what we're recommending is that we continue with that effort, um, you know, minimize as much as possible booking, minimize as much as possible um, incarceration, minimize as much as possible um, anything that will um, increase incarceration, such as being more efficient with pre-adjudication page per clients. Uh, right now, our pre-adjudication time in jail is much larger than it should be. A more rapid turnaround would decrease our, our uh, census. And we think that monitoring is required, and that's why we're recommending a um, social worker and a lawyer to be involved in this full-time so that we can make sure we keep track of that. A lot of it has to do with education and um, making sure that there are appropriate services available. So it's not really an either or decision as uh, DA Rosen mentioned. We have committed, the board is committed 
staff is committed to provide all of the resources needed to develop as many options to incarceration as possible. Um, so that's part of the team to do that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Colleagues, um, you know, I, I, I obviously don't know what's gonna happen on the next two items, 11 and 13, but on this item, uh, I do think there is value in very explicitly calling out uh, our direction to the staff to uh, get that expediter, to get that social worker, to get that uh, multidisciplinary team in place and to undertake the additional analysis and research uh, that I've read into the record. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion to receive the report and to direct staff to take all of those steps, sort of regardless of what happens next. Uh, if there's a second, I, I don't wanna assume or presume, but I think these are things that our full board would be supportive of. So that's why I'm making the motion. I'll second that. We have any discussion or further comment on this item? Um, I do see the supervisor. The public oops, I'm sorry. I got a screen with three different people's hands and raising. Supervisor Sumidian, did you have I, additional? I was comments? just just noting that in addition to my colleagues, Super uh, Supervisor Wasserman, our public defender Molly O'Neill yes. apparently wanted to weigh in and. Uh, yeah, that's who I was. That's who I was going to call on, as long as it was okay with Vice President Ellenberg, who had her hand up first. Can we hear from the public defender? Absolutely. Thank you. Public Defender O'Neill. Good afternoon, President Wasserman, Vice President Ellenberg, and members of the board. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still recovering from having been ill. Um, I wasn't going to speak today, but I, I feel compelled to weigh in all of you. And um, I, I'd like to weigh in on a few different items. Uh, uh, not about whether the report is received, but uh, a couple matters uh, contained in the report. I did provide a uh, a letter that was attached to agenda item 11, but it, it really relates also to agenda item 10. Um, and I would I would point out that my position initially, having spent decades in our jails, was that we needed a new one. Um, and honestly, as time has gone by and conversations have been had, I've changed my mind. Um, and part of the reason for that is that I think we have a uh, an opportunity at this moment in time that we shouldn't let pass. And so I understand uh, our district attorney commenting that those items are not mutually exclusive, but I, I think we miss the opportunity if we do in fact at this time start to build a new jail because uh, as we heard from so many incredible speakers today, we, we have an opportunity to really uh, look at alternatives to incarceration. And if we're, if we're building the incarceration structure at the same time that we're trying to explore really reimagining how we how we deal with the criminal legal system i i think we i think we're making a mistake and with a, respect to a couple other items um i think it's very important and i mentioned this in my comments as well to 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 not look without asking questions at the data that's been Oops, Molly, in time you have Molly, someone in Molly, custody charged with a <clears throat> Sorry, how, how long ago did you lose me? Um, we, we the just a second or two. Just five seconds. Okay. Yep. Uh, sorry, so I wanted to mention about serious, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Okay, about serious and violent felonies. Um, so at any given point in time, you'll have people charged by the district attorney with serious or violent felonies. That's a list of crimes contained in the penal code. Uh, and, and, and the fact of the matter is that those charges change over time, almost always. So while there is a high conviction rate for felonies uh, in our county, that doesn't mean there's a high conviction rate for serious or violent felonies and or that someone charged at one point eventually ends up necessarily convicted of those charges. And it's a really important point because um, all kinds of assumptions are made about those crimes. A, that people can't be released who are charged with them. B, that those are ultimately going to be the convictions that they sustain. And, and none of those things are necessarily true. So I, I think it's important to, to keep your 
our collective eye on, on that fact um, and not come to any deductions or conclusions based on the number of people charged but not convicted of crimes at any given time. And uh, finally, this is my last point, with respect to the expediter, uh, I, I think um, I think that's a mistake. I, I think an expediter really is someone who moves the trains, uh, keeps the trains running on time. We're talking about people's lives and people's uh, uh, destiny and, and people's custody status. And if we don't, they, people are entitled to Sixth Amendment uh, representation, effective and zealous counsel. And if all we're trying to do is uh, hurry things along, we are going to make mistakes and people are going to end up incarcerated for longer periods of time. So I, 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 I mentioned this in, in the attachment to the agenda item, but I, I think, uh, I think there are ways to move more effectively, but having, having someone who's not a, representing a client or involved in the actual case, knowing all the actual facts to try to move things along is a bad idea. So thank you very much for your time. I apologize. I know you've been going a long time today. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you feel better soon. Absolutely. Next, thank you. next hand up was Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you so much. Yes, th thank you very much. Um, I just want to uh, first thank uh, both Supervisor Simidian for the initial motion and uh, Public Defender O'Neill for the greater explanation about uh, the expediter. Uh, the, the comment about running the trains on time is is a is a chilling one, and I think an appropriate um, comparison here. Um, I have some prepared remarks, but I want to just um, address um, a comment made by a, a couple of folks, the district attorney and and some others, about whether we might not be doing both things at once and. What I would just like to offer here is that whether we are talking about a workforce, building a workforce or building facilities, we literally can't do everything all at once. And given our declaration of mental, mental illness and substance use disorder as public health crises, I would want to know that we are going to prioritize building out treatment facilities before, if at all, we talk about carceral facilities. And while technically the board may approve multiple actions today, the heavy lifting of actually getting facilities financed, planned, and built is really another thing altogether. Even with the replacement of some of the behavioral health facilities at the new Behavioral Health Services Center, we have seen a long, complicated process uh, with multiple interruptions, um, <laughs> and I think no one can, can speak to that frustration more strongly than Supervisor Simidian. To me, building out health facilities in our behavioral, behavioral health system must be the priority as it allows us to decrease the jail population to a smaller footprint. It maximizes the use of Medi-Cal or other funding sources for inpatient or outpatient care rather than full reliance on the general fund. And it expands treatment capacity for people before they wind up in the criminal legal system for the benefit of a broader number of residents. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that when, when we say we, can, we want it to all be built, I don't believe that we are staffed to really make that, to make that realistic. And finally, given the, uh, the critical behavioral health workforce uh, shortages, as we've discussed, I think that the points made by the uh, Behavioral Health Contractors Association in their letter and by Lisa Kofkin's board today point out the real risk of stretching our behavioral health pool of providers too thin if we're trying to expand treatment in custody and in the community. And I think that the, the reality is that we are going to be forced uh, to prioritize an approach to behavioral health infrastructure, community treatment and supports, or jail-based care. Uh, so with that, let me back up a little bit um, to where I had, had intended to, to start today. Give me one second here. Um, so before, before the conversation goes, goes further today, I really want to express my profound gratitude to everyone who has made time to weigh in on the issue today. Um, you and speaking to, to the, the public individuals, organizations, institutions, electeds, you have already made today a success by bringing this conversation into the mainstream and making space for us to pause and consider our options. Building a new jail represents a major ongoing cost to the county and the community, as well as the continuation of so many failed policies. 
It's a decision that should only be made if and when there are truly no other options identified and only if it is well supported by detailed data and research. The referral that I introduced, I guess about three hours ago, both recognizes that there are plenty of other options that must be explored before we move ahead with building a new jail and is centered in data, community support, and the successful examples of counties across the state and acknowledges the necessity for a detailed path forward to reduce the jail population and develop alternatives to incarceration. It will do several specific measurable things. First, it will expand various levels of behavioral health treatment options so that people who have serious mental illnesses and substance use disorders can be diverted by the courts to community programs, and it will expand access to levels of care in the community. Second, it will establish a work group under the guidance of public safety and justice comprised of county and community stakeholders that will be tasked with developing recommendations for implementation of, of alternatives to incarceration. And third, it will move, move us forward with um, a review of renovations of current jail facilities and will maintain the current moratorium on future jail construction until at a minimum the two prior actions have been completed, implemented, and evaluated. Our administration has not offered a data-supported or detail-oriented argument defending the case for the proposed new jail. Dr. Smith's presentation today did lead, lead, lay out a clearer vision than we had received through the reports uh, in the preceding several months, but not one that's within his sole authority to determine. The larger plan for the system of jail facilities must include the input of the board and the community. So in the interest of good governance, in my view, it would be irresponsible and inappropriate for the Board of Supervisors to approve administration's recommendation today. The answer to declining facilities is not to replace them as a first resort, but to look at renovations, consider and address the inhumane conditions that are unrelated to the facility's physical conditions, to look at alternatives to incarceration, and to fund and expand safe alternatives to incarceration for as many cases as possible before making an investment of this size that will significantly impact our county budget for decades to come. So let me wrap up by saying this. County government, we, the Board of Supervisors, have the power and the responsibility to provide and expand county resources, programs, and other efforts to ensure that people's basic needs are met and that they aren't locked up due to lack of sufficient mental health or substance use disorder treatment, supportive housing, healthcare, appropriate crisis intervention, and so much more. We are responsible for providing the social safety net for the county. And that work should and must take precedence over investing public resources into a highly unpopular new jail. We have the opportunity today to redouble our efforts in social supports, the ones over which we have oversight and direction, and see how much safer we can make our community before, if at all, building another jail. So I'd like to make a motion. Um, I know that we have Supervisor Simidian's motion for item 10 before us. I'd like to make one on items 11 and 13 so that we can discuss all at once. My motion is to reject actions A through D of item 11 on the basis that they have not been introduced with sufficient information or detailed plans to, for the board to approve in good conscience and to approve actions A through E of item 13 to pursue alternatives to incarceration expand the continuum of care for mental illness and substance use disorders, and maintain the current moratorium. And with that, I would be very grateful uh, if one of my esteemed colleagues would second the motion. Second, Chavez. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a second. I want to go in numerical order on the agenda items that we have. We currently have a motion and a second on the floor regarding item number 10. Is there any further discussion that the board wishes before we vote on that? Supervisor Simidian, then Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Just, I, I wanted to say thank you to uh, Public Defender Molly O'Neill uh, for uh, clarifying the implications of uh, a motion on the expediter. 
Um, and, and I'm going to take the somewhat unusual opportunity, if I may, through the chair to ask uh, the public defender. Um, uh, I, first, let me just say, I, I, I think there is a built-in tension between the value of a, quote, expediter to make sure people don't spend any longer in our county jail than is necessary and the value that you've articulated, which uh, I know you know I share, which is making sure that everybody gets their due process rights and that they don't get hurried through the system in a way that in any way diminishes or bridges their due process rights. So I think what I would do is let my motion stand with its four parts, except to modify the first part so that rather than directing the administration to create the expediter position that is referenced. We simply direct administration to convene the stakeholders to discuss whether there is a mutually agreeable way to create such a position that genuinely facilitates processing without compromising due process rights. And let me just ask our public defender, Ms. O'Neill, if she thinks that would address or uh, her concerns. Thank you. <coughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Supervisor Smitty, and I think that's much better. Um, I, I still um, have concerns that the primary focus for an expediter would be to try and hurry things up. And trust me when I say we don't have any interest in keeping anybody. We argue all day long, every day, to get people out of custody through various forms. So I think that's a I think that's a much better way to do it. And I I'm just saying out loud that I still have some apprehension about a position like that existing. And and if I was not clear enough, let me be this clear. If they can't, if the administration can't address your concerns, I won't be for it. I, and ho you. hopefully that's as as clear as it uh, needs to be. Um, and that's what I meant by uh, meeting with all the stakeholders and uh, finding an acceptable uh, way. If that can't happen, it, then it doesn't happen. Uh, but I do think uh, we at least ought to direct folks to sit down and see if there's a way to um, get to yes on, on that. So with that uh, change, if the uh, seconder Supervisor Wasserman is amenable, I'll yeah. let that motion stand. I think all of these are things we've heard from people today, colleagues, um, would help make sure that the system doesn't simply by virtue of inertia hold people in a place in a way um, that is um, less humane. I'll let it go with that. Thank you. Thank and thank you, you again thank uh, you. to the public defender. Thank you. And the seconder agrees with that. Um, the chair is going to speak last. I'm going to turn to Supervisor Chavez for her comments. Thank you. I, I want to speak on item 10 and then on Supervisor yep. Ellenberg's motion. Um, so first on, on the item, uh, the first item we're hearing, I, I just want to um, remind colleagues that this was actually in response to an issue that Supervisor Ellenberg and I brought forward in November. And there were kind of kind of two big buckets of questions that we had. And um, and I want to just hover for a moment on this issue of facilitation that um, that recommendation actually um, has come from a lot of different corners of the of the organization. So I just want to affirm, uh, Supervisor Smitty, and you and I both, um, as part of both the Blue Ribbon Commission and the FGOC um, evaluation of all of those initiatives, that one of the issues that came up over and over again was was, um, for lack of a better word, individual cases being stuck in a in a rinse repeat cycle, and really looking more critically at what are the areas that we needed to examine to resolve um, those kinds of issues? And in some respects, I think what that may mean is having a, a single person um, who is responsible for the liaison work between the courts and the county um, because we don't we don't really have somebody who plays that role. Miguel Miguel does um, in between all those other uh, responsibilities, but that's just something I would just say to the staff to please think about. And I really appreciate that the staff brought this forward because it was in response to feedback we've gotten from many corners of the community. Um, the second point I wanted to raise is that Supervisor Ellenberg and I were both very interested in um, the position of the Department of Corrections uh, uh, person 
And I think um, based on feedback we got from both um, staff and, and some from the community that I do think that taking a deeper look at that position and its role is really required uh, before we take any further action. And I just wanted to let the public know that a number of you raised that with um, both of us and we raised it, but right now I, I do think there's a lot of value in um, taking a look at what that role would be, what its span of uh, responsibility would be. And some of that is hinged a little bit on um, doing a deeper dive with the sheriff's office about that role. And so there's still a body of work that needs to be done there. And then um, finally on this particular issue, I do wanna emphasize that, um, and it'll bring me actually to Supervisor Ellenberg's motion. Um, I, I do wanna share a concern, an overriding concern I have. When the Blue Ribbon Commission um, began its work, one of the key issues that really um, drove the two parts of the um, Blue Ribbon Commission's research was this tension between wanting to do more on uh, prevention and on uh, providing mental health services in custody and in the community, really diving into behavioral health, and this tension relative to, to having an oversight um, body for the, the county's um, uh, jail and um, enforcement side. And I raise that because we put together a subcommittee that worked on behavioral health issues that decoupled from the Blue Ribbon Commission and attached itself to the Reentry Commission. That body met for months and months, came up with a list of recommendations and requests that are still in process that have not all been accomplished. And I, I say this because the only thing I wanna make sure I'm sharing with the staff and my colleagues, and if there's any concerns about this, I really want us to talk about this right now, is that we had been moving forward with so much work relative to behavioral health that, and much of it overlaps with the discussion we're having today. So what I wanna just say to Supervisor Ellenberg is that in your motion, it in no way should stem, stop, slow the work that's already in process to make sure we're getting mental health services out to the community. And the there's a component of, the, of um, item 13 that looks at, at how all of those discussions will happen. And I'm very fearful that they're gonna get slowed down. So I want them to keep moving so we get that support out to the community. Uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, do you have any concerns about that? Supervisor Ellenberg. Yes, I'm aware. Um, ab absolutely not. It would com be completely counter to my intentions to let any of that uh, be slowed down. Thank you. Thank you. And what that, um, what that also reflects for me is that there's, there's some outstanding to do's that were from that body of work that I want to forward, re forward to staff and Dr. Smith. I'll ask my staff um, to pull this together. But I think when the full hearing that we have in February, where we're looking at all the behavioral health, uh, the mental health services on the adult side, I think it's going to be really important that we're able to address uh, that staff's able to address where we are in those processes um, for that. Uh, I, I think it's a February 15th meeting where we're looking at adult behavioral health. So we'll get that information to you, but I think Gabby and um, and Bruce really were playing the lead role in those those processes and resources. Yeah, I, uh, I think uh, there's some effort to reschedule because I think one or two of the board members has a conflict on the 15th, but we will definitely get that uh, rescheduled as soon as possible in an appropriate time and include that. And I just want to editorialize that it is an iterative process. It's not something that we finish. We're going to constantly be pushing to do more with behavioral health, to come up with new techniques, new approaches, new uh, new ways of doing things, new ways of getting good output. So um, we hear it, and we will be pushing, and nothing will be diverted. Thank you, and Chairperson Wasserman. Um, I think it's really critical that we have that meeting in February, and um, and there's a there are two reasons that I just want to share this with my colleagues. One is that I think it's really important that the board prioritize interest prior to budget, 
And I think this, the only way to do that is to have a deep dive into what we are doing, what we're not doing and what we could be funded to do. So I, I, I think it just needs to happen in, in February at some, uh, some point. I think if it gets too far away, we're gonna miss another opportunity. Um, and then one thing I wanted to share just with all of the um, activists and community members who are um, with us, and that is that I think it's really important that when these hearings happen, and my office will certainly uh, take some responsibility in this, and I know Supervisor Allenberg has a, a group of folks who really care about this topic too, that we make sure that these meetings, these public meetings are that you all are aware of them and are alerted to them because I think a number of areas um, of work have moved forward and it's not clear to me that I know that not all of our departments are even talking to each other so I don't expect um, all of the nonprofits to have all the latest information but I want to make sure that we are really um, assertively making sure that you're invited to the reentry um, uh, committee meetings and to the uh, these hearings where these issues are being discussed because there's so much happening in these areas of um, uh, community investment that I, I want to make sure we're getting all of your good your good feedback on them. Um, and then Supervisor Ellenberg, I think um, just a couple of questions that I want to make sure I, I raise today, and that is that we have. Um, already have a couple of um, organizations, including re-entry that exist, that are, are um, um, trying to address the changes we wanna see in our system. So there's a re-entry, which I wanna come back to in a moment. And then there's the um, oversight board for OCLEM. This, I, I'm getting all our acronyms mixed up, but there's CCLEM. Yeah, CCLEM, thank you. And I'm wondering if you could just speak to them for a moment about how you see the, these bodies of work that are moving forward, connecting together through your uh, the process that you're outlining. Sure. So there is certainly a lot of overlap in players. And while it's uh, tempting to say, let's let's not create something entirely new, I think that there is um a, a good basis here to build a subset, which will include some of the, the, the members of the reentry group, some of the public safety and justice departments, and some of the um, community organizations, and certainly CCLEM, um, that haven't been so directly involved and connected together. So what I'm looking at is um, an informal work, working group that will be led uh, through a series of structured meetings um, with a with a facilitator, and I attached uh, last night the the work plan to um, to the referral, so that we could be clear that we are moving in a forward direction and that we do have something actionable. And uh, certainly, the goal is to be inclusive and also to be productive and forward moving. And I think Supervisor Chavez, with the experience that you have in um, assembling task forces and, and work groups, I would be very glad to talk with you uh, offline as this organization, you know, really takes form to, you know, to get some of that guidance and then bring this to public safety and justice, uh, where I'd like to to hold the oversight for it. Thank you. And I, and I, one other group I just want to mention is that some of the leaders that served on the um, behavioral health subcommittee would be really ideal. They were, Absolutely. They and I've heard from them as well. Yes. Good. The greatest challenge could be that there are so many people that want to participate that we have to figure out how to to divvy this up. And again, the work group looks at specific intercepts in the criminal legal system. And there are different uh, types of entities and organizations that are more appropriate for different um, different intercept points in the system. So I think that will help uh, divide the work and make sure that we are as broadly inclusive as as possible. I think that's the best way to do this work. Yes, I think that's right. And um, and then just colleagues, a couple things I, I just wanted to share um, after listening to folks for so many hours, I, I thought there were some very interesting um, issues that got raised from the community. And one of them that I thought was particularly striking, it was how, you know, where we're going to be investing resources. And, and I will say to, to my colleagues that one thing that really really has impacted my mind on the timeline, not, not so much on the outcome, but on the timeline is this. I do believe that making sure that we have um, our employees, families, 
victims, like really that we can't really leave anybody out will help us do something that I think is actually more important than the rebuild of the building. And that is to look at significant cultural changes in our organization. Because what occurred to me, um, and I'll just share this for a little bit of history, what occurred to me is that the challenges that we've had in the design of any kind of building has been that our, our, our policies are not aligned with the, with the facility itself. So colleagues, just as a reminder, you may recall, some of us have been talking about this for years, but when we met with the um, design firm that we, we talked to them about, okay, well, we want to be in the, we want to see how does the building lower recidivism? How does it, you know, um, contribute to binding families back together? How does it, we asked all these questions and what we got back initially was nothing that the building that could have looked like the same building we had now with a little more out of space, uh, out of cell um, opportunities. And I share that because what has been striking to me um, really over the last week or two is thinking a lot more about if our culture hasn't changed, then there's no way for us to design a building that reflects the values of this community. It's just, it's literally not possible to do. And I, I say that as somebody who recognizes that um, eventually we do need a, a new facility, but I do not believe that our cultural um, changes have caught up enough with us to be able to, as a board, uh, put our imprimatur on something that gets uh, designed at this at this point in time. Um, and then I apologize, uh, just one other thing, I, I do want to lift up that we need to take a new look at reentry and the recovery center. I don't think either one of them are meeting the needs of the community the way we would like them to do so. Thank you. Thank you. And before my comments, we turn to Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you, uh, President Wasserman. The um, on item number thirteen, I actually have a few questions. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, uh, my colleague, uh, President, uh, I mean, uh, Vice President uh, Sun Allenberg, for your great work of uh, a very well written um, report on thirteen. Very much focus on the highlighting the need for the mental health and the alternative to incarceration. And I have a few uh, just uh, brief questions here. Um, whether you might, or maybe the administration can help provide some answers to. The report um, states that less than 50% uh, were engaged in voluntary follow-up treatment after having been released from inpatient emergency psychiatric or jail treatment. Um, does anybody know who oversees this issue? Hello, Dr. Smith, anybody? I can't really answer it because I don't know where the number came from. I think that's from the AOT report. Was that helpful, Supervisor Lee? Okay, this is from the AOT report. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I could probably do a follow-up maybe if uh, administration can, can find it out for us if that's something that is- That's the May report, the May AOT report. Right, thanks. Um, on the issue of access to drug withdrawal and detox services, uh, as reported as taking more than seven days for placement, um, often missing the important window of being ready now uh, when the uh, when the uh, drug user uh, is ready to get detox. Uh, at the HXC, uh, members of the NEX team presented that they're able to get people help the minute they're ready or ask for it. Um, do you know why there's that type of discrepancy? Who's that question directed toward? Yeah, I guess Dr. Smith might know if, uh, if yeah. that's the case. Because they said there's no way, basically, and that we, we basically have the information that's actually taking seven days to get placement for people to get the detox services. Or longer. I'm actually getting some information that it was in the behavioral health deport report, BHSD report, mm -hmm. to the board of uh, supervisors and was confirmed by providers. Okay. 
Supervisor okay. Lee, any other questions? Yeah. And then the last question I have uh, is that 77% of the patients being placed on 72-hour emergency psychiatric holds wait for two to three days before being transferred or seen by a psychiatrist. Who makes the decision then to put them on such hold? This is for Dr. Smith? Yeah. Dr. Smith, are you a designee? Again, I didn't write the report, so I can't comment on it. Okay. All right. And that's all the questions I have uh, on, on the 13. Okay. Let's go with, we have a motion and a second. Let's deal with number 10. We have a motion by Supervisor Smitty and a second by me. Um, I'd like to call for the vote unless there's any further comments. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is up. Oh, thank you. I, d I was just going to weigh in. I, Susan answered his question. Okay, so you're good? Okay. Peggy, please call for the vote on item 10. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Now we move to the motion on the floor by Vice President Ellenberg, seconded by Supervisor Chavez regarding items 11 and 13. I haven't spoken yet, so I'm going to speak now. Each of you have had a chance to do so. And if you want to speak after, of course, you're able to do that. Um, when I got here 11 plus years ago, the board had already met, public meetings, et cetera, et cetera, and they decided that it was time to build a new jail because of the inhumane conditions in the jails, Main Jail North, South, and Elmwood. Several years went by, they changed those plans, but still voted that a new jail was needed to alleviate the concerns, the inhumane conditions, crowdedness, lack of outside space, ADA, seismic, et cetera. Changed the plans. A couple, three years later, they changed them again. These changes had to do with the federal government telling the state they needed to reduce their population. That was the first change when I got here. They sent us people who were in prison for various ser very serious crimes, um, maximum security and beyond. They sent us money for additional guards. But all that did was add more prisoners to three facilities that the Board of Supervisors voted on 14 years ago that needed to be replaced. I am still of the opinion we need a new jail that is ADA and seismic and humane, that offers more space per um, client, more opportunity for sunlight, et cetera, et cetera. I am also very much in favor of increasing our mental health and behavioral health, tossing dollars to that as well. I have learned that building a new jail can be done with lease revenue bonds and paid back over 30 years and not take money from the general fund. I don't want to take money from the general fund to do this when we have another opportunity. I don't want to reduce the money that's there for hiring and maintaining the employees we have and the services we provide. Rebuilding, remodeling costs more per square foot than new and you still have an old skeleton and the financing to take money from general fund when you can finance it over 30 years at less than 3% is the way to go. So I'm in favor of both. A new jail that's specifically designed to deal with the maximum security clients. The state of California superior courts sentence people to jail every day. And it's the county's responsibility to have a jail for those people sentenced by the state judges to be held in. And all of us, I know, want our jails to be humane and ADA compliant and seismic compliant and everything else. So I feel we are duty bound to have a jail rather than have our judges sentence people to jail, not have a jail, and those people go to Fresno County, Orange County, Modesto, Stanislaus, whatever county. The disadvantages of that are numerous. If people, our judges, sentenced to go to jail 
and we don't have a jail for them to go to, they're going to go to other jails that may be inhumane. We know a new jail will be the best of any jail. It will sentence those people to go out of county. One of the most important things to help people in jail rehabilitate is the access to family, family being able to come and visit them. If a person from Stanislaus County is held in a jail in Fresno County, that's going to greatly reduce the oper the frequency in which the spouse or the children come to visit their family member, their loved member. And we've all been told access to family helps mentally those incarcerated. So I'm in favor of a new jail because we can pay for it over 30 years with lease revenue bonds. I'm in favor of a new jail so that people sentenced by the state judges can sentence them to our state of the art ADA seismic compliant jail here in Santa Clara County where the loved ones of those sentenced can easily visit their family member. I'm also in favor of using, looking at the Elmwood facility, looking wherever to increase our behavioral health and mental health services. That's where I stand. I understand we may agree to disagree. I don't know how the vote will turn out, but I am in favor of item number 11, especially 11C, that for the first time in 14 years, we provide a jail that is humane for those that the courts and our DA and public defender, the maximum security clients have determined should be in jail, not out. So I will not be supporting the motion and I will conclude my comments now. Does anyone else have Supervisor Chavez? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to um, confirm uh, something on the record and that is that the rebuild of the 500 um, beds would not be additional. So we're, we, we're still maintaining a set number of, of um, beds. And I just wanna confirm that. Dr. Smith? Yeah, what the staff recommendation is, is that uh, we, the 500 beds would be less than the current um, approved cell count at Main Jail North, which is currently 854. So that's less. And also with regard to Elmwood, we'd recommend ultimately reducing that capacity from about 3,900 or 3,078 down into the 1,000 range because we maybe 1,500 because we think administratively that we've proven that we can function with a census of around 2000 and do it safely in the right situation with the right size physical plant. Um, there's difference of opinion, but we're definitely recommending that we go from a 4,000 um, certified cell count down into the 15, you know, 2000 to 1500. 2000 is probably reasonable. 2400 is where we're at right now. You know, if you presume that with all the diversion that we're going to create, that we could divert three or 400, you know, that gets us into the 2000 range. So the 500 would definitely be smaller than what Main Jail North is. And Elmwood will end up significantly smaller than what it is now. I, I just was asking that, Dr. Smith, because I, I didn't want to give anybody the impression that by not taking this action, we we would we would anticipate having to send um, folks uh, out out of county away from their families. So I, I just wanted to verify that. And then the second thing I want well, to well, I ask, think what I think what was being referred to is if we needed to rehabilitate Main Jail North, which is not. Oh, I see my status that we'd have to decant it because we couldn't re remodel it without staff, without right. getting rid of the inmates. 
Right, because they would the they, the facility being um, rehabilitated would need to be vacated during the time of construction. Right, exactly. Yeah. I think Thank that was you. what was referring to. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. I thought, oh my God, <laughs> I read all these documents too. I you scared me. Thank um, you. And, Thank you. And then the other thing I wanted to ask is the use of re leased revenue bonds. What would be the source of repayment of those bonds? What would be the source of funds? If we did lease revenue bonds, we generate the capital to invest in facilities and we guarantee it against the general fund. So it's a 30 year mortgage, basically. If we're trying to do a remodel of a building, it has to come straight out of general fund. I appreciate that. So we would either be, we eat both, both take resources from the general fund. One allows for the payment over a longer period of time or repayment. Right. Okay. Cause lease revenue bonds usually refer to the, the uh, revenue coming from the source. And that's obviously not the case. Both, both would come from general fund. I just wanted to clarify that Dr. Smith. And then well, uh, and when we do lease revenue bonds for like, for example, the psychiatric facility that's being built at a hospital or for uh, some of the seismic activity and projects um, that have been done in the past, um, those are all guaranteed by the general fund. Right, right. I, I think that, but in that circumstance, the, the collateral in, could be some of what the re revenue that comes from the facility, correct? Or from the enterprise fund? No, we structure it all with the general fund. Okay, so then we're either way, we're gonna be using the general fund. The question is over what period of time we have to repay or put money up front. And what amount of money we're gonna have to spend. Got I it. I should also point out, which, you know, is, presume that people understand that if we have two jails that are certified for 3,900 beds or 3,900 cells, it's reasonable to expect that if we don't make them smaller, we will get back up into the 4,000 range eventually. So part of the strategy that staff is working on is that if you build smaller, then you won't get inmates up to the 4,000 range census. Thank you for that. And um, and Dr. Smith, I just wanted to say to you and your team, I, I know that um, you know people kind of threw a lot of anger in your direction. I, I do just wanna say that I, I believe that our team is um, giving us their best uh, judgment and really it's up to the board to determine whether or not we'll accept that judgment. And I, I just want you to know that we do really appreciate all the effort and work um, that you and your staff uh, put into all the research for today. Um, and, you know, and reasonable people on this can absolutely disagree. I think we're all trying to get to the same point. We're just looking at different ways to get there. So thank you. Thank and you. Vice for... President Ellenberg, before we take the vote, um, if you'll please restate your motion was approval of 11 and 13, but not 11C, is that correct? Hold on one second, I will reread it. Great. Uh, the motion is to reject actions A through D of item 11 and to approve actions A through E of item 13. Okay, so A through D, D is all of 11. So your motion is to reject item 11 and approve item 13. Correct. Okay. Mr. Chairman, through the chair. Yes. yes. I, I, I just, um, uh, I, forgive me, we've we've uh, bundled together so many different items here. I just wanna make sure we're all clear on, or at least that I'm clear on uh, what we're having. So the motion essentially is just a no vote uh, if we could take these separately, would that be acceptable to the maker of the motion uh, on first item 11 and then item 13? Let me just think that through for a quick second. I, I would prefer to do them together. Um, yeah. but, if it, but if you have a strong preference, I'm happy to, to hear the thinking. 
no, I just I just want to make sure it's a uh, it's a voting down item eleven is the motion and voting up item yes. thirteen is the Correct. motion. Yes. And that is in their entirety as to every one of the A, B, C, D, E uh, subsets. Yes. Correct. Got it. Thank you. I will. I will just say then. Um, uh, I will be a uh, no vote on the motion. Uh, I am uh, more in the uh, let's do both uh, camp. Uh, I appreciated Supervisor Chavez's acknowledgement of the progress we have made. Uh, that doesn't mean there's not more progress to be made. Fair enough. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I, uh, I came on the board when we were at our uh, highest uh, uh, population in the county jail. And so uh, I do take some satisfaction and want to give some credit where it is due to the folks who've worked uh, to reduce that number by almost half. That is not a small accomplishment. Right. Uh, and I also wanted to underscore the fact that uh, our per capita population in the jail is 40% less than uh, the rest of the state of California. And that's also a significant accomplishment. So uh, as, as uh, colleagues have said, uh, different folks will have different conclusions for different reasons about the ultimate outcome on these two items. But uh, I'm in the I think we need to do both category and I won't uh, repeat the reasons which have been much discussed already. And so I'll uh, be a no vote on the measure, but wanted to share that background and be clear that uh, the nature of the motion was before us. Thanks. Thank you. So Rod Chavez, your hand is still up. Did you have something, another comment? No, okay. With that clarification then, Supervisor Lee, your hand is down. So with that clarification, I'll ask Peggy to call for the vote. Supervisor Lee. No. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? No. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? No. Okay, so that motion went down. Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Yes, I would like to go and make a statement and try for motion later on, if All I may. Right. Go right ahead. Um, so for, so for too many years, we have talked about the poor conditions of the county jails. I've personally visited Elmwood and the main jail north multiple times over the past decade, and frankly have been very saddened, shocked, and disgusted of the conditions. After Michael Tyree's murder in the main jail north in 2015, this board established the Blue Ribbon Task Force to investigate, which I had the opportunity and honor to serve. That gave over 600 recommendations. Many of these recommendations have not yet been implemented still, and the conditions still have not improved in our jail, and some said it's gotten even worse. Mm -hmm. The report that we have in front of us does provide additional information that could help us move forward with a more aggressive plan to better serve our community with alternatives to incarceration. Research shows that people with mental health conditions inevitably gets worse in jails, worse yet, the chances of developing a mental health condition for people with no previous history of mental health issues doubles once they are in jail. Since the state of California's closing of the mental health institutions in the 70s, there has been a severe lack of mental health beds statewide in both licensed and unlicensed facilities. And far too often, county jail becomes a de facto place where someone gets inpatient mental health treatment. In Santa Clara County, that's the eighth floor of the main jail north, which is woefully inadequate. In Elmwood, certain segregated wings of the jail cells are used to house those with SMI, we call severe mental illness. There is no dedicated facility in Elmwood that is run by doctors, psychiatrists, or nurses to treat mental illness. Right now, those are just regular jail cells with only periodic visits by mental health professionals. That is not working and we must end those now. This report highlights a few actions the county has taken to reduce our jail population. An appropriate mental health treatment facility, whether operated solely by the county or in conjunction of cooperation with neighboring jurisdictions is absolutely needed and we need to move forward now. As Supervisor Ellenberg and I have mentioned in our referral declaring mental health and substance use as a public health crisis just two weeks ago, 
we need to dedicate real resources to putting the framework in place to address the current mental health and substance abuse conditions, focusing on key preventative measures. We also need to expand community-based resources focused on early mental health interventions. We should continue to move on alternatives to incarceration for both adults and youths, like the referral I authored with Judge Lucero a few months ago, and in cooperation with groups like the Bear Institute to identify alternative housing options for justice-involved girls and gender-expensive youth. To quote a letter I received, quote, those in our jail who are not simultaneously suffering from a mental health condition also deserve an environment that will foster the restoration because we know that nearly everyone who enters our jail will at some point be released. Plus, even with increased diversion, reduced bail, and other pretrial efforts, our prosecutors will continue to argue for and our court will continue to send people to jail. We know that merely housing people in the jail does nothing to reduce recidivism. In fact, it exacerbates the problem. Conversely, providing rehabilitative services and programs coupled with a restorative facility and culture has been shown to be the best strategy for reducing recidivism. I first want to thank all the public comments provided by the hundreds of speakers of how they really care about our county. As mentioned by my predecessor, Sandra Cortezzi, suggesting building a mental health facility to house patients in custody instead of building a new jail facility. I agree, I, I agree with his vision, as many of the speakers today to urgently address this need. However, I've also come to the conclusion that the solution should not be a either or. When we see the inhumane conditions of Main Jail North and Elmwood, and not to mention the amount of atrocities and crimes that have occurred in these facilities committed by both other violent gang members or even correctional deputies. Some have worried that we don't have the resources to build both. And I've even suggested a year ago when this issue first came out to simply let's see how about renovating Main Jail North so that we are not going to waste money to build any more new, new jail space. As many have said, including Judge Lodoris Cordell, whom I served on the Blueberry Commission, and I consulted, if you built them, they will fill them, right? The over-incarceration of our black and brown communities and the families and children suffering are very real. Profit-driven private prison industry and over-incarceration to lock them up and throw away the key was the mantra for far too long in so many states and so many prisons. And that's why we now have laws closing down private prisons. Let's talk about where we are now. Main jail South that was here was very old and needed to be demolished. And thank God, thanks heavens, it's gone. Now, Main Jail North was built in 1987, currently with over 850 bed capacity, and at the time was supposed to be the model of some modern facility, but it was anything but. It is not in compliance with the ADA, the American Disability Act, and we now have federal court order, the Chavez Consent Decree made clear that we basically have to construct a new facility to, to get rid of the Consent Decree. Worse yet, the so-called open space for each floor consists of a triangular shape smaller than half of a basketball court. There's, there's no rational open space, no programming space, no infirmary for vision or dental care, and it's not even earthquake safe. Some of these deficiencies are structural and a concrete steel wall building could not be easily fixed. In addition to the funding sources for renovation, even if possible, will come from the general fund, which of course also means that that would be funds taken away from all the good work that our community based partners was going to need. By the same token, the 70-year-old Elmwood was built to house over 3,000 beds right now, much, much larger than what this county needs, with many of the buildings that cannot be renovated and should be condemned and dilapidated as laid out in our, our Report 11B. Those need to be demolished as well. Now, this is also the opportunity to re-envision this huge Elmwood incarcerated complex. How about decommissioning part or all of that space from being used as a jail? Closing all that excess, dilapidated and condemned jail space or using the space for other alternatives to incarceration? 
And as we have learned earlier today, the largest number of the in and out of custody really could be kept out of jail entirely by alternatives to incarceration, such as the use of a deflection center, so that individuals will be directed to mental health, substance abuse treatment, medical care, housing, and other wraparound services instead of being sent to booking and being fingerprinted and being released a few hours or a couple of days later. I strongly urge my colleagues to direct administration today to construct one or more mental health facilities to treat our justice in both community and our community in need of these services. And therefore, I would like to move on the following motion. On item 11, move to approve items A through D as follows. Item 11A, direct, direct administration of the comprehensive treatment plan and continuum of care model for justice involved clients. B, in development of community services that reduce client contact with the criminal justice system and facilitate other options for jail diversion, diversion and reentry services. But to also consider an inpatient and outpatient behavior health treatment facility, as well as exploring a facility like a deflection center. On item C, direct administration to move forward with the resigned efforts to build a facility for 500 maximum security clients based on the needs identified in this report and provide for mental health and substance abuse treatment services built in. This new facility is built with rehabilitation and recovery in mind while providing the safety that the residents staff, now community needs and deserve. And I do believe we need to comply with the current consent decrees. Buildings in the Elmwood facilities were built in the 50s and some were condemned prior to 2000. Many of them need to be rehabilitated and replaced. Two federal lawsuits have filed against the conditions of these facilities and there are two consent decrees always seen by US federal judges to fix them. And I hope that if we were able to pass this, the board section today will hopefully help start a chapter of our custodial operations moving from retribution to rehabilitation and recovery. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be happy to second that. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I just want to make sure I understand the motion. I, I'm not sure I do. Um, essentially, you're, you're adopting all of the staff's recommendation, Supervisor Lee, and adding adding a, um, a, a rebuild of Elmwood and adding an additional, in addition to the 500 beds, another mental health facility. Yes. A it's a forensic mental health facility. Yes, we are looking at a, uh, uh, a, 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 like I said, not an or, but an and. So we're putting together uh, a, a something, something staff to come back to us to recommend how, how they put in this I'm sorry, sorry, Otto, I'm missing like so much of what you're saying because you've yeah. got a bad connection, but oh, I'm sorry. So can you start again? You're sure. saying so 500, to, so replacing the 500 beds and adding a forensic mental health facility in addition to that? Right. It's a standalone, not not along with the uh, the, the 500 bed uh, um, uh, facility we're talking about. This will be a complete separate standalone mental health facility. A, a carceral facility? Uh, not necessarily. It all depends on what's come back and whether we could be carceral or maybe non-carceral. So in addition to the, the in addition to the, um, is it a locked facility? Is it a, what, what is it, Supervisor Lee? I believe it would be a locked facility. Uh, okay, but again, so I think I would like the staff to come back with uh, recommendations of how we can accomplish the goals because uh, primarily the facility will be designed to house those who are technically in custody. Okay, so so you're increasing the bed count that the staff's proposing to address some some broader mental health needs that that are yet to be de defined. Yes. Right. Okay, but the and you. I, and just to make sure for A, B, and C, you're just agreeing with the staff's recommendations. So what you were reading into the record was what their recommendations were, or they were additional recommendations. And, oh, and I'm only asking because I couldn't hear you all the way. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, let me let me clarify. So A, B, C, D. Uh, I'll just restate what I added to the staff's recommendation, just to make it clarified. Just okay? what you added. Great. Sure. 
All right, so for item number B, uh, A is exactly this, no, no, no changes. For B, what I added at the end of the recommendation of reentry services is, but to, but to also consider- Supervisor yeah. Lee, Supervisor Lee, yes. you're yes. breaking up on us. So let's try something different. Will you back yes. up a little bit from your computer? Okay. Stop right there and just speak and I'll let you know, but I, I'm guessing that'll work. All right, testing, one, two, three, four. Does it sound yeah. better? Yes. Better. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll not move. I'll, I'll freeze right here. Okay. Yes. So what I was saying is, but to also consider an inpatient and outpatient behavioral health treatment facility, comma, as well as exploring a facility like a deflection center, period. That's from B. For C, we have the same language as uh, recommended uh, by staff, and at the end to state and also direct administration to move forward to build a new standalone mental health facility under the direction of the county health system and report back to the board with a design and construction schedule by the May 2022 budget workshops of a um, secured or non-secured facility. Of a secured and non-secured facility? Or, or secure or non-secured facility so that is for the staff to come back with a recommendation based on the need. Thank you. Okay, and for D, um, do you need me to read D all over again? Because it's a, a... Oh, I didn't even know you had an E. Go Wait, ahead. No, no, just, no, D for Delta, sorry, Delta. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was not Delta, that was... That, that was, was that, that was Delta. Oh, okay. Set. Well, I just read to you, which... Uh, oh, 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 Supervisor Lee, Supervisor Lee, we can't hear you. I don't know if you, yeah, if you move I, forward, I, maybe speak a little more softly. Sure. So um, what I just added regarding the standalone mental health facility was added at the end of items Charlie, item C. Okay. All right. Now for Delta, do you want me to read Delta over again? Yeah, I'm sure. I think I'm really confused now. Okay, so that was Charlie. Go ahead, Delta. Go ahead, Otto. Thank okay. you. Um, direct administration to retain consultants to renew efforts to develop a civic center master plan and to develop a plan for future public safety and jail facilities needs, including demolishing main jail north and <clears throat> repurposing significant portions or all of elmwood for alternatives to incarceration like a mental health facility and move to significantly reduce the county's total jail capacity period i request that this come back to the board by may 2022 as part of the budget workshop on the consultant RFP process, period. I hope that was clear, I'm sorry. That was Did, clear. Thank you. And B is Baker, right? All right. B Baker, yeah, yeah. We did have a little bit of uh, added there about the um, uh, deflection center as well, yes. Good, no, we're, we're good on that. Okay, Mr. thank President you. Mr. Chavez, his hand has gone down. Vice President Ellenberg, you're next. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Lee, this is a, a tremendous amount of, of new information uh, to absorb. The, the recommendations that you're making are, are really significant um, and certainly and, and particularly absorbing all of this verbally without having the opportunity to vet or review or research any of your suggestions beforehand, I feel puts me at a, a significant disadvantage. Um, and I'm 
I'll ask just a couple of questions now, but I, I, I don't feel comfortable at all approving this today without understanding at a level that I need to have uh, to feel to feel confident. Um, the first point that I want to address is the 500 maximum security beds or high security, the, the, the name changed, um, was contemplated for folks with high acuity and significant mental health needs. If you're contemplating, and I'm not looking necessarily for an answer right now, but just noting some confusing pieces, a forensic facility at Elmwood that would be specifically for people with significant mental health issues would to me obviate the need for many, many of the beds in the 500 uh, bed facility. Um, I really was, was moved by Supervisor Chavez's comment earlier that if our culture hasn't changed, uh, there's no way for us to design a new facility. And, and essentially what you're asking for is for administration alone or with a consultant to design a great number of facilities, locked, unlocked, forensic, uh, not run by, run by the sheriff in whom we've already taken a vote of no confidence, run not by the sheriff. It is a huge undertaking that in my view should have significant public input and community input and an opportunity to, to really weigh all of these options. Um, I was so grateful for the work that we did together in declaring mental and behavioral health um, and substance use disorders, public health crises. We already have in motion um, a process by which to bring the community together to talk about, to, we're getting reports back to look at the facility uh, needs that we have. Um, this motion seems to um, skip over that piece and ask for administration to be making those those decisions, um, the the additions of inpatient and outpatient um, facilities, deflection centers, um, standalone mental health facilities, and information by by May of 2022. Um, I, you you must have also considerably more faith than I do in the amount of work that can be done. Um, in this, in this short period of time. And I, I hear your very good intentions. I know very much um, that you share, as do all of us on this board, a desire to significantly increase access to mental and behavioral health facilities and treatment services across a continuum of care. I think we already put that in motion mm -hmm. through, our, um, through our public crisis referrals. So I'm very reluctant to jump ahead of that process by making um, such specific direction about so many additional facilities now. And again, thinking still about the ability of our, uh, the size of our own workforce to do all of this. We've got already some mental and behavioral health facilities at, um, uh, at VMC that are being stalled because of contractual contractor issues. And we've got to go back and, and do it again there things will get dropped and will get left out if we try to do everything at once and we don't proceed in an orderly manner. Um, so, you know, while I very much want to be supportive of your intent, um, I, I can't support changes of this magnitude brought at this hour without writing or review and when we already have movement in place to go in this direction. So I, I thank you for the work. Um, but I, I can't support that today. Thank you. Supervisor Smitty. Um, forgive me, uh, Supervisor uh, Lee, just the, the technical challenges um, were uh, a little daunting, and I appreciate your willingness to forge uh, ahead. I, I want to, uh, and I apologize, Mr. Chair, but I think we're all uh, struggling to make sure we understand uh, specifically what the motion is designed to accomplish. I, I actually heard it as um, let's do A through D on item 11. Mm -hmm. And by the way, let's also open up our minds a little bit about what might or might not happen at Elmwood. Mm -hmm. And by the way, um, something pretty close to what I would call A and B 
from item 13 that supervisor um, Ellenberg uh, had in her motion, which has failed. And yet I think items A and B are in fact consistent with what I heard Supervisor Lee saying and what I thought uh, those of us who were in the let's do both camp uh, thought we should be doing. Let me first ask Supervisor Lee, if I may, through the chair and then go to Dr. Smith to see if that's, uh, I understand it requires a vote, but I thought that was where Supervisor Lee was trying to take us and uh, I'm open to that. Supervisor Lee, if I may, through the chair, uh, I think you. that's what I heard, yes? Yep. Yes. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I, again, I want to uh, re restate how I appreciate uh, Supervisor Allenberg's great work on 13 and A and B. Uh, certainly, I am. I would strongly support. Yeah. Okay. Well, then let me turn to Dr. Smith and um, uh, see uh, what he wanted to add to that because I, I'm optimistic we're getting close to a. Uh, a vote that uh, a majority could support that incorporates um, some of the more uh, commonly agreed to notions beyond uh, just a simple majority. Dr. Smith, through the chair. Yes. So <clears throat> what I heard is pretty much what you heard. And um, what it would boil down to is um, <clears throat> item 11 being approved. And additionally, looking at uh, what needs to happen at Elmwood, which would re effectively require us to do 13 A and B in order to come back with a thoughtful <clears throat> explanation. <clears throat> and because what I heard from Supervisor Lee is that the goal is to reduce the number of beds, my understanding would be no matter what, if there was a suggestion for additional beds or capacity in a behavioral health unit of some type at Elmwood, that would allow us to reduce the number of cells additionally at Elmwood. So our target would be somewhere in the total of 2,000 beds, you know, for both jail sites, independent of whether or not there was a behavioral health facility at Elmwood. Although we would have to, as you, as I said, do the research on 13A and B in order to give you details of what a facility that's behavioral health facility would look like at Elmwood. Um, I think I heard Supervisor Lee talking a little bit about mixed use in terms of some possibility for uh, incarcerated individuals and some possibility for um, either unincarcerated or diverted individuals. So, yeah, yeah I thank think you. I heard the same thing you did. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and thank you, Supervisor Lee, and uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. I would just say, as somebody who said, uh, I thought we could and should do both, I, I feel an obligation to, to be real about that, and I think that means incorporating uh, 13 A and B from Supervisor Ellenberg's motion, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the larger motion uh, failed to get a majority. And I think, again, that's what I heard from Supervisor Lee. So I'll just ask one more time uh, before you get to a vote. Uh, Supervisor Lee, I heard you saying uh, your motion is item 11 A through D plus some reconsideration and assessment of what uh, the future looks like at Elmwood. And Let's move forward on uh, the um, uh, mental health uh, services and other issues addressed by 13 A and B. Uh, and so essentially adopting that language as part of your motion. Did I get that right, sir? Yes, that's correct. All right. I'm looking forward to voting for that in a moment or two then. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your patience. Thank you. So Supervisor Lee, what I'm hearing to sum it up, I'm a seconder, is 11 A through D plus 13 A and B. Are you, are you fine with that? Yes, that's correct. And of, of the, uh, uh, some of the additions I added for uh, B, C, and D, correct, of 11. Okay, and I think 13 A and B incorporates a lot of that. Correct. Um, yes, yes that's, correct. So that's your motion. I'm certainly seconding that. Supervisor Smitty, your hand is still up. 
apologies. Your hand is now down. Super Vice President Ellenberg, your hand is up. I have a procedural question. Um, first, I'm wondering if we can vote on each of those elements separately. And second, um, Supervisor Lee is interested in, in resuscitating A and B from 13. I am interested in um, resuscitating items C and D, which would be the work group and the input from OCLAM, but I would like there to be, if that's possible, um, I would make a motion and somebody help me with the parliamentarian rules here. What I would like is a separate motion if possible, just on 13 C and D or on 13 A, B, C and D that is still separate from administrate, but from the vote on item 11 as, as amended and adjusted by Supervisor Lee. Can that work? Thank you. Supervisor Lee? Your motion. Yes, I'm happy to move it separately so that the uh, our board members who may not approve, like support the 11, will be able to vote uh, for 13. I think that's fair. Okay, so supervisor, so I understand it correctly. You're okay with 11 A, B, C, and D plus your comments plus 13 A and B. Then we're going to have a separate vote on 13 C, 13 C, D, and E. Or, or if, I just C and D. Was what I, asked for. I think E may be inconsistent, although I would like that too. Oh, and you're if, right. you're and, and why not keep, could we just do 11 and then 13? 11 as amended by Supervisor Lee. And then 13, since, since we're voting on A, B, C, and D, if I can get a second on that, just keep it separate rather than putting 13 A and B okay. with 11. Thank you. We're going to go to Supervisor Submitted in just a minute. At the end uh, of the day, Supervisor Lee... Just, Excuse just the interruption, one. Mr. Chairman. Point of order. I, I believe we need to turn to our parliamentarian, I, I, uh, which is Mr. Williams. Let's My do understanding it. is that a motion to reconsider may only be made by the prevailing party, which is why I was pleased that Supervisor Lee's motion included 13 A and B yep. um, and did not include C, D or E as I understood it. And so I don't think um, anyone except Supervisor Lee, Supervisor Wasserman or I can offer at this point C, D and E um, since the matter was voted on earlier in bulk at the request of the proponent. So right. I... I right. I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to get us tied up on parliamentary issues. I really don't. But I also want to make sure whatever we do isn't subject to challenge. And I also think that C and D are different issues than A and B. So sorry, Doug. Okay. So yeah. James, Mr. Williams, you've you've heard this conversation. I'm of the opinion we could vote on 11 A, B, C, and D, and 13 A and B together, as the motion currently is. Is that correct or incorrect? Yes, my understanding of the motion that's on the floor uh, is that it is 11A through D with the additions that Supervisor Lee read into the record, Thank plus you. 13 A and B. If uh, that motion, you know, in terms of parliamentary procedure, you know, the, the process could be to try to amend that motion. But that is the motion that's on the floor. Okay. Thank you. So we have the motion on the floor. We serve us submitting and Ellenberg, you each have your hands raised. I don't want to uh, ignore your hand. That's down, that's down. Okay, so the motion on the, whoop, Supervisor Chavez, yes, your hand is raised. Thank you, because, because it's not confusing enough. That's why I thought I would weigh in. So I, I just <laughs> want to make sure, and I want to, and Supervisor Simidian, you were the seconder on the motion and Supervisor Lee was the maker of the motion. Oh, was that you, Mike, Supervisor Wasserman? Yes. Okay, so, here, here's the question I, I want to ask. Um, for I for item C, item C is to bring in an outside outside help to help facilitate whatever the new product is, Supervisor Lee, that you're imagining. And item D is to authorize the with the support and help of the office of um, of OCLAM, you know, our Office of Correction and Law Enforcement Monitoring. I'm Audit. sorry, Supervisor Chavez. I yeah. Think you're your item D, Oakland, is on is on agenda item 13. 
That's correct. And so the, mo when, the when motion the mo is for 11A through D and 13A and B. That's correct. And so what I'm asking the maker of the motion is if given that, given the, um, the other components of the motion that are uh, A and B of 11, that would require some su community support and um, community facilitation. I'm wondering why C and D were not included. And that's my question to the maker of the motion. Because they seem consistent if based on the way that Supervisor Simidian sort of rephrased the motion. Yeah, no, I, I uh, think A and B definitely is already basically included in 11, the way it's written. C and D are a bit separate, but the thing is, I certainly would be happy to make a separate motion after this one is being adjudicated. And that way, those who may not support the initial motion of 11 will be able to weigh in and maybe approve C and D. Thank you. Did you have additional comments? No, thank you. Okay, your hand is going down. There are no other hands up. I'm going to take this window of opportunity to ask Peggy for a roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Um, I'm going to say no. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. No. President Wasserman. Aye. Okay, that concludes that item. We now go to actually. Uh, sorry, uh, President Wasserman, I, I would like to go just home and make a motion to approve item C and D uh, of thirteen only. Okay, a motion has been made to approve items thirteen C and D. Charlie Delta. Thank Sam, you. I'm catching on, Otto. <laughs> I'll second that, Supervisor Lee. Second by Supervisor Chavez. Any further discussion? Um, I do have a question I will ask of uh, Dr. Smith. In item seven, um, it talks, I just want to get to the right part because I had a no and a yes in item 7C. Excuse me, item 13C that's in the motion. Um, the issue I had Excuse me, just one second. Hmm. I thought when I read it this weekend that there was an area in here where the commu community made determinations around incarceration. And I guess, well, I don't know where that Okay, I'll leave it at that. The motion is to approve 13 C and D. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Peggy, will you please call for the vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, yes. Supervisor Simidian. Yes. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Okay, so that one passes. Members, I would suggest we take our dinner break now. Do you want to go one hour or do you want to go 45 minutes? I, would, I think with that, we'll say 45. Would, oh, go ahead, would, Vice President Ellenberg. I, I would suggest we ask the, the clerks or staff and see which amount of time they need. I'm, I'm going to zip home, but I can get there in whatever time. No problem. Tiffany, do you have a preference? Megan? Peggy? Staff is fine with whatever you like. We're happy with a half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, whatever is at the pleasure of the board. Okay, let's go 45 minutes. Let's resume this at 6.30. We handled 12 on consent. We just handled 13. When we come back, we will start with 14. Is that what you've got, Peggy? It is. Okay. 
We'll see all of you at 6.30. Thank you. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Peggy, are you there? I am. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right, 6.30. I see Supervisors Ellenberg and Chavez. Looking for Smidian and Lee. There's Supervisor Lee. And there's Charles Hendrickson. And he's gone. And we just need Supervisor Simidian. And there's Supervisor Simidian. Peggy, will you go ahead, please, and take a roll call to establish the presence of a quorum? Supervisor Lee. Lee present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Ellenberg. Here. Oh, I meant Supervisor Simidian. Here. <laughs> then Vice President Ellenberg. I'm still here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to start as we resume. On item 14, we'll turn to Supervisor Smidian for his referral. We have a number of items that were held coming ahead of us, and hopefully we can get through things expeditiously for the benefit of our staff. Supervisor Smidian. Thank you. Um, move approval. If I get a second, I will just uh, provide one clarification. I think the measure speaks for itself. I'll second. Thank you. Um, we have asked both the administration and the county council's office to help assemble this list of violations over the course of the last 10 years. I wasn't explicit in the referral colleagues, but the expectation, which I've confirmed with county council and administration, is that county council's office would take the lead on actually assembling uh, or compiling the list, uh, given the need to do some minor uh, legal assessment of what was or wasn't deemed a violation with various jurisdictions. With that understanding, uh, move approval. Thank you for the second. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn to our public speaker, Peggy, two minutes. One moment while the timer comes up. Our next speaker is Rhoda Fry. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good evening, supervisors. Especially thank you, Supervisor Simidian, for this referral, which has received broad support from organizations and the general public, amounting to at least 76 pages of public comment. And I sincerely hope that you'll read them all. <laughs> Lehigh's well. egregious. It's a, it's a good read. Don't make good bedtime reading, Supervisor Smitty, and I assure you. Lehigh's egregious record of violations starts with county's land use policies. This referral will provide the county and general public a much needed broad understanding of the impacts of the Lehigh Permanente site. We have elected you to make our lives better, and this is the first step, and I thank you. The resulting report will just be the tip of the iceberg since so many issues have been left unaddressed. Supervisor Sumidian will surely recall the thick brown cloud from an incident on, at Lehigh on the very night of one of his town halls. There was no notice of violation for that one. Pete Simmons of the Open Space District has summed it up. This is a long overdue action, and I commend Supervisor Sumidian for taking the lead on this. If approved, I suggest it be updated every couple of years. I'm happy to see the county finally holding Lehigh accountable. Thank you very much, and have a good night. 
Thank you, Rhoda. Thank you, Rhoda. And the over-under is he will read all the pages. That concludes <laughs> our public speakers. I'll turn to our board members. I don't see any hands raised. So Peggy, if you'll please call for the vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. All right, yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. That concludes item number 14. We move on to 15, consider recommendations relating to the expansion of mobile crisis response brought to us by Supervisor Smidia. Move approval. Thank you. I'll second. I, uh, we have a speaker on this one. Supervisor Chavez, would you like to speak before or after the speaker? After the speaker, please. All righty. The speaker, please. Peggy, two minutes. One moment for the timer to come up. Our next speaker is Don Taylor. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good evening, Supervisors. Don Taylor from Upload Family Services. I'm calling to support Supervisor Simidian's recommendation to consider expansion of mobile crisis response. The declaration of the mental health and substance use public health crisis approved by the board emphasizes how critical the current needs are. And behavioral health crisis response is a critical part of the system. Uplift is the county youth's crisis continuum provider, which includes mobile response services. And despite contract expansions, the mobile crisis demand continues to surpass resources. And at times law enforcement remains the backup option. The wide geography of the county adds to the challenge of the resource and timely response. Supervisor Simidian's referral to consider expansion comes at an important time during this public health crisis. Ensuring services are at least minimum meeting the baseline of demand with consideration of geography is an important next step. So I thank you all. Thank Our you, next Mayor. speaker is Myra Alvarez. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, um, actually, uh, I'm here with Myra. Um, we're both in the Gilroy office. My name is Brad Carson. I'm um, a psychiatric social worker with the mobile crisis response team. Um, we're the only um, two clinicians right now in South County. Basically, we respond to all the calls um, from law enforcement and the community um, below the, the 85 freeway. Um, Last week, we had a meet and confer with our bosses, and um, they said they were going to move to having um, four tens, even if we didn't have the staffing. And um, uh, please, when you consider giving us more codes, please put on there that um, we're going to not move to expand services until we get to the accurate level of being fully staffed. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kamala Kotakula. Please accept your unmute to begin speaking. Uh, hello, board members. Uh, I am Kamala, a clinician on the mobile crisis response team. Um, I want to thank um, Supervisor Timitian and other members on the board and everyone else who has made this proposal to expand mobile crisis response team services. Um, we strongly support this proposal for expansion and cannot stress the need for crisis intervention services in the community. Uh, in today's meeting, we have also heard the desire from our community to have continued mobile crisis services in the county. Um, however, I would like to commend that this expansion will only work if the board can ensure that um, upper management supports us clinicians on the mobile crisis response team. Um, if there is no inclusion, mutual respect and continued discrimination occurs, clinicians on the mobile crisis team can no longer continue to deliver services that our community needs at the moment. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you, Peggy. We have a motion and a second. I see Supervisor Chavez's hand first, then Supervisor Lee. Thank you. I'm very excited to expand the service. What I um, will just reiterate that it's it's a little confusing still about what number to call, who responds to what kinds of crises, and how many um, how many responses we really are able to get. I think the staff raising the point about staffing is really critical. So when this comes back, what I would like to be able to see is the staffing plan along with the, the results that we're seeing along with the, you know, the way people find out about it. I, 
we're launching right now at colleagues, maybe four different projects and they all have different phone numbers and it's very confusing to the public. It's very confusing to the, the, to the, to the police officers. And then I just want to reemphasize the last point the staff raised is that we're moving qu quite quickly and we don't have the full staffing infrastructure in place. So when this comes back, if this if our staff could respond to those three areas, I would really appreciate it. And I'm and Supervisor Smitty, and I'm I, I think it's right that we have to have these services countywide. So this isn't a reflection of that at all. It really is this is a good time to take some stock in where we are. Through the chair, if I may, I'm happy to incorporate yes. the specific direction that Supervisor Chavez just uh, offered as part of the motion if the seconder is amenable. And that will ensure that we get back the information that she has requested, which I support. Thank you so much. Thank you. The seconder is amenable. Anything else, Supervisor Chavez? No, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, as we all know, the mobile crisis uh, response team has proven again and again to have saved life in my community. Um, having a dedicated unit located in North County and West Valley is certainly long overdue. Um, and having you know, the team to travel all the way from South County, could, I mean, knowing the traffic we face is uh, ridiculous how far it is. Um, and the other issue about uh, trying to look at the adolescent and young adult need from 1624 is certainly something that is extremely important. We've all been there, 1624, and, and the challenges that, that young adults go through. So I, I strongly support this and uh, applaud the supervisor uh, um, committee and for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, Peggy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. I'm sorry, you're muted. I thought I took it off. Yes. Thank you. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you very much. That was item 15. We approved item 16 in consent. So we move to item 17, which is a report from our CEO, Dr. and Attorney Jeff Smith. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I'll be short today. Um, well, I'm short all the time, but <laughs> <clears throat> um, with regard to concerns, we're in the process of developing the mid-year budget um, transmittal, which the board will see in February. Um, most of it focuses on uh, technical readjustments, very little in terms of significant changes. We're watching closely at the state level. <clears throat> the um, proposed uh, governor's budget is uh, quite a long reach. It's got some really good stuff in it uh, in terms of um, health care and other things, um, but it's highly like, unlikely that it will pass as recommended. Um, and we're very concerned about the um, inflationary situation in the country because the state government relies upon personal property or personal income tax as a main source of revenue. And as you know, in inflationary times, <clears throat> the um, capital gains tax decreased dramatically as individuals with money tend to shelter their uh, resources and reduce their um, personal income tax, which will have a dramatic effect upon the state. So we're worried about that, and watching that closely. In terms of our efforts, um, we're looking pretty stable with uh, property tax. We're continuing to watch closely the expenditures that we're making on the COVID response. Um, we're over a billion dollars at this point, um, which is quite a lot. Um, so we're watching that closely. Um, and uh, with that, I open for questions. Thank you. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised on the income the state receives. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Smith, just a um, a quick request for future since we have you. Um, my recollection is that there's some fine tuning uh, to be done with respect to the redistricting maps, which is coming 
to our board sometime in uh, February, I believe. And when the time comes, I wonder if you could uh, also uh, help facilitate um, both digital and hard copy maps of the new districts uh, at the right down to the street level. I, we're already getting folks uh, who are uh, reaching out asking for help. We uh, want to accommodate everybody, but the custom and practice and courtesy is to uh, make sure we refer folks to their district supervisor when that's appropriate. And um, now that we have the guidance from the uh, county council's office, uh, essentially advising that the new lines take effect now, um, we need to have tools to make sure we know who's in and who's out, including you know overlap with um, you know roads and county facilities and um, city council districts in uh, the cities with districts, uh, and that could be San Jose, but it could also be. Sunnyvale, for example, which has gone to a district system um, and uh, a state and federal uh, jurisdiction. So anything, I don't know if it's roads or planning or uh, both or somebody else, but anything we can do to expedite that would allow us to give better service sooner rather than later. And I just make that ask uh, along with all the other things you're up to. Thank you. Yes, we'll uh, expedite that as rapidly as possible. The board remembers that you adopted the maps by resolution so we had to translate all that into ordinance um, which uh, showed that some of the maps had some problems with uh, the boundary lines not being exactly on the boundaries of uh, parcels so we had to match those up strangely enough remaining in one part of the county there is still a um, set of about six houses that are situated right on the city borderline. So the front door goes to one city and the back door goes to another city, which is very strange, but we had to fix that. So we'll get it out as fast as we can. And obviously, like you said, the board will get the final ordinance approval out of it. Thank you very much. And I, I did see a preliminary copy. I'm excited that Disneyland is now in my district. So it's it's uh, become a little more entertaining. All right, any other questions of Dr. Smith? Seeing none, we'll move to our county council, James Williams. Thank you. There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session meeting of January 24th, 2022. And that concludes my report. Thank you for that report. Mr. Williams, we move on to item number 19. We should have Paul Lorenz, our CEO for Santa Clara Valley Medical Center reporting the monthly uh, report on the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. Paul, I'm looking for um, you. Good evening, uh, President Celine Ho. This is Celine. Hi. Wonderful. Uh, Celine Ho, Health Center Manager for the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. Um, and in, in the interest of time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have on our VHHP report. Thank you. We have no members of the public. I don't see, oh, we have a couple of hands popping up. Vice President Ellenberg, you have a question for Celine? Hi, hey, Celine. Um, I appreciate the report and, and among the many areas of ongoing work that you were doing, I, I really um, was glad to see the update on pregnant patients and supportive services. And consistent with the two, areas of concern that were highlighted in the report, access to substance use disorder treatment and access to housing. Uh, I'd like the HHP to coordinate with relevant county departments and partners and follow up on, on these items as follows. Uh, first, the Office of Supportive Housing is preparing to bring back to the board in March their first interim report on the Heading Home campaign to house all pregnant people and families with young children. Uh, and I'm wondering first, has there been any thought already or conversation regarding working with OSH to connect pregnant people and families to the emergency vouchers from the Heading Home campaign? Um, no, not currently. We've been we've had conversations with OSH on different housing options, but not specifically around the Heading Home um, campaign. Fantastic. Here's an opportunity then. I, I would I love to see VHHP and OSH uh, coordinate on the mechanisms for referral and support services. 
uh, and include that piece in the update um, on that coordination as part of the March Heading Home Progress uh, Report, and that's to Consuelo. Uh, and second, I was uh, surprised to learn recently that Parisi House, uh, which is a provider of residential substance use disorder treatment uh, for pregnant people and those with young kids, is generally only at about 50% capacity. And I'm concerned that there might be some barriers to referrals or treatment that haven't been addressed. And I'd like um, you please to provide an update in the next VHHP report that digs into this area in more detail and offers us some options uh, to support increased connection to care at Parisi or other programs uh, serving pregnant or parenting people in recovery. Do yes, both of those work? Selena, do you have any questions back for me or clarifications needed about that? No, we'll, we'll be happy to include that in the next report. Okay, thank you so much. And as always, really thanks for your tremendous work. Thank you. Thank you. I certainly enjoy visiting the Parisi house and uh, seeing those little babies being cared for. Uh, Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Um, for first of all, I just wanted to publicly thank Paul, Celine, and also Dr. Gilotra for being so accommodating to my team and myself uh, last week. Uh, we actually had a visit um, with me and a couple of my team members with the VHHP Backpack Medicine team uh, that they truly are the frontline workers who are directly responsible for helping those unhoused in need. Um, it was really heartbreaking to see that someone whose needs are so acute are going by unhoused, living in cars and tents. Now, while this was a very informative uh, experience for all of us, it was also deep in my appreciation for the VHHP team and the success that is do they are doing every day. With that being said, I know that my staff has also sent some questions to administration relating to this report last week. And there's just one more request I'd like to make as it relates to issue around withdrawal management beds. I would like to uh, request an off-agenda report on how the administration plans to improve and expedite our current system of the withdrawal management beds for those who need access to it. And that's all I have on this. Thank you. Thank you. And again, Celine, thank you. Having no other questions and no members of the public, um, I need a motion to approve the recommendations. So moved. Chavez, with all the requests. A and B. Thank you. And, and Supervisor Lee. Second. Yep. You seconded as well. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote, please, Peggy. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. We now move on to item number 20. Um, Heather, is Heather no. here? Heather, Heather is here. Heather is here. Good nice. evening, President Wasserman and Board of Supervisors. Good evening. Nice you. to see you. Great to see you. In front of you this evening is a request for a service agreement with Priority Dispatch to provide consulting services for us in quality assurance review of law enforcement calls for service. The reason that it is in front of you is because doing this requires a revision to our current surveillance use policy for our 911 audio recording system because we need to allow the consultant, which is priority dispatch, to have access to our recorded calls for the quality assurance work. I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Supervisor Submitting. Move approval. Thank you. I'll second that. We don't have any speakers. I don't see any other hands. A uh, roll call vote, please, Peggy. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Now turn on to item number 21. Miguel, our sister Marquez, our COO. Yes, good evening. And in light of the hour, I will merely summarize by saying, that the various issues set forth in this legislative file about video arraignments have all been resolved with the one exception of the timing of the arraignment calendar, which is a work in progress. And we continue to make good um, progress on that issue. Uh, finally, I'll just simply conclude by saying that the most important part of that ledge file is to say that of the participants we surveyed, eight out of nine 
expressed that they were either neutral or satisfied with the information they received in order to make their decision about video arraignments and that nine out of 10 participants uh, were able to speak with their lawyer before their arraignment and the 10th person simply didn't respond to that question. So I think uh, the legislative file has all the other information and uh, the team is here and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, I appreciate your team being here at this hour. No members of the public, I'll turn to Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman, and thank you for the uh, report, um, um, Mr. Marquez. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that the uh, Public Defender's Office is currently working with the Department of Corrections to pilot the recommended solutions in this coming weeks. Uh, so I would like to just request an update on this pilot uh, results. Coming back to the PSJC and the Board of Supervisors, say in six months, would that be workable? Miguel? Yes, that should be workable, not a problem. Great. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, Mr. Marquez. No other hands. Peggy, a vote, please. Excuse me. We need a, a motion. It says receive report and request the following information on the following. So is I assume no votes necessary on this, James? Heck, I could have had a vote in the amount of time I asked that. No, I, I don't believe so. Okay, thank you very much. That concludes 21. We move on to 22, Laura Garnett, Chief Probation Officer, but I see Molly, your picture's there. Is Laura here? Laura is there, Chief. I absolutely am here, as you guys are still here. Yes. Uh, good, e good evening. Good evening. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the item that you guys asked for on use of force in juvenile hall. Um, we have uh, Deputy Chief Nick Burchard, who's over the institutions, um, prepared to present today if you would like him to present. And we have both myself, uh, um, Deputy Chief Burchard, and Assistant Chief Jermaine Hardy, um, who is over internal affairs, also available to answer any questions. So it's up to you. Uh, Mr. President, how you would like to proceed. Thank you very much. We have no public speakers on this item. Is there anyone wishing to <clears throat> have a presentation or ask any questions? I see, I see Mr. Burchard, our Deputy Chief, Mr. Burchard is on. This is simply a received report. So I think we're going to consider the report received. Thank you. Thank you both. Great. Thank you very, very much for the work that you do. Great. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you. That concludes item 22. We now move on to item 23, receiving a report from the Office of the Sheriff relating uh, to use of force. Hey, good evening, everybody. It's uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Paul. Paul from the Sheriff's Office, sir. Welcome, good evening. Lieutenant. So this, this comes from the referral from Supervisor Ellenberg back in November of last year regarding the uh, use of force reports in the custody setting uh, these are the types of reports that are available with the uh, statistics and we can report them on an annual basis. Uh, as you can see, if you have any questions on there, uh, myself, I'm, I'm available to answer any questions. Uh, Assistant Sheriff uh, David Lira is also on the line as well too, if you have any questions on the report. Thank you, Lieutenant. And members, again, we do not have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item. I don't see any hands raised. This is a received report, Lieutenant, so no vote is necessary, and there are no additional questions. Thank you very much for being with us. All right, thank you, good evening. Thank you. We now move on to item number 24, receiving a report from the Office of the County Exec for, uh, oh, this is regarding the at-home COVID test. Dr. Smith, oh, Miguel, Mr. Marquez. Yes. yes, thank you, and Deputy County Executive Megan Doyle should also be in the meeting. Uh, we have been working uh, diligently, a whole team of folk, and we have been very successful in both obtaining uh, about 600,000 at-home tests that we purchased, plus more that were donated, so about 750,000 tests. Uh, they've been distributed at, at the various parks and at various sites, uh, along with when people get their PCR tests at our various locations in San Martin, uh, in the South County, in the North County, all over in San Jose. So. Um, Megan, I don't know if there was any particular information you wanted to convey to the board, uh, but uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I'll, I'll convey that I've received tons of good word 
about the system, the distribution, the attitude of the people, the uh, expediency, the convenience. I've heard from many, many, many people and everything about it was good. So great job doling all that out. We have no members of the public, no hands. We have a finger raised, Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate the report back uh, per the referral. Let me just ask, uh, were there some hiccups at the Foothill site? Um, hi, Deputy County Executive Megan Doyle. Um, I think the hiccups you're referring to was we had originally planned to use two Foothill sites, um, including the Sunnyvale um, Innovation Campus, but then due to some staffing concerns, we weren't able to staff an additional site. So we, so my understanding is there have not, I have not heard of hiccups at the Foothill Los Altos Hills uh, campus site, but I think that's what you may be referring to. Yeah, I, um, and I'll see if I can get the uh, representative of the entire city of Sunnyvale to lean in on this one, uh, because the Sunnyvale campus is uh, um, a little more approximate to population uh, in, in the flatlands, yes? Oh. Supervisor Lee, he's asking you. Yes, uh, Sunnyvale is so flat that we actually have tornadoes once every 30 years. <laughs> well, I just, um, so I guess my question is, where does that leave us on the Sunnyvale site? Is that one now up and running? Is it slated to be up and running? No, it is not slated to be up and running. We um, plan to conclude this uh, project by the end of um, Sunday. So that we just distributed the additional testing and resources to other sites. Well, I know uh, the um, staffing issues are prevalent for everybody, but I, I would really urge strongly uh, Mr. Marquez and Ms. Doyle that um, if and when we're able to do this again, and I hope that we will be and that it will be soon, um, that uh, that site be given another look. I think um, the foothill site up on, uh, on the hill is a great site in the sense that it's uh, right off 280, but um, it, it's not exactly a population center as I, I think you can uh, quickly observe and would know. And I just, I want us to be in population centers where um, people are, and can easily access these services. I, I guess I would also ask both of you, um, I have I mentioned previously, I think we, we need to be sure we don't over worry moving too much of, uh, too many of these tests out into the community. I know people didn't wanna create a black market, but you know there are lots of places that people go anyway. I'm thinking of libraries, I'm thinking of farmer's markets, I'm thinking of, you know, is there, a way we could, um, you know, try and uh, use those kinds of venues. Uh, uh, you know, my colleagues sometimes uh, give me a smile when I talk about sidewalk office hours, but the reason I do them at farmers markets is because that's where the people are. And uh, so I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to design the program here. I'm just asking you to think beyond the conventional public health um, resources in terms of locations and organizations. And, um, you know, the old cliche about Willie Sutton saying, uh, why did he rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Well, you know, I think I would flip that on its head and say, you know, why do you go to libraries or farmers markets or other such venues? Because that's where the people are. And, um, you know, I think we've learned a lot during the course of the pandemic. But one thing we've also all learned is convenience is key. You make this easy for people, they'll engage. You don't, they won't. And um, this is not just a question of giving these folks uh, some service that I think we all agree they're entitled to. And I wanna say me too, to the praise from Mr. Wasserman, but it's also a public health measure. Every time somebody tests, there's a greater likelihood that they won't put somebody else at risk. Uh, that's the goal here. So um, I'll be asking about this at uh, every board meeting where we take up the COVID issue, and I'll be asking about it at every health and hospital committee meeting. And for that reason, I'll say thank you, but please do look at that Sunnyvale site. Uh, uh, as an alumni supervisor for Sunnyvale, I wanna make that pitch, and I know the current supervisor does too. And uh, I also really do wanna push, push, push on using non-traditional venues. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you, colleagues, and thank you, Mr. Marquez and Ms. Doyle. Thank you. And Supervisor Median, they're doing a fine job in Los Gatos getting them out in Vasona. 
I just wanted to keep you up to date on that. Uh, well, Supervisor I'm a new supervisor, so I'm not surprised to hear things are going well here. <laughs> yeah, I'll, we'll talk about the geese. All right. <laughs> Supervisor Chavez. And the boars, right? Yep. Wild boar. Um, so thank you very much for the really good work. I wanted to ask, do we have a distribution center in South County? We do. We are using the San Martin um, County operated testing site, which has increased its capacity sig significantly since the last time we talked. So um, according to Dr. Tong earlier today, there are about 2000 appointments there a day. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Megan, when did that start? Um, I can't answer when the appointments were added. I can just add that San Martin was added last That's Thursday. True. Okay. Um, so like the fairgrounds, we rolled it out on Wednesday. San Martin was Thursday and Friday was the rotating cities onsite testing program. Great. And these are the rapid tests that are being distributed? Correct. The rapid yes. tests in addition to the PCR tests. Excellent. Excellent. And then that's really exciting and then the only other thing that i um i want to ask is um could you let us know off agenda and and i know this doesn't fall directly under you but i'm very interested in knowing if we could get an update from the folks who are doing the distribution with public safety for the rapid tests for both police and fire um what kind of update did you want because we have the amounts and we have the plan to get them out so that's what i would i think the board would benefit from knowing that and especially given the feedback we're getting from fire right now from our okay. public safety on the fire side and to make sure that all the cities that um were interested actually are reaching out to you i i know dr smith and dr cody and i had a meeting with our our firefighter union on um, all the unions on um Monday and there was a genuine interest in in access and I so anyway I if 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 you know the answer to that now great but I wanted to I keep your chattering so I to. um the only the only answer that um I I mean I can tell you that there is a plan that later this week there'll be distribution to every fire department and all the public safety um all the public safety agencies um, so they're getting an allotment out of this allotment, and that's being that is being handled separately um, through through other distribution channels that are, you know, more equipped with public right. safety. Right, and so Greta, I know Greta talked to me. I'm forgetting the gentleman's name, but if we could just get a quick update, and I don't mean sure. anything fancy that just says here's everybody who asked, sure. here's what we're accommodating. That'd be great because it'll help all of us <laughs> in responding to queries. Sure. Yeah, great, great job, all. Thank you. All right, we'll consider that report received. Thank you both very much. We'll move on to 25, receive a report from the Office of the County Exec relating to a small business resiliency grant program and the ARP. Um, President Wasserman, that item's held. I'm sorry? It was held. The item is held until the mid-year. Thank you very much, Vice President. I did not make that notation. We now move on to item 26. Was that held? No, no, okay, good. Um, Sylvia Gallegos. Or Jeff Smith, maybe. I believe 26 was put on consent with a request for an off agenda report. That's my recollection. Yes. That's correct. Okay, I missed those last two. Well, I know the 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, and 32. I believe we're, I believe we're done, is my held. Three, there were no items removed. 29, I think. We have 29. Uh, 29 was held. 30, 31, 32 held. No items removed. Closing comments. Go 49ers. And <laughs> Supervisor Chavez, anything else? Nope, I'm with you. All right. You call them the Santa Clara 49ers or the Santa Clara County 49ers, Supervisor <laughs> Lee? Oh, Sunnyvale. <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody stay stay well take care get some sleep thanks all Good thanks night. staff adios Good night. adios recording stopped
think 